<laughs> I legit got scared. <laughs> I almost died. <laughs> oh, oh, how's chat doing today? Is everyone behaving? Is everyone being nice? <laughs> Come on, Gamozo. What is up? Good? Bad? Awful? Great? Studying for my set theory exam. Mmm, that sounds really fun. Ha 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 yeah, love me some that set some that theory. Um slight headache. Oh, that's never good. Alive? Could be worse, could be better. <laughs> hey, real tilt real tilted tree! Foony! Thank you so much for the 13 months. Live broadcast and stars. See how are you, Gamozo? I'm doing okay. Doing okay. I'm a little tired. Uh, definitely getting used to this whole 10 o'clock in the morning thing. This is this is not easy. Hey, Rez, how you doing today, cutie? Not studying, Rip. Yeah, studying is for the week, you know? Studying is, is for uh, people who want to do probably the correct thing. <laughs> <laughs> studying is for people who don't want to panic and try to find a way to somehow pass class after three months of not doing shit. Um, yeah, definitely didn't go through school like that. Uh, what has studying to do with the instruction pointer? I'm fine, K. Thanks. I hope you feel bad about that. Uh, optimize school for minimal effort. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. It's kind of the correct way. Kind of the correct way. My my headphones are like coming off. Oh, it's because I don't have the back tightened. Hmm. That's because I've got a hat there. Uh, Trilobite sixty four. Thank you so much for the tier one. Hell yeah. Hope you're having a wonderful day. This dude's running a 64 trilobite system, not even 64 bit. Imagine if you had that many bytes in your computer. Maximize fun, minimize school. Holy shit, broken kernel. Thank you so much for the tier three. I, you might be one of the first and only tier. Th I need to make icons and stuff for that, I think. Yeah, uh, thank you for so much for the uh, tier three, uh, where you, you, I don't think we give you any special features. We probably should. <laughs> God, we're lazy as fuck. Uh, I need a 77% on this exam to get an A or 17% to get a B and graduate. Should I optimize for the B? Hmm. Um... There's a there's a there's a couple ways that you can do that. Uh I think I think the best way to do that, the best approach is probably to go and uh find someone who doesn't need anything other than a zero in class, bribe them like 20 bucks to just straight up fail it and get a zero so that they set the curve and then you also do nothing but then you get whatever the curve is <laughs> cj i thank you so much for the tier one sub as well hell yeah fantastic what a morning <laughs> uh <laughs> Is everyone behaving today? Is everyone behaving? Um, America's grades. Look, in America, everyone has to be a winner. It would be very difficult. Do nothing, get C easy. C's get degrees, just don't do shit. 
Did you study computer science or did you teach yourself? I taught myself. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't do too well in traditional education environments. Um, I, uh, mm, what's the best way to put it? Um, I don't like showing my work when it's unnecessary because it's easy to do in your head. I don't like showing my work when I can just use my calculator. And I don't like doing things long form when I can just use my calculator. And, uh, I didn't care about history until, like, recently. But now history is, like, pretty cool, pretty fun. Been definitely on a history kick in the past, like, two years. Uh, what else? Um, uh, I, I have the attention span and, uh, uh, comprehension of about a third grader. Like, Harry Potter is, is roughly my reading level. Um, yeah, uh, all, all those things compounded make, make, uh, traditional education not, not fantastic. <laughs> Think people who never played WoW will be able to follow the stream? Absolutely, yeah, we're, we're... We're not going to hit too much on the WoW and hit more on the programming. Uh, it, it's just clickbait to bring people in. That, that's the main goal. Uh, <laughs> behaving, that's cute. Rez, when have I ever been known to behave? Um, if it's a multiple choice with five or fewer choices, just choose all the same letter and you should statistically just pass. That, right there, is the correct way to go. That's the correct way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Broken Colonel, thank you so much for the five gifted Severinos. Hell yeah, we're hitting some good people there. Oh, wow. We got some sub doot doot horns in here. <sighs> Have you ever been to Jeremy? Germ, Jeremy, Germ, Germay. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I do want to go to Jeremy. Uh, oh, Germay, Germay, <laughs> Germay. Um, no, I haven't. I've actually, other than like Mexico and Bahamas and like basically island places around the U.S., I've never actually. Uh, I've never actually been out of the U.S. I guess I've been to Canada. I've been to Montreal. But let's be honest. As much as you pretend that you're still French, you're still just America's little bitch. And you're really just America minus minus. Yeah, you get healthcare, but come on. Like, we pay for good healthcare here in the U.S. We pay real money for it. Is it Ma Montreal or Montreal <laughs> or M Monreal? Yeah, I think it's Monreal, Desu. Monreal. What's America plus plus? It doesn't exist. America is already the highest you can get. If you plus plus America, you integer overflow and you get the EU. And you don't want to be the EU. Because they're socialist. <laughs> monorail. Monorail. <laughs> Germany has higher COVID in infections. Checkmate. Yeah. Yeah. Did the EU have Trump? No. <laughs> so you clearly had no guidance. Uh, are we talking BMI right now? <laughs> I don't think America is number one in BMI. Uh, America plus plus just wraps around. Number three, I think Mexico is actually like number one, which always kind of surprised me. I, I, never, I never knew that. <laughs> like, I, I think I looked this up the other day. But, uh, I mean, honestly, if I lived in Mexico, <laughs> I had that food. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, all right. All right, do people want to start the stream? Do people want to be educated today? Educational optimization. Today is Friday. This is our scheduled educational optimization day. These are some hot takes. <laughs> uh, edumacation. If I throw a plastic bag on the street, will the EU underflow? <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. Please teach me some arcane skills. Well, I didn't play a mage, so... Educational optimization. Oh, I thought we'd be... I thought we'd be doing... I... I thought we'd be doing something cool? What is... What does that mean? Yikes. Toxic mods. Toxic mods. Uh uh chat, rise up and overthrow the mods. Um Yeah. Yeah, we need we need new mods in here. For sure. For sure. Uh gamers gamers rise up. Um <laughs> Ban J33 cat work. Ah, yes. J33 cat work. My favorite. <laughs> all right. Chat. First of all, let me... Let me... Let me put on the new... The new Taylor Swift album from today. The red uh, Taylor's version. Um... Yeah, because that's going to be a fucking masterpiece. So we're going to just throw that bad boy on right now. Oh, yeah, it's going to be good. Okay, choo-choo. Oh, we got some choo-choos. Hype, hype, huh? Hype, hyper? Huh? Mods out. Oh. Oh, you know, this is going to be good Starting off on that State of Grace masterpiece, T Swift. Shout out, shout out to my girl T Swift for for making bangers year after year, just phenomenal. <laughs> All right, so, so, shout out to the mute, the minor. Musical artist T Swift. Yes. Yep. All right. So today, chat, we're going to be talking about Onarine. And before you before you ask like what is the goal of this stream? What are what are we planning to do? Ultimately, my plan is to brag about something that I invested way too much time into last year. Um so at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm, I just, every time I say something, I want chat to be like, oh my god, you're so good at healing on a priest, right? That's, that's what we need to, that's what we need to practice, chat. Because today is the feel-good stream for the approximately nine months of my life that I absolutely threw into the trash can. Um... <laughs> T Swift is honestly really good. Yeah, T Swift is phenomenal. Okay. Uh, brag about something I spend way too much time in. Summary of all of G of all of Gen Genozo's Genozo's streams. Who's Genozo? Oh. Oh, Sari, Sari, Ganuzo, get the fuck out of here. Oh, that is in Gonzalo, Gonzos, <laughs> Ganuzo. Uh, uh. <laughs> oh, chat is not behaving today 
Nice time to change your nick. Yeah, what are gondola, granolo, germozo, gnaza lobes, gnuzolo, gorgonzola? <laughs> uh, actually, what you're referring to as gamozo is. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna just. Uh... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What a shit post. <laughs> oh, I like that one. I definitely spent some time looking at some copy pastas, some of the top of uh, our copy pasta from the past year. There are some good ones, actually. <laughs> oh. oh my god. Uh, I think we might update to Sari's version. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. What is this? Cringe? <laughs> Can I get a paper hands in the chat? That no, that's what they said. That's what they said in the video. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> In Poland, real life is a copy pasta. Shout out to all my Poles today. Shout out to all my Poles, all of my people who work the Poles, whether it's pollsters, um, people who call people and ask about things that they're gonna do for voting, just just people who do poll stuff. <laughs> That's me, hell yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, um, what we're gonna do today, upholster, <laughs> why, why are these getting me? That's not even funny, JWL. That's not even funny. <laughs> God damn it. I need a... <laughs> Highlight book, how are you doing? <laughs> We're, we're gonna we're gonna pull out a, an apple pie for hugging today. Okay. Um. Basically, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna go through some of the things that I did to become the number one. Okay. Here's where we have caveats on caveats. So everyone here uh, has saw the clickbait title, but now now that um now that it's just us a uh, uh, grown adults here and we got all the people in with the clickbait, um, you could kind of argue it's really hard to, like, objectively determine if someone is, like, the best or not. So, like, ultimately, like, it, it's, it's, okay, like, it, I'm, yeah, by, by a, a single metric, yeah, I'm probably number one in the world, but, like, yeah. Come on, like everything, yeah, D colon, yeah. Um, okay, anyways, so, uh, last year I made a character called Onoreen. Onoreen, also known as Onion Ring, and according to one of my friends in real life, also my ovaries. Um, so this is Onoreen, and uh, is there any emulator that supports the virtualization stack, like Box, but better or faster? Uh, technically, you can do it with K Kimu and KVM and Nested Vert, but I'm guessing that doesn't that doesn't uh, follow your uh, requirements for an emulator. Um, I think Box is kind of the best way to go. Onarine sounds like a birth control medication. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you with the time with the time I put into Onarine. Yeah, that's pretty damn accurate. Uh, I'm the best according to the metrics I made up. Bam! That is what I like to see. Um, okay, so 
basically, I made Onarine uh, in... Honestly, might have been like March of 2020. Might have been right about when COVID started. And Onarine, I started on a role-playing server. I played on Grobulus, which is an RP role-playing... Uh, not pr did I say private server? It's a classic server. Uh, so while classic, RP server, RP PvP, I got on there to make some friends, be social, be a nerd, RP my character, develop some character development things, and just be a nerd. Um, and by the time I got to, like, level 30 or 40, I found that I, uh, was kind of enjoying the more hardcore aspects of healing uh i i mean i guess like if we back this up if we back this up a bit we're just gonna keep going back um i started wow in 2005 or 2006 uh i got it on cd when it was 60 dollars or 50 i think 50 dollars was the game price at the time um, so, uh, <laughs> so I, I basically, I got it, I got it in the CD form, I still have it, and <laughs> I brought it home, and I went to install it, and, uh, WoW apparently has a subscription fee, and when you're 12 or 13 years old, um, without a credit card, that sucks. Uh, further, when you kind of just thought it was a $50 game, that really sucks. So I got WoW, I had it on CD, and I had no way of playing it. Now, luckily, my, my mom would pretty much never buy games for me. That just, like, wasn't a thing. Uh, however, she felt pretty bad that I spent $50 on a game, and I was blocked on, like, a $15 fee to try it, that I think she gave me one month. She, like, let me renew one month. Now, that one month, I made a Dwarf Warrior. And this was back in Vanilla Vanilla. And I probably got to, like, level 20 or 30. Um, actually, probably, like, level 15, to be honest. Um, and then my mom decided that World of Warcraft is bad for me. It's just, it's just a bad, it's a bad game. It's addictive. Uh, it's, yeah, whatever. So she refused to renew it past that first month. So uh, she also, like, kind of banned me from playing WoW. So luckily, um, I just would bike to the physical store and get, a, what was it, like a 60-day game card such that I could buy it in cash or whatever, whatever scraps of money I could find uh, mowing lawns and stuff. By any chance, was she religious? Nah. Nah, she was just a relatively strict, strict mom. Um, okay, so basically, I, I, I played that for a while, and at TLDR, I didn't really do anything relevant in WoW until, honestly, like, I did PvP, and I PvP'd pretty competitively on a balanced druid in Burning Crusade, and I got to, like, 2100 or 2200, whatever arena ranking was required to get all of the items. Uh, maybe it was 19, 1900. I don't fucking know. I, I grinded arenas and got to the point where I had all, all Biss arena gear. Then, then, I took a long break from WoW, and for some reason, like, three years ago or something like that, or two years ago, I joined a Burning Crusade private server, uh, because traditionally I played a lot of classic private servers, but I never played a Burning Crusade private server, so I wanted to try it out. And I ended up making a priest, which I think the reason why I made a priest is because it's literally the least played thing I've ever I've in WoW. Like, I, I don't think I ever got a priest uh, past, like, level 10. So I made a priest, and I actually got this character to, like, level 30 or 40 before discovering that I really enjoyed healing. The, like... The mechanics of healing are really interesting because you don't really have a rotation. Everything is reaction, like quick reaction based on whatever gets thrown at you in the raid. And like, 
you might have someone who stands in a mechanic and takes more damage, and you have to make the split-second decision of, like, can you afford to keep them alive while also keeping the raid alive? Like, do you just let some random DPS who did something stupid die, or do you burn the thousand mana that might reduce the amount of time that you have in your mana pool to support the fight by, like, 30 seconds? Because you have to, like, panic dump into this person to save them with inefficient heals. Um, so, basically, um, yeah, so, I found that I really enjoyed this, so I got to, I got to level 70, I even was, like, relatively known on the server before even 70 for just, like, healing dungeons and stuff, like, people love doing dungeons, that's how I found my guild and stuff like that. Um, so then... I quit that server and started Classic because Classic came out and I played Classic for like a couple months and I got like a, a priest to level 46, but I never made it to 60 because like a lot of the people that I started with just kind of quit. Whatever. So then last year in March, I made a priest on Grobulus called Onarine and somehow actually got her to level 60. It, it took a long time. I spent like a good 30 days leveling because I I spent most of my time RPing and making friends. So I ended up like at level 40 or 50, I was in an RP PvP guild and we had like massive 40 v 40, 80 v 80 battles in the open world. Like RP organized battles of like fighting over, like, a, a bridge or land control or a town or something like that. Um, and I was, like, level 40, and I was, like, banging out the biggest heals in this. Like, even with level 60s there, I was still banging out the biggest heals. Now, maybe people were giving me some space and because I was low level, um, but, like, these level 60s could one-hit me. So a lot of it was, like, positioning and, and, just, and just blasting out some good heals. So. So. I ended up getting Onion Ring to level 60, and I went through a couple phases. I joined an RP raiding guild. This would have been for AQ40, maybe a bit before then, maybe BWL. I, I think AQ40, I think I was raiding before AQ40 came out. Like, I think I saw AQ40 on the, on the first day it was available. Um, so... <laughs> Basically, the progression in Classic WoW is there's there are one, two, three, four, four forty man raids. Uh, there's Molten Core, which is the easiest. There's BWL. There is AQ forty, which is where it starts to be a a little bit more difficult. And then you have Naxxramas, and that's kind of the hard one. That's the one that a lot of people kind of failed to actually get through in. Classic WoW, or in, in vanilla, in classic, most people were able to clear it. So, I joined in BWL days, I joined an RP PvE uh, guild that was doing raiding. Now, unfortunately, um, people who know RP servers will know that RP servers notoriously have mm, pretty shit characters. Like, most people are there to be social and have fun, and they don't necessarily care about the meta or, or other things like that, right? So it's, it's just kind of a, it's just kind of whatever when you're playing these servers. Um, so I ended up leaving that guild. Actually, well, I actually got kicked from that raid. So that raid was a, a, a coalition of like uh, three or four different, uh, three or four different guilds. And I ended up uh, switching guilds to another guild, and the guild leader of my guild got really mad, went on a power trip, and got me kicked from the raid. The raid that they didn't necessarily manage because they were mad at me because I went to a guild that I had no idea was actually where they came from to start from. So they were in that guild. They then switched. <laughs> they then basically had a disagreement with the officers of that guild. They quit the guild, made their own guild. I joined that guild because I didn't know these things about drama that happened a year before I joined the server. 
And then I found that I liked a couple of the people in the other guild, and I switched over to that guild. And then they got really mad at me. <laughs> they got really mad at me and uh, got me kicked from the raid. But that kind of worked out because then I joined another raid that was a little bit more hardcore. Not, not crazy, but making a little bit more progress and a little bit more focused on, on kind of pushing things through. Honestly, probably the best raid that I was in. It, it definitely wasn't the best in terms of performance, but it was probably the best in terms of uh, basically the basically the just the fun, that atmosphere. It was it was a super fun raiding atmosphere. I don't know if I'm gonna get out of this accent now, uh, Janabel. Yeah, you fucking you fucking wanker. Yeah, yeah, fucking yeah, fucking. <laughs> Anyways, so. Uh, I was in this other guild that was semi-hardcore, not semi-hardcore, they they were a pretty casual guild, but uh, they had a little bit more experience and more, were more willing to, like, make these uh, uh, progression and, and change. Um, so then I, I left that raid in search of something a little bit more aggressive, and I found the final raid that I raided with, which was Lucid, which I would say probably qualified for semi-hardcore. We had people who would use sappers, we had people who were playing meta specs and those sorts of things. There were a couple of meme specs and a couple people that weren't consuming and doing those things, so I would say it was like semi-hardcore. Um, but that is where I really, really started to get, uh, get good, I would say. Okay, so what what happened what did i do that made me get so good so and when and when i say so good i mean by by an arbitrary metric so this this is my this is my classic performance this is um this is a warcraft logs and warcraft logs is where people upload what they call parses and parses are the uh, the parses are the the thing that everyone jokes about as like the meme thing that people are competing about. So so basically, parses are your percentile. Uh, it, it's all of these are your your percentile, right? So like best perf average. So these percentiles are basically how well you performed on these bosses, right? So if, if you had a ninety nine, that means you are in the top one percent of whatever you were doing. This rank is the the rank in terms of, like, in the world you're ranking. So this is, like, 213th, 176th, blah, 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 blah. Now, um, and then this is, like, my overall world ranking of 92 based on all-star points, uh, but this includes both Alliance and Horde. And you, like, you can't compare Alliance and Horde because Alliance has a massive, massive advantage in classic like a 10 percent advantage so it's not really feasible to compare uh everything together now luckily i'll be alliance in the next version um but anyways so basically this kind of shows my performance on all of the different bosses and this has history of all of the um history of all of the bosses that i did so i can kind of see like basically what my parses were you know how they stood up to the world all those sorts of things um, and I can see this for all the different raids. Now, um, basically, I was striving to be the best in one specific category. And that category is complete raid healing. So complete raid healing is basically if I go here and I say complete raid. And complete raid healing is basically your performance um, over the entire raid. This is like your sustained healing per second for all bosses in the raid. So in Naxxramas, there are 15 bosses. So basically, uh, for every single raid I did, except for one, um, I was in the top 1% for basically being consistent throughout the entire raid. And, and you might see like this, that it's 99.3, and that doesn't sound that, that good. But the thing is, a lot of people will get like a 99 here or there. Most people don't have them consistently, and they're also not banging them out in the same run. So like if I go into one of these... And I, I look at kind of the parses that uh, I had throughout the um, throughout all of the bosses in this raid. 
here's like a little table. If I look at healing, I'm banging out like a 99, 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 right? And people who are like really pushing it will sometimes hit a 99 on like one boss once every other week. It's pretty rare to be hitting that many 99s. So, um, anyways... Now, it's important to note that that a lot of people meme about healer parses and say that healer parses don't matter, right? Um, and that is true to some extent. If you have the analytical brain of the average chatter, um, aka very smooth brains, right? It, it, your Twitch chat, right? Let's be honest, not the brightest. Um, basically, if you have the analytical mind of Twitch chat, you will probably agree. Healing parses don't matter. They can be cheesed. They can be faked. Um, parsing really well in healing per second could indicate that maybe you're not doing your responsibilities correctly. Maybe you're not resurrecting people. You're not providing the utility and the support that you should be doing as a healer. Like, even, even though your job is to heal, sometimes it's more important that you dispel or you rebuff someone or you resurrect someone who has died to keep things moving. Um, so yes, I, I can agree that healing parses can be cheesed, they can be made kind of fake, and you definitely can play in a way that is suboptimal for your raid to chase bigger parses. Now, in reality, um, that's not really the case. In reality, if you have an anal analytical mind that is is better than that of twitch chats what you can do is you can actually look at the you can look at the raid you can see how well they manage their buffs were they buffing were they resurrecting people now unfortunately um unfortunately warcraft blogs doesn't show things out of combat so it only shows things in combat uh which is really unfortunate because um, I had some tools that would allow me to see, uh, basically, like, my resurrections and stuff. Um, but resurrections, yeah, you can see one res happen for this whole raid. That's not the case. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know if I have my old logs. Um, hmm. Uh, log parser, but I don't think I saved them. Yeah, I think I actually had this in my WoW folder, and I blew away my WoW folder. Uh, so I don't think I have those parses. Shit. I probably have them on Gist. Uh, because I would typically upload my Gists. Um, with my raid stuff. Um, bu -bu -bu -bu. yeah, here we go. Here's April 30th. So I had my own parsers, and here, here we can start getting into like the things that I did. Uh, basically, this is my 430 raid, and let's see, uh, 430 would be uh, this one, this raid. So we can see this raid. Um, let's see, my overall performance on this raid was uh, rankings for complete raid. Yeah, this was a 99 raid. Um, so this is a raid that I did a lot of healing per second, but now I can also look at what I actually did, right? So if we if we look at, uh, well, I didn't do Abolish Disease, and that's mainly because Zedmore was literally assigned to do that for one boss that uh, put diseases on people. Um, the other things that I should have been doing is really anything that, like, yeah, Zedmore was doing, right? So, uh, this is basically Consumes, Brilliant Mana Oil, I applied a lot of Consumes. This is Dark Runes, this is another Consume, obviously I'm at the top of Consuming. Um, Dispel Magic, okay, I, I suck at Dispels, I'm, la I'm lazy with Dispels. Uh, Distilled Wisdom, uh, another buff. Divine Spirit, this is buffing, I was not assigned to do Divine Spirit, but I think I was assigned to do, uh, let's see, maybe this is a bad example, maybe I wasn't doing shit. Um, that's normal heal. That's buffs. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, 
Prayer of Fortitude. Okay, so I, I was doing a decent amount of buffs, and then, let's see, Onarine. Classic Zedmore. Um, renew, restore mana, resurrection. Yeah, so I was, like, up there with number of resurrections. I'm doing my job. Um, shackles, I wasn't assigned to do shackles. I also didn't spam shackle. I don't know why other people did. Uh, what else? What else? Actually, I think I have... I think I have these sorted by... Yeah, so we can see that I did a lot of shields. I did... Uh, okay, maybe I didn't do too much this raid. Powered Fortitude. I might have been tilted this raid. Let's let's see if uh, I can find one where I was less tilted. 423 out of combat, Cass. Um, how long do, uh, does a run of this raid last? For us, it was about two hours. Uh, here, yeah, Power Word Fortitude, 24. Prayer Fortitude, 20. Right? So I think this is probably one of the weeks where I was, like, really mad that people weren't doing these things. Um, so if we look at Power Word Fortitude, this is basically the, the buff that gives you health. Right? Um, and, yeah, I did twice as many buffs of, of Power Word Fortitude as other people. Uh, Prayer of Fortitude. I also did the most Prayers of Fortitude. Right? I also did the most prayers of shadow protection, and I also did the most prayers of spirit. Um, so, of all the priests, and let's see, uh, res, uh, uh, resurrection. Mm, why is that not showing up here? Oh, it was. Um, resurrection. Yeah, I was up there with doing some of the most reses as well, right? So basically. I, it's not like I'm not doing my fucking utility things. In fact, I am probably spending three times more mana on buffing people than other people are doing. Which, if you're trying to just chase heals and just trying to get really big parses, you don't want to do shit like that. You, you want to literally bottle up all your mana and let everyone else do all the shit work and then you focus on the thing that, that is just raw healing. So this would have been 423, so we can look at 423, and we can see if I did shit performance on 423, but I would hazard I probably didn't. Um, are we on a WoW Safari? Yeah, we're on a little WoW Safari. Right now, I'm justifying why my metrics are, are valid, and I'm not cheesing things. Uh, 423. Yeah, that was, a, that was a relatively good week. Um, 423. Oh, AU beat me this week. Oh, that was Patrick. Okay. Yeah, for all kills, yeah, I'm up there on the top. And once again, for the complete raid, this will definitely be a 99, right? Yep, 99 for the complete, a three and a half hour max. Holy shit, this is a bad max. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. So, the metric that I use as why I was the best healer in the world is <laughs> gotta bring back the cat at disc priest my shields are op yeah 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 that's definitely true so naxxaramus i go into rankings i then look at healing for complete raids and then i look for holy priests because that's what my class was and then i sort by horde because you'll see that everything in here is alliance that's not a coincidence Alliance happens, red is horde, blue is alliance. It is not a coincidence that fucking all of these are alliance. They have a massive advantage. Let me sort by Gamozo the best. Anyways, so far that hasn't been too strict, and then I sort by horde. Okay, and then you'll see that I am number four in the world. And this is where chat complains oh my god you lied to us you clickbaited you're a piece of shit i hate you you're evil blah 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 i'm twitch chat i have a smooth brain okay so here's what we do we determine whether or not mine is l different in any ways than these three okay so let's take a look at this this is for the entire raid, and we can see the most healing that it did was on DBZ, who is a warrior. You can tell because he's the warrior color. And then you can see the second most healing is done on Eldwin, which is a druid, another tank, right? 
And we can verify that by going to Onarine, or not Onarine, we can look and we can see that I'm doing most of my healing on DBZ and Elduin. And if we look at damage taken, we can see that DBZ and Elduin are the ones who are the tanks for the raid. They're the ones taking the most damage. Now let's take a look at these Chinese ones. They're a little bit more interesting. Okay, this person primarily healed a Warlock and a Rogue. That's very interesting. Now let's look at damage taken for that Warlock and Rogue. Let's see. Oh, that's interesting. There wasn't a Warlock that was tanking for this. Wait. The, all their tanks are Warriors. Was this, was this Priest healing their Warriors? Oh! 10% of their healing was to the Warriors. Ah, so what was actually happening here? Well, this is how people cheese parses. Basically, Warlocks have an ability to life tap. So what Warlocks can do is they can cast life tap, which will convert health into mana. So what people will do to cheese these logs is they will literally have a Warlock just tap forever, and then you just heal them. And when you don't have to worry about overhealing, and you don't have to worry about only healing the damage that's actually being received, there you go, right? You, it's pretty easy to cheese when you can just heal into a target dummy. Then, okay, let's look at this other one. Let's see what this priest was healing. Oh, two warlocks and themselves. So they primarily healed two Warlocks and themselves. Okay, did we have a Warlock tank in this raid? Oh, interesting. We didn't have a Warlock tank. Again. Huh. What about this one? Okay, once again, primarily healing a Warlock. Weird. Almost as if that's not the tank again. Huh. It isn't. Because Warlocks aren't fucking tanks. So basically, almost all of these parses that you see... And, and then we can look at mine again. Number four, let's see how I did. Oh, I healed the two tanks of the fucking raid. <laughs> and let's look at the person behind me. Is this person cheesing? Did this person I beat legitimately cheese? Maybe not. Maybe not. Eh, they did a lot of self-healing, which is a little bit weird. It's a little bit weird that your second most healed target is yourself, and also your fifth most healed is a warlock. Let me see, let me see where warlocks were on mine. Let's see. Oh, that might be... That might be Death Knight Understudy. Let me see. Um, I can't, I can't read Chinese, unfortunately. Um... Uh, ba -ba 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 I want, uh, targets of the heals. Yeah, that is Death Knight Understudy. Okay, so that one's... This one is probably actually legit. <laughs> like, in the ballpark of legit. Like, looks reasonable. Um, Death Knight Understudy is a, is a mob that you heal in, in one of the boss fights. What about this one? Okay, this one looks semi-legit as well. That looks reasonable-ish. What about this one? This looks reasonable, too. Okay, yeah. But we'll see. They have they have no world buffs, yeah. Um you can also tell it's longer raids. Longer raids are actually better for healing because you have you, you have more time to bang out big heals. Um Okay, anyways, the top three are cheesed, and that makes sense because there's no way that someone did two hundred more healing per second than I did. There's no fucking way. <laughs> it's just not feasible. All right, so TLDR, uh, yeah, based on based on that metric, uh, I'm probably number one in the world. What about this one? This is all stars. Um, people often will cheese these as well. Let's take a look. Patrick, yeah, you can tell this is cheese because they have one performance that's way better than all of them. And let's look. They're probably healing. They're healing themselves. Yep. Or they're healing a warlock and they're healing a rogue. So they have a, a warlock that's tapping that they're healing, and then a rogue that they're that they're healing who's dipping into the slime back and forth that like halves their health. So probably almost all of these people are cheesing. And let's just take a look because this is another metric where I could maybe be number one in the world. So basically, if these people are getting these all-star points, 
which is basically the sum of this like weird bell curve. Um, let's see if this is cheesed. Um, yep, that's cheese. They're healing rogues primarily. Once again, someone dipping in slime. Uh, let's look at this dude. This dude, actually, these look semi-legit. These look, these look reasonable. Yeah, these actually look reasonable. Um, nothing in here looks too cheese. Uh, that looks like a, a possible Saf. Yeah, this person is probably just a really good healer. So, like, they, they definitely stand. Um, yeah, and they're performing through TBC as well. Uh, what about this person? This person also is probably a pretty good healer because they're sustaining their stuff through other raids. Although this is probably cheese right here. Yep. That's definitely cheese. Uh, okay, so we're gonna ignore that one. So there's like one dude who didn't cheese. This is probably another dude who didn't cheese. That looks pretty uncheesy. Um, that looks pretty uncheesy. That looks uncheesy. Yeah. But basically, um, yeah, yeah, these are literally all Chinese. Yeah, if I go by everywhere else, if I go by US and EU, number one, number one, Number one. Hell yeah, brother man. Anyways, I went for a complete raid healing because that is the one that uh, I think is more related to whether or not you're doing sustainable heals. So this is compared to basically everyone else uh, in US and EU. I have like a, almost 100 healing per second lead. And a lot of that is consuming, but a lot of that is my gearing and my rotations and my strategies and all of that sort of shit. So, let's take a look at how we did that. How, how does that sound, chat? Does everyone, li does everyone like that backstory of, of why it's actually kind of legit? <laughs> now, now that I've self-justified um, why, why I should be, uh, you know, it's a super educational. Yeah, get fucked. Finally, you know what, Sufuri, I, I, I might just ban you if you're going to keep being a, a douche nozzle, you know? Will you play Season of Mastery? Yeah, that's the plan. I'm going to be playing the disrespect in these logs, yeah. Yep. Okay, so I spent a decent amount of time working on... That was a seriously long cutscene. Yeah, I got fucked. Um, pleb, wow, theory. Okay, so... I, this is some of the older stuff. I'll have to kind of see what I, what I did to, to, to start everything. So basically I started out with this like character, uh, was it, hmm. Which one did I start with? Probably WoW Info. So WoW Info is a tool that I wrote, not high performance, doesn't really matter. Uh, WoW Info is a tool that I wrote that basically allows me to, uh, basically make a database of all of the items and stats and those sorts of things in the game, right? Um, that's pretty boring. We're not even going to go into that. Uh, Wowhead Scraper, obviously this is something that scrapes Wowhead. So this is doing the same thing. This is actually downloading everything from Wowhead. And then this should be caching all of these things into here. So I can look at like 1491.xml. This is this item, a ring of precision, an XML and HTML forms because they have exclusive, uh, mutually exclusive data. So basically, I would scrape Wowhead to get this data. I wrote some add-ons as well to scrape this from in-game, but in-game had you there was some information that Wowhead had that you didn't have in-game. First of all, like where where the items came from, which is important for basically me, me figuring out how I need to get this gear. Um, but also, um, it wouldn't include like random enchantments of items, which once you get to late game, random enchantments of items don't really matter. But early game, when you're doing like Prebus or low level stuff, uh, those are often your best pieces. So I wanted to make sure that I could capture those. Um, and let's see, I think while wow, AVX 512 is probably where I did some fun stuff. Let's see what's currently plottable here. Okay, um, yeah, so this is, looks like phase five. So this is something I did in AQ40. And this is the healing per second sustained for a four minute fight. 
And then on the x-axis, I have the Power Word Fortitude buffed health, right? So basically what this graph is telling me, so I, I, can, I can tell you pretty much immediately from looking at this graph, what I'm basically trying to do is I'm trying to figure out how much healing per second I lose if I want more health. So I probably was having problems dying at this point. I probably didn't have enough health with my gear at the time. And I was probably finding myself too squishy for some encounters. So basically, I'm trying to figure out what are the trade-offs? What is the curve like? Basically, as I swap out stamina, uh, as I replace like healing stats like uh, intellect that gives you more mana, spirit that gives you more regeneration, MP5 that gives you more regeneration, stuff like that, I'm basically trying to see, like, what is actually causing that, uh, or, like, what does that curve look like? Basically, I was trying to figure out, can I get to, like, 2400 health without massively sacrificing my heals? And the answer is yes. Like, you can see that this is a curve that kind of falls off of a cliff, so as long as you don't push it too hard, if you come in, like, the 2200 to 2400 range like that, you're probably able to sacrifice a little bit of healing, but have a lot more health. Um, so, then, uh, the different lines here are the different types of heals that I can spam. And basically, uh, I think this was like a relatively simple model where I basically, what I do is I compute your effective mana. So, this is, this is where WoW gets, WoW gets difficult, um, as a healer. And this is why healing is unbelievably difficult. Um, so... One of the big things, uh, I should get my, uh, tablet. Uh, where's that at? Where's that script? Ah. Uh. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully this will work. Hi. All right, can I have your gold? No, 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 you can't have my gold, even though I don't plan on really playing my character anymore. Uh, yeah, get fucked. Uh, all right. So, now I need to plug in my... Nico, Nico, thank you so much for first time. First time viewer. Okay, oops. All right. Ah, uh, rip. Gotta make another layer. All right. So, here is what makes WoW healing theory crafting relatively difficult. So, you have a couple different variables. You have plus healing, and plus healing gives you more healing, right? Um, and what's interesting about this is this also is a plus efficiency, right? But this also, and this is not something that most people think of, plus healing gives you more MP5. Or more specifically, it makes your MP5 more efficient. Right? Basically, if your heal, your, your greater heal rank 1, which is like the one that you're normally sp spamming, this has a coefficient of, I think, 83.7%, which means that you take your plus healing... You multiply by 83.7%. You add that to the base healing, which I think is like uh, 1,300 or something like that. Somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, it's like 1314 or something like that. I, I forget. Um, and then that gives you the average heal of your greater heal rank 1, right? 
Now, what's interesting about this is uh, Greater Steel 1, oh, it costs 314 mana. I think that's what I'm thinking of. This is probably like, I forget what this is. Anyways, basically, uh, it costs 314 mana, mama, which I, I apparently wrote mama. MP5 is mana per five seconds. Uh, so this is, yeah, mana granted to you every five seconds. Now, it's pretty misleading because you actually get mana every uh, 2.5 seconds um, or every two seconds. I don't know. I, f I forget all these little details. <laughs> um, basically, you get mana every, uh, I think it's every two seconds. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's every, it's every two seconds. Um, so... The game says it as mana per five. Why? I don't fucking know. It's just what they do in the game. So, um, anyways. So, if you have this greater heal, you have this plus healing that for different spells has different coefficients. So, for, like, a flash heal, um, this is, like, a 42-something percent coefficient. So, plus healing doesn't do as much to your flash heals. So, your flash heal might be 500 healing... And it might be like 400 mana, um, right? So uh, you have this flash heal, and you also get less from plus healing. So flash heal is your kind of your panic heal, and that's one thing that we'll get into. That's interesting about healing is basically deciding when to use your inefficient panic heals. But anyways, we have greater heal rank one, and the things that kind of go into this are we have the more healing that makes the spell literally more potent by a factor of 83.7%. We have the mana cost, which is fixed. We cannot change the mana cost. There are a couple talents that decrease it by like 10%, but this is like the already decreased cost because it, it it's just Nash. It's just correct. Um, then you have mana per five seconds. And mana per five seconds means that you get the 314 mana that you need to cast faster, right? So if you have 314 mana per five, you won't. If you have 314 mana per five, you can cast, you can just spam this. And okay, so it, with gearing, you know, basically based on the gear available, like some designer in the game decided ratios. They decided that approximately 50 healing is worth five MP5, which is equal to... 15 spirit, which is equal to 10 intellect, right? Someone arbitrarily came up with these things probably by a gut feeling. Now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to exploit if there's any imbalance in that. Um, we're, what we're trying to do is find if for some reason a certain thing just kind of seems to be better or a weird pairing or combination of gear happens to be best. So, mana per five gives more mana. Spirit also gives more mana, and it gives more mana at a rate of, uh, I forget, it's like 13 plus spirit over four, I think? This is like the MP5 that, that you get, and then you multiply this by like point, uh, three to get the in-casting spirit? Yeah, it, it's, yeah. <laughs> Basically, spirit um, gives you both while casting and while not casting MP5. And we'll we'll go into that a little bit more. So this is um, MP5 while and while not casting. Right? So we have we have kind of these different factors. And then we have intellect. Right? And intellect gives you a 15 mana per int, right? And then you have things like your base mana, your character has base, your character has base intellect. Uh, so your character has some base intellect and your character has some base mana. And then uh, what's really interesting is that then on top of all of this stuff, um, you also, <laughs> on top of all of this shit, you also gain, um, you also have buffs. And buffs, on top of this, often will give a percentage. So there's, like, there's buffs that will give you, like, plus 10% stats. 
Well, that's really interesting because stats are spirit, stamina, agility, strength, and intellect, right? So mana per five is not a stat, and plus healing is not a stat. So there are some buffs that give plus 10% stats. So that will make your int stronger, that will make your spirit stronger, but it doesn't make your spirit or your MP5 or your healing stronger. So now that's another variable in the equation. Basically, um, do those things actually affect, like, that could, that could seriously throw off the difference, right? The fact that that 10% applies to a certain stat might actually make this stat more valuable than this stat. Or maybe there's a certain point where you're stacking too much healing, and then it's worth getting some intellect, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, it's a lot of this is like figuring out the formulas, doing a lot of testing. Uh, intellect also gives crit chance, uh, but you have so little crit on a, on a healer that it's just not even worth caring about crit chance. And also, crits are not reliable, so if a character is missing a thousand health, I'm going to heal them for a heal that does a thousand. I'm not going to heal them for a heal that does 500 and I hope that it crits, or 750 and hope that it crits, right? So, most crits go to overhealing. I also did some analysis on that where I looked through logs and I kind of analyzed the overhealing, basically the amount of healing that that didn't actually do healing because you healed over someone health someone's health that's uh, not missing. So, uh, on top of all of this, um, you also have cooldowns. You probably, you probably have, like, uh, you probably have six to eight different, like, one to two minute cooldowns, right? So you have a bunch of things that are kind of steroids that you're going to want to use when it makes the most sense. And a lot of these are going to be situational. Um, so you need, to, you need to study the raid, you, you need to know when to use these situational, um, cooldowns, you need to know how your raid performs, where they're taking burst damage, where you want to use your, your steroid that helps you do big healing, the steroid that gives you more mana back, all those sorts of things. These are also part of the equation. Um, yeah. So that, that kind of from a rough level gets you... Uh, where you need to be. So, what I did is I decided I wanted to uh, enumerate item sets. So, the first thing that we want to do is we want to talk about what people, this is a brain, uh, what people with, uh, and then this is like a glossy shine spot. Um, so, this is, this is what smooth brain people do. Smooth brain people do this. They say they they make stat weights. And stat weights go like this. One spirit is equal to 0 0.5 int, which is equal to uh, four healing, which is equal to 0 0.2 MP5. Right. They they basically do this with their very smooth brains and and they they basically have this sort of thing and then when they get some gear they look at it and they they multiply all of the things by these coefficients and if the score is is bigger than the other if A is greater than B then A is the best gear to wear. Yeah, this is for this is for idiots. This is for people who don't understand how the game works. And let's explain why that is the case. Okay? Here's why that is the case. All right. Let's say... Let's, let's say... Uh, let's actually go find one. Let's go find... Um, let's go find one and make fun of it. Uh, wow, classic priest stat weight. So basically every guide you'll find is for smooth brains because th these are just idiots. Um, okay, these are literally the, the formulas. Those aren't weights. Um, while well, not casting, blah, blah, blah. That makes sense. These are standard stat priority. So here's another thing that people will do is they'll do straight stat priority where they say healing is better than MP5, which is better than int, which is better than crit, be better than stam. So you basically stat those, stack those things. But I really, oh, here we go. 
This is what I like to see. Stat weights for a priest. Um, uh, no one's responding to this. Current spirit and plus heal. Stat weights. I bet they got their formula wrong. That's another thing. Pretty much everyone gets their formulas wrong. Uh, because people have no idea how formulas work. Um, because pretty much all the formulas online are wrong, so you have to go and figure those out. Um. Okay, what's this? Stat weights classic. This looks like a an add-on that gives you the stat weights. Uh, is there are there built-in stat weights? Let's see. Libs. Uh, no, I don't want that. I want stat weights classic. Hopefully they have a list. Hopefully they have like a predefined list. Um. Okay. These are, this is like spell info. Hmm. Priest, fifteen thousand lines. Holy dick. Um. Yep. Priest buffs. Uh, they had the right formula. That was pretty good. Um, yeah, I don't think they have any weights on that. So it looks like you put in those weights. <sighs> I really would like to find stat weights. People often will make their stat weights for themselves. Uh, this is for TBC. Uh, oh, this is good because it's a guide. Uh, that's a terrible build. Um... Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, those coefficients. Oh, 85.7 and 43.3 are the coefficients. Yeah, that sounds about right. Currently looking at, uh, working on libcurl multi-interface with libev and C++. The example they gave is 400 lines of code and it's a callback nightmare, but it's so fast. Well, it, it, sometimes, sometimes it's just... <gasps> Oh. Okay. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. We're going to grab these stat weights. And they actually hit on something that makes sense. But we're just going to we're going to hit on these. Uh so we have heal is 1. What's your played for theory crafting? Probably hundreds of hours. Uh Heal is one. Uh, spirit. Now, this is someone who's trying to be a big brain. 0 0.8275. Sounds a little made up. Sounds like, uh, sounds a little made up. Intellect. Uh, this is 2.3. Um, then we have MP5, which is 3.5. And we have crit, which is eight. That, yeah, okay, sure. We're gonna ignore crit because it's dumb. Um, seven eighths, yeah. All right. So here's what people would do. Okay. So let's say you have a piece of gear, and it gives plus fifty healing, and uh, it gives plus three MP five, and it gives plus 10 int. Okay. And then you have another piece of gear, and this one gives zero healing, uh, zero MP5, and it gives 30 int. And then you have another one that gives, uh, let's say, 30 healing, heal, heat. Uh, let's say it gives 8 MP5, and it gives zero int. Which one of these pieces of gear is better? Well, if we look at the stat priorities, we can see that this is 50 plus, plus no spirit, and then int is, it, this is 2.5, I think. So 2.5 times 3 is like, I don't know, like 8, I don't know, some, something like that. Uh, intel, oh, oh, that's intellect. Um, MP5 is 3.5, so this is like 10. Uh, and then intellect is 2.5, so this is 25. Then this one is 0, 0, and 30 times 2.5. So this is like 60. 
Uh, this is like 70. Um, then we have this final one. I'm, I'm bad at mental math. Uh, that's like, uh, yeah, that's like 70 ish. Um, and then we have 30 here and then we have, I said eight MP5 here. Um, eight MP5, 3.5 times eight is like 24, 20, let's just say 26 and zero. Okay. Okay. So going to play fresh. Yeah. I'm going to be playing on, uh, if you do bang character, you can see where I'm playing. I forget the name of the server. So this piece of gear is, uh, uh, 85. Um, and this piece of gear is 70. And this piece of gear is uh, uh, 30 plus 26, uh, which is uh, 56. Okay, so we can see that that this piece of gear is is worse, and this one's slightly worse. And this is the, this is the best piece. This is the best piece of gear, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's dumb. <laughs> that's dumb. And you ready to see why this is dumb? You ready, chat? To see why this is dumb? So, this. What does this give you? Well, this gives you... 150 mana. Right? So you have 150 extra mana from that piece of gear. From the 10 int, which is 15 mana per. Then you get 3 MP5. But MP5 is mana per five. And mana per five is not fixed. MP5 differs based on the fight duration. So let's imagine that we have a very short, we're gonna, we're gonna run this out. We're gonna run this out for a couple different, uh, a couple different fights, right? So we're going to have a one minute fight, so 60 seconds, and then we're going to have a 10 minute fight, so 600 seconds. So for a 60 second fight, gear A gives 50 healing and it gives uh, three MP5. So I'm going to take three, divide it by five. That gives 0.6 mana per second times 60, which is 36 mana. So 36 mana plus 150 mana. So you get 100, 186 mana. So you have 50 healing and 186 mana. Then we have B. And B gives you zero healing. And it gives you uh, 30 times 15, 450 mana. And then you have C. And C is, uh, you get uh, 8 divided by 5 times 60. You get 96 mana. And, uh, and you get zero, uh, 30 healing, right? Right? So there you go. You got, you got 30 healing and, uh, 96 mana. You, you can probably, you can probably see where this is going, right? You, you can, you can probably... Uh, numbers were for a two-minute fight, uh, so what's wrong there? Well, you can see that MP5 has the same weight regardless of the fight time. <laughs> So I can tell you immediately that that's wrong. <laughs> so next, for a 10-minute fight, which is unlikely, now let's take a look at what we have. A gives 50 healing, and it gives uh, 3 MP5 divided by 5 times 600, 300, one, uh, 360 plus 150. Then we have B, and B gives 0 healing and 450 mana. And then you have C, and C gives 30 healing and 960 mana. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you can see that this one sucks ass for this. For a 60 second fight, I would much rather have 450 mana than t oh, oh, 186 mana with a little bit more healing. Because this gets me a whole cast that I previously couldn't uh, afford to do, right? Okay. So, then we can get where it gets even more complex, which is based on whether or not you have too much mana. If the fight is short enough, 
you might have. So that's one thing that blows stat weights kind of open as being stupid because MP5 and Int and Spirit are weighted based on their um um they're weighted based on the duration of the fight. So then if you go and you look at the um uh blah 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 uh then having more mana or more mp5 doesn't matter if you don't go oom right so if it's a if it's a 45 second fight like a super short fight and you literally can spam your most inefficient fastest heal and you don't go oom then literally mp5 and int don't matter at all you just care about healing you want as much plus healing as you can possibly get to increase the density of your heals, right? So you also have that to factor into the equation. Okay. So what does this all mean? What does this all mean? And what does this mean? Uh, we write a simulation. <laughs> This means that we write a simulation. <laughs> Basically, we are going to find which set is best for which fight based on which parameters and what gearing and those sorts of things. Okay. So the first thing that we have to do, if we want to simulate performance of gear sets... of gear sets then then we need to have access to a database of gear um common uh common ah combinatorial optimization is all about the constraints for specific context yeah can you switch your gear when in dungeon and WoW? Yes. Only while out of combat. So you can't do it in combat, but you can prepare for a boss fight. And if we look at, uh, if we look at Onion Ring, we'll see that there are uh, consistencies in fight times and those sorts of things. I guess we want classic. Um, so like if we look at patchwork, right? I can pretty safely say my patchwork fight is probably going to be between a minute and 50 and two, two minutes and 15 seconds. So that gives me a like 30 second window to optimize for. So a bad fight might push me up to here. A good fight's probably gonna push me down to here. Of course there are outliers and when there are outliers, you have to dynamically adjust. So this isn't just about theory crafting. If you go in expecting a two minute fight and it turns out to be a shit show and it's a, it's a long fight, it's like a three minute fight, it is on you to be watching the DPS meters and understanding how much longer you need to sustain. Because the goal of healing for not speed, if you're speed running, the goal of healing is to do the little, the least amount of healing you possibly can to keep everyone alive. If you're not speed running, which I wasn't speed running, AKA, I had time to regen after boss fights. Basically, um, what I, like, <laughs> I forgot where I was going with that. Um, basically, you have to make these dynamic calls based on how long the fight's gonna go, and what you wanna do is you always wanna end every fight completely out of mana. If you have any mana left at the end of the fight, you didn't heal as inefficiently as you could, right? Because inefficiency is good in healing. Um, you don't want... Like, people would complain about my overhealing sometimes. But ultimately, if I can afford to overheal, I'm going to overheal. On the off chance that a tank takes a crit. Or someone takes extra damage that's unexpected. Or I have a slight lag spike that delays me at half a second in my next heal. Like, if I literally... If I literally can... Um, if I have the mana for it, and I will get the mana back before we need it again, 
then I am going to use all of my mana. I am not going to downrank spells so I don't overheal or I don't stack other people's heals if I have the mana. If I literally can afford to do it, I'm going to dump the biggest fucking heal I possibly can. Um, and that's very dynamic. You have to make those calls based on the fight, but before the fight, you have to predict the length of the fight so you can pick your gearing set. So, if we want to simulate performance of gear stats, we have to have a database of gear. Obviously, we can't pick sets of gear to simulate if we don't have a database of gear to simulate. Second, after that, we also need uh, stats of the gear. So, um... And this is kind of the database of gear, but it turns out, due to all of the databases, getting the stats off gear is actually kind of hard. It's actually kind of fucking hard. And then further, uh, you need to understand talents. Um, you need some fight durations. You need to know uh, cooldowns. And then you need to know every single formula. You need to know all the formula that are involved in, um, in your mana regeneration, in the healing coefficients, in the amount of healing that you're doing, in the spirit to MP5. You have to understand the uh, uh, effects of... of gear sets which are set bonuses if you have like multiple pieces of a specific like class of gear on and you make those sets it might give you plus 15 percent uh out of uh out of casting mana or while casting while casting mp5 and and now that affects the mp5 stat weights so you have to like understand all of these things and there are a shit ton of variables there are so many variables here that this is prohibitively expensive. Right? This is just prohibitively expensive. It just it just is. This there's too much here to simulate these for all sets of gear. Okay, um uh, if you know a programming language, C-sharp, uh, can you do anything like game dev, even if you use it for only one field, software dev? Yeah, of course you can do game dev in C-sharp. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's honestly a pretty common language that people do, uh, C uh, that do dev, uh, game dev. Terraria is written in C-sharp. Um, and honestly, Terraria runs great. Like, C-sharp is actually a very, very good language. Okay, so... Um, I think LOL is C Sharp. The Unity game engine supports C Sharp. Yeah, I think Terraria is Unity with um C Sharp for like their their game. So they're using the C Sharp bindings of Unity or something like that. Um Okay, so So Terraria is mono game, not Unity. Oh, interesting. Okay. Hot dogs, horseshoes, and hand grenades is U Unity plus C Sharp. Okay. If you don't use HTML to build your game, don't talk to me. Yikes. 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 Web devs here. Okay. So. Now, uh, let's take a look at um, gear that I can wear. Um, so, I have, uh, let's say, items, armor, cloth. Let's say chest is a good piece. So here are all the pieces of gear that I could wear as a priest. Okay, there's 527 of them, right? Um, so there's 527. This is like pretty hand wavy. Some things in here are unobtainable. Some of them are super low level that like aren't even relevant. But yeah, if I wanted to just exhaustively search through all of these things... Uh, I have, how many slots do I have for my character? Uh, so you have a, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, you have eight slots there. And then you have eight. Uh, mm, well, we can go through these actually. One, two, three, four, five, two fingers, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So you basically have 15 slots, right? So let's say I have 500 items per slot. Just ballparking here. 500 items and 15 slots. Well, we're probably not going to be able to compute that number. <laughs> Ultimately, that is probably not going to be in the realm of, uh, of computation that we're going to be able to do. And I know, I know that Yep, that makes me look like a chump. That I, that, yep, basically, that's not gonna happen. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to reduce this set of gear. And there's a couple ways that you can do this. You can use some stat weights. And you can use stat weights to prune the items. You can use random. Where you, where you don't really care if you're actually hitting everything. You just assemble random sets and you see what sticks. And this would be like, maybe feedback. This is, this is, this is, this is basically AI ML, right? You, you randomly pick things and you, you, just, you just try to build better and better sets. But um, this, stat weights, is shit. And it's shit because you prune things that you don't want to prune. Uh, this is dumb because AI and M ML is stupid. Uh, and the reason it's stupid is because this will just find a local minimum. Uh, a local min or max. Right? So this, this basically is going to find a set of gear that works relatively well. And it's just going to dig into that hole even though there's like a much bigger hole over here. Right, so this this is just gonna suck, right? Th this is the gear I want. This is the gear that it gives me. So that leaves one option, and that is: can we exhaustively search? Can we exhaustively search a space which is? actually quite a bit larger than this because in reality we also have enchants on like the eight different pieces of gear and there's like four different enchant options so we also have that i guess that's not really that big of a number um but that's part of well that's actually you don't add those you multiply these um right so now we have we now have enchants that also are affecting all of the possibilities that we have so now we now we have even more fucking possibilities. TLDR, uh, we can't compute this. So, how do we exhaustively search this? I'm gonna give chat two seconds to figure it out. How do we exhaustively search this space? I don't want to miss a single minimum. Like, basically, let's imagine that the graph is like local minimum, local minimum, local minimum, and then asymptotic global minimum. That and the the width of this is just like this is like one pixel wide, right? And these are like ten thousand pixels wide, hundred thousand pixels wide, right? Uh, you could optimize the best option per slot and take an arbitrary number of items. Nope. It obviously miss them. Yep. So this is the this is what I want to solve. I want to find a ridiculously tight hole that could potentially be like a really exploitative set of gear that no one plays with because no one would even think to do it. It's like a synergy of all. 15 pieces of gear come together and you have this weird platter of like super in heavy gear that people wouldn't use because they'd use like a hybrid piece but it complements really well with like a super heavy healing gear and they all like stack up together really well right so here's what we can do we can and there's probably a name for this. Once again, I am not an academic. 
I'm not an academic, right? Since I'm not an academic, um, the best way to describe this is I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out if we can create, for all like headpieces, can we create the uh, set of all supersets of headpieces? So basically, let's say I have a piece of headgear that has 8 int and 3 MP5, right? And then I also have a piece of gear that has 9 int and 3 MP5. Do I care about this piece of gear? No. The answer is no. Because this is strictly a superset. That is strictly a superset. But some things... 1 int and 3 mp5, this, even though this is probably objectively, or 4 mp5, even though this is probably objectively worse in almost every situation, this is technically a separate piece. So, what I can do is basically find these sets of that basically find the minimum set of gear that is representative of all gear. Can't gear have special effects that might be relevant in combination with other gear effects? Yes, it can. Set bonuses. Um, set bonuses are also really complex. So. Sounds like per, per, Pareto Frontiers? I, I don't fucking know. Sounds like that to me. Um, I, I don't know what that is. Sure. Yeah, that sounds cool. Um, but what's interesting is that we can then make pseudo items. Right? So, pseudo items are heads plus shoulders, plus chest. So I can reduce this, reduce this, reduce this, and then I can reduce this as a whole, right? Because I then have these same things here where I might have a headpiece that's five int and I might have uh, and five MP5, and I have a shoulder piece, let's ignore chest. Let's just say it's, it's just head and shoulders. Uh, and then there's five int here and five MP5 here. And then we have another piece of gear that is 10 int and zero MP5. And then we have another piece here that is um, uh, zero int and 10 MP5. So inside these sets, these cannot be reduced. But then, when I do the combinations of these, you'll just find that there's just a 10 int, 10 MP5 combo. I mean, technically, there's also the 15 and, and 5, or 15 and 10, or 15 and 5, whatever it is, right? What, what, whatever the combos are. But basically, what I can do is I can further reduce the set by treating this as a pseudo item, because... Adding these two sets together, you're basically adding the stats of these items. And since most of these stats fall in the territory on items of like 0 to 15, the odds that when adding these together, when summing these stats between multiple pieces, ends up causing this to no longer be a superset, is actually pretty likely. Right? The odds that a, a combination of head and shoulders is strictly a subset of another combination of head and shoulders, it's pretty high. So then you end up in the situation where you end up being able to further reduce this problem. And once again, there has still been no lossiness. There is lossiness on uh, set bonuses. Um, 
And I don't think I ever solved set bonuses. Uh, I know that's off screen. I never really solved set bonuses, and I don't necessarily know um, if I have a solution of set bonuses. I've thought about expressing set bonuses in here such that they... Um, basically, what I was thinking is numerically um, assigning flags to these, where you'll have, like, set bonus would one would be a stat, and you would have one point on each of them. And then that would thus pretty much force all items that belong to a set to become unique items, right? Because if they're part of a set, they have this unique stat, which means they can't be pruned, because even if they're worse than another item, they will be kept because they have this stat bonus. So this set theory still works, but I think it might just start to get on the cusp of uncomputable if that happens. Because you start having a lot of things that have set bonuses. Although, that being said, there aren't that many things in the game that have set bonuses. There are honestly quite few. There's maybe, like, I don't know, like 20 total sets in the game that I could wear as a priest. So, kind of worst case scenario, I have, like, I don't know, like 20 more items per slot. But that that might be prohibitive, even. Uh, 20 to the... 20 to the fifth... Uh, it would actually be... Sets are usually... Uh, five to seven. We're gonna say five slots. Yeah, that's like three million. Maybe, uh, maybe is that 1.2 billion? Yeah, honestly, that's probably completely, completely feasible to have in the equation. Um, potentially. But obviously, that also multiplies with the existing items that are also the best items. Uh, what if you prune them, but, uh, set them apart? Um, then you can add the sets as a different combination back into the pool. That's, that's what I would basically do. Because I could also have a, a, a pruning algorithm here. Basically, most set bonus... Let's, let's take a look at a, a set bonus. So, uh, here's Vestiments of Transcendence. This is tier two, um, for WoW. Classic. And let's look at classic. Um... Uh, vestments of transcendence. Here we go. So this is the set. You can see that the set bonuses here are, we have a three set, a five set, and an eight set. There is no partial set bonuses. So if, if we were to combine these things, and now we're getting onto like things that we can do in future releases. If we have these different set bonus stats that are tracked differently, we can have a pruning pass on these and we can say, if the set bonus, uh, basically, the set bonus gets truncated, uh, truncated, uh, to the floor, right? So if you have a set bonus two, this is actually a set bonus zero, and a set bonus one is a set bonus zero, and a set bonus four is a set bonus three, right? Because it doesn't matter if you have more pieces of gear than the set bonus, so... 0, 1, and 2 are the same, 3 and 4 are the same, 5, 6, and 7 are the same. So then, even though you temporarily exploded, when you go to recombine these and you sum up these set, set bonuses, you can then start repruning these sets based on if they didn't cause you to trigger a new set bonus. So I do actually think that this would reduce just okay. Like, this probably wouldn't explode too much because you're really only adding, like, each set bonus probably has, like, two or three bonus tiers. So there's really only two or three tiers of items that are getting added. If you aren't adding up to those set bonuses, basically, if you have a... If you have a two set that is a subset of a zero set stats, then there's no reason to keep the two set around because it doesn't give you a set bonus, and thus it doesn't change any formulas. Does that make sense? Right? So, sure enough, that's what I did. And I can't remember what this actually reduced to. Uh, it takes like two or three hours to, to run. Um, but basically, um, I used like N squared or maybe N cubed or maybe N to the N. I, uh, I think N squared or N cubed. Basically, doing this set theory, I didn't write this in an algorithmically efficient manner. And that's because I didn't find a way to do it in my brain. Um, 
I have a hunch that there is a way to do this reduction cheaply, but I'm not 100% sure. That, like, mathematically reducing these sets is not trivial because I think you have to enumerate all shoulders for all heads. Um, and you have to enumerate all heads for all heads when you do the initial reduction of head pieces, right? And that's kind of tough. So I, I think I did like the naive N squared where I literally enumerated all heads and then I enumerated all heads again and then I like slid them past each other and I, I made these like sets. Um, I think I did it with multiple passes. I don't know. There's probably a better way of doing it. Um, that generation would take like one hour. So it would take like one hour to prune. Um, and the time it takes to prune depends on the size of these sets, right? Since you're working with like n squared or n cubed or whatever algo I used, um, basically this can be tweaked by the size of set that you allow. So, uh, I might group heads and shoulders together, but I might not include chests if chests would cause this n to be too large that I know this like three or two a factor, this power, would end up making this uncomputable. So I have to kind of keep the sets to the smallest size that I can reasonably use, right? Um, so uh, that's kind of like a, a, a relatively hard problem. And I, I think that there are ways to solve that. Um, and I also think that there I can definitely programmatically write it probably 10 to 100 times more efficiently, such that... I could probably add a little bit more to n and still still get away with the computation. But then that took like an hour. Um, one hour to like generate sets. Then it took, I don't know, like shit. I think like one to two hours to simulate the gear. Now, it's really interesting in that when I have generated these sets, um, we have gotten to the point where, where we're talking like... We're, we're talking in the orders of like... I think this reduced to like 10 to 1,000 trillion. I, I can't remember what the actual number was, but it was big. This was a big number of iterations. Even with all this reduction, it was still in the trillions. And that means that the simulation has to be really cheap. So what's really cool is that the first thing I have to do is I picked, I, I have all of my sets of gear, and I'm basically going through all of the combos of the gear. And I've hopefully made the largest gear uh, like partitions that I possibly can. Because I have to enumerate all heads and shoulders with all of chest and legs with everything else, right? And this is, like, up to, like, 20 items when you include enchanting slots, because enchants also affect these things, right? So I factored these all in, and the very first thing that I have to do as part of this simulation is I have to actually make the real stats, right? And the real stats here are relatively difficult. So, um, well, basically, all I have to do is I have to sum up all of these things, but let's say I have, like, 10 groups. This is still dynamic, right? I have a dynamic loop. So I have, a, I have a program here that has to loop summing something. And here, there has to be a conditional branch uh, checking if it's the end of the loop. And that is kind of expensive, <laughs> right? That conditional branch is pretty expensive because that is mispredicted one out of 10 times which means that this branch, instead of basically being like 0 0.5 cycles, actually it's probably gonna uh, sync to like a one cycle boundary. Um, instead of being one cycle, it will probably be like 20 to 100 cycles, depending on how much gets unwound uh, by the misprediction. So this operation, when you EV weight the cost of that branch, the EV branch is actually, instead of one cycle, like would be ideal, it's actually probably more like 100, it's probably more like 10 cycles. Probably 10 or 11 cycles is the cost of that branch, right? And that is 10x more expensive than one cycle. And obviously 10x more expensive when I'm doing a 
10 trillion or a thousand trillion operations is prohibitively slow. So right there, I already, I, I think, I did an optimization where the set reduction had a fixed number of sets that I was chasing. Um, because if I knew that I was going to have, like, if I knew that I would specifically have five pseudo sets, right, or three pseudo sets, let's say this is like this, this gear, this gear, and this gear, then I don't need a loop that's checking, uh, did we pass three? Because at compile time, when we built the application, it knows there's three, so it can just emit the, the sums of the three different chunks right away, right? So that immediately starts to become relevant. And, and we're going to go to a higher level in, in a minute here, but we're kind of using this as an example. And then further, we have to uh, come up with, then once we have the summed stats, we then have to simulate. We have to actually do our simulation. And how do we simulate? Well, unfortunately, we can't simulate, uh, uh, we can't simulate this many fights. It's infeasible, maybe, and we'll get to that. Uh, this, is, this is in the infeasible maybe territory for actually simulating fights. So here's what I did instead. I computed for each heal. So there's like 16 different heals I can do. So there's like 16 different heals that I can perform. What I did is I computed based on the plus healing. Uh, why do I keep typing, uh, writing heat? So based on the plus heal, I would compute the average heal of the spell. Right? So I know the plus healing, I know the base healing of what spell it is, and I can compute the average healing of the spell. Then what I can do is compute what I call my effective mana. And the effective mana is MP5 times fight duration. So that is the amount of mana that I will gain during the duration of the fight. Then I'll add that to my intellect and mana, right? That is the raw mana that I start the fight with. So I start the fight with this mana. I gain this mana during the fight. Um, and what else is in here? Um, and then spirit also affects uh, mana regen as well. So then I compute all of those things together. Right? So once I have that, I basically have my effective mana, and then in reality, I also have potions uh, on cooldown. So basically, my, my mana potions, my demonic runes, uh, I have my buffs, which give mana and stats, but I probably pre-added those into the equation. I don't have to recalculate those every loop because I have summed up all of the things that are constant outside of the loop, right? That is one of the biggest things in optimization. And I, I know it sounds extremely intuitive, but ultimately when you have a loop, um, the most important thing to do is if you have any work inside your loop that is repeated, that you move it outside of the loop. So when I'm computing my like, uh, for example, like the healing coefficient. I don't need to calculate the coefficient for these heals inside the loop. I can calculate that once outside because it doesn't change. Same with my potions and my buffs. Those are not affected by the fight unless I quantize them to the fight duration instead of averaging. So um, anyways, this gives me uh, the healing that the spell does. I know the mana cost of the spell, so I can go uh, effective mana. So the mana that I'll have over the course of the fight divided by the mana cost of the spell, and then I can multiply this by the average heal of the spell. And then I can divide that whole thing by the duration of the fight. And now I have my healing per second for a specific spell, right? I have my healing per second for a specific fell spell for a specific duration of a fight. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is what I did. So I did this in, um, actually, I think this, yeah, wow, AVX 512, I think this was exactly this. So, um, you're seeing the healing per second sustained for a four minute fight. So this is specifically for a four minute fight. Here's all the different spells. 
<laughs> and this is going through all the sets of gear. And you can see that, like, um, I can see that for a four-minute fight, um, Dritter Heal rank five is best, and that's definitely not true. Um, I probably added some weird things into here. Uh, I probably added that I had, like, infinite mana or something. Um, because rank five, you'd go oom um too early. Um, but basically, this is kind of telling me the efficiencies, the cost, the trade-offs of all these spells, their cast times, their mana consumption, the f duration of the fight. It factors kind of all of those things. So you're calculating the best heal for a given set. Could you go the other way and simulate stat weights first and match the closest item from DB? I can't necessarily do that because I can't... You can't go that way. Um, because the set of stat weights is infinite. Because the set of correct stat weights is like, well, technically, like, if you can get infinite healing, then you want infinite healing, and that's obviously the best stat weight. You can't, you can't concretize stat weights because they're con uh, continuous functions. So you, you can't really go the other way. Um... It's just not possible, because I don't know what sets... I don't know what ratios of stats are even possible. So if I generated ratios, I would probably make a ratio, a stat ratio, that doesn't exist in the game. And I could find, like, oh, this is theoretically the best stat ratio, and there would be many of them, keep in mind. Um, I wouldn't be bounding those by any real bounds. Thus... I would have stat ratios that are like, yeah, uh, 10,000x weight healing. Because in my simulations, if you had infinite healing, you do a fuck ton of healing. I couldn't constrain it, right? So I wouldn't know what space to search. And then further, when I searched that space, I would say like, oh, here's a good stat weight. And then I'd go look for an item set and none exist. And if none exists for that stat weight, it was pointless. So I can't actually go backwards. Anyways, the code that I wrote for this was kind of kind of shit. Um, can you write numerical analysis to interpolate and extrapolate a non-exhaustive set of tabulated results using a single aggregated value for each stat instead of going through combinations of items and sets? Nope, that's not possible either. Because combinations of sets affects your, your stat bonuses, it affects your, or your set bonuses, and it affects the synergy that different items have. You can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. A five, a five in fifteen intellect, or a five in fifteen spirit chest combined with a five in fifteen spirit shoulder is different than the pseudo item of them both. It won't be a per perfect exhaustive search, but it it uh, could be close enough. Nope, it is not close enough um, because that will never find an asymptotic uh, uh, maximum or minimum. It will, it will never even get close. The goal is to understand the mathematical behavior. I don't even care about that. My goal is to find a ridiculously potent set of gear that makes no sense because it synergizes really well. Like a set of gear that people would not bother constructing because it synergizes really well. Um, and yeah, with any approximation model, I mean, you're basically talking AI again. You're, you're going to find a local minimum, and you're not going to find asymptotes. And that's unacceptable to me. Um, this has to be exhaustive. So, anyways, that's what I did. Um, so basically, I have these, like, here's the meta items, where I basically combine the stats. Um, you probably underestimate AI, but who knows? Uh, yeah, do you, have a, do you have an iPhone or an Android phone? Android phone? If you do, uh, try to try to use the voice assistant to do anything and see if it is capable of recognizing speech beyond that of a three-year-old. Um, yeah, and if, uh, if a company with hundreds of billions of dollars invested into servers and scaling and AI and probably thousands of engineers that they're paying half a million dollars a year to can't figure out that fucking problem, I'm pretty sure AI fucking sucks. Um, it's really just not good. AI, AI is good at approximating things that people are too lazy to figure out how actually work. <laughs> it works good for setting up my alarm. Yeah, I think that's the only thing that it's okay at. It's pattern matching, but it's done poorly. 
Yeah. There's a reason why real analysis and numerical analysis are used in scientific computing. Of course, it's not possible to compute every combination, but you can make do. Uh, well, here's the problem. I can compute every compu I, I can compute every combination here. So why would I lossily approximate a problem that in three hours I can systematically solve? <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> that makes no sense. There, there's no reason to approximate something that you don't have to approximate. Anyways, um, so I make these little meta items. Uh, this is the stat extractor. So I make like pseudo stats as well, where I factor in the stats and bonus mana and stuff. Um, how do you know that this is an asymptotic set of disparate gear pieces that work very well together? Um... Because they are human-selected items that were not designed together, right? When humans are deciding the stat values of items, and they're pulling random numbers out of their ass that feel right in 2006 when they're developing a game before anyone has min-maxed it and they know how people are going to play the game, they're just going to kind of randomly assign stats to things based on how things feel, uh, and they're not really going to pay attention to if that synergizes with weird items that are different levels and stuff. DeepMind is doing things internally that you couldn't even imagine. That's why AI is useful. Yeah, and that's also a, a really simple problem. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, it's, uh, yeah. It's also a really simple problem. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I am blown away by DeepMind. I watched all of the Go tournaments live when they happened at four in the morning in, in the fucking U.S., <laughs> but yeah um I love the condescending messages you uh, find in these chats uh, with the little winky faces <laughs> yeah yeah um that's probably why level 44 mil gloves are bis throughout classic I guess yep it's shit like that yep AlphaGo is, is easy compared to what they're investigating at the moment. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> most messages are con uh the most condescending messages are the ones that only contain a smiley face. Yeah. Ah. Uh, is reverse engineering the WoW server useful for this project or already something you need to simulate stuff? Um, I I did a lot of reverse engineering of formulas, but that's kind of different than reversing the server, right? But I, I did a lot of like A B testing of things to determine if if um if certain things actually were like the real formulas. Because unfortunately a lot of the formulas online are inaccurate. Especially when it comes to like crit. Um crit doesn't matter too much. I, I normally don't even factor it in. Um but like yeah. Yeah, to get the formulas. Yep. Yep, I did I did a lot of stuff to like figure out make sure the coefficients matched up and um luckily like I mean I have I have like shit. I wonder if I where I have it. Um I did like I did like multi hour studies where I would just sit there and cast heals uh with like combat logging on and I would go through and like do the statistical analysis and make sure that all the formulas lined up. Um I, I spent probably 50 to 100 hours just validating and correcting formulas. All the correct formulas are out there on the internet, but there are a lot of formulas that are incorrect, and it's sometimes hard to know the differences between them. Um, especially when there's like Burning Crusade and Classic, which actually have slightly different formulas. Um, and a lot of people don't know that they have different formulas, and thus you get a lot of cross-pollination from those two formulas where people are convinced of one or the other. Um, anyways, I, I did this for, like, a couple different uh, classes. I would go through... I think this is where I'm, like, reducing the sets, computing DPS, stuff like that. I got the Mandy's, the mandatory groups. Uh, I print, like, the number of combinations that I have, which are usually ridiculous... Sizes, I'm reducing the sets, reducing the sets, and then internally 
I have 16 spells, which happens to correlate perfectly uh, with the number of lanes that I have in a vector. And that means I was able to compute. I vectorized across the spells. So basically, I computed the... Um, I computed the healing per second for each of the different spells in parallel, right? So I used AVX 512 to do all uh, 16 32-bit float operations where I compute the results for each of the 16 spells that I have in one go, such that I don't have to iterate 16 times. I get a 16x speed up there. So, um, there are leaked WoW server sources. I don't think there are, are there? I've never heard of leaked WoW server sources. Never. Um, but yeah, this is basically the internal guts of the entire program. It's this in a very tight loop. Literally just hammering this in a loop. Um, and it turns out this can execute relatively fast. This is like, each of these is basically like one, a half a cycle or one cycle. Um, so like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cycles. So this operation is about ten cycles. Um, summing up the items, I don't think I vectorized that. And applying buffs and stuff, I, I didn't vectorize that either. Yeah, this is summing up the items. So this is probably like a, a hundred to 150 cycles per uh, loop iteration. And we definitely can improve on that. Uh, th this is like, uh, this is running on like a 2.3 gigahertz processor. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if you think about that, I can basically do, uh, this many million per second. Uh, and then factor in that I'm doing 16 in parallel and then factor in that I have 96 cores on two different machines. And I'm able to do, uh, approximately 47 billion operations per second. So I can kind of evaluate 47 billion sets of gear per second, which means in the like, let's say, I think it was like one and a half hours to run this out. Um, I was probably computing roughly this number of, of item sets, this number of combos. This is like 1E9, e uh, actually 1E12, e like 254 trillion sets, right? Um, okay. Let's see. Um, I'd like to see a, an outcome of an AI, and AI just wouldn't do anything here. Um, you won't be hitting L1 cache all the time, so you're wasting cycles fetching the data. Absolutely. This is not efficient. This is seriously not efficient. Th this, even though I have, like, some handwritten AVX 512 assembly, this is garbage. I should be doing 32 at a time, because 32 at a time would mean that I could use the reciprocal throughput of these instructions and pair them. So I should be doing 32-bit lanes of 32. Um, stuff like that. So. Um, yeah. Anyways. Um, that is, is what, I, what I did. <laughs> so... Now, since we have Season of Mastery coming up, this is what I would like to have be my Friday optimization education stream uh, things. So we're basically going to go through and we're going to, uh, I mean, we're going to rewrite all of these things because uh, we don't reuse code here. Um, what are the calculation results? It really depends, right? It really depends. Like, seriously... This depends so much on what on what you tell it, right? It depends if you are um, whether or not you have buffs, right? If you have uh, whether you have buffs, whether you're factoring in world buffs, whether you factor in um, uh, your mana consumes, whether you quantize them. So, are we going to use portable SIMD? Exactly. We're definitely going to use portable SIMD because it, it is now mature enough. Um, it's a hundred percent mature enough. Um, shouldn't you use different items on different length fights? Yeah, exactly. Uh, wow, theory. Uh, all right, so like, here's some random shit that I had. It looks like, uh, early Nax, right? 30 second fight. Wear this set. Why? Because of these. Uh, you should use this spell, spam this spell, 
you'll achieve this healing per second with no overhealing. Use this set. Uh, and then 31 second, 32, 33, 37, all of these different sets. Um, so we can go, Russ Core will now get SimD integrated. Fuck yeah, thank God. Working Jubilee. God, she's so fucking amazing. Um, okay. Anyways, uh, let's take, let's take a look. Let's see if these sets are, are different. Because that would be, that would be the dream. Um, depending on how much I filter these things. So, uh, 30 second fight. Don Riggs hat. Amulet of the Fallen God. Ternary Mantle. Those are the same so far. Shroud of Pure Thought. Yep. True Faith Vestments. Well, True Faith Vestments is actually a really interesting item. This is a tailoring item. And this is what people would tailor very early on. Uh, vest. Uh, this is what people would tailor and make early on because you can wear it at level 57. But it has a fuck ton of uh, healing and a fuck ton of MP5, but it has no int, so it doesn't give you any mana. But for a short enough fight, you don't need the mana. Thus, this level 57 piece of gear is bis in the latest game content <laughs> for a 30 second fight. Bindings of Faith. Um, keep in mind at this point, this simulation factored in the gear that I had. Um, rather than the gear that I theoretically could obtain. So I have multiple tools, ones that tell me what gear I should be focused on getting and what I should prioritize, and other ones that are focused on telling me what the best sets I can use that I own are. So I ran this probably 10 minutes before a raid with all of the data from all of the items I had in my bank and my inventory, and this would tell me exactly what to bring to raid. Right? Um... But yeah, there's um this was before I really had most of my gear. So honestly, there's not a huge uh huge difference here uh between these sets because I didn't have much variation. Forgering Seal is another interesting one that no healer in Nax is really going to be wearing this because this is one that you get from a fucking level 52 quest. It's literally a level 52 quest. This is like the first thing you get. But once again, really low stats, but really high healing. And when the fight is short enough, you don't need the MP5. You don't need the mana. You're casting your highest potency heal, and you're not going oom anyways. So you might as well stack as much plus healing. So this was probably the ring I had at the time with the most healing, right? And it's just kind of things along these lines. Um... But then I wrote other sims. I wrote sims for uh, Saffron. And I wrote, wrote sims. This one was a little bit later. This one actually simulated the real Saff fight. So this was a true simulation of fights. Trying to decide what sets I want to use um, for Saffron. And I actually found that the best set was actually a DPS set. And the reason the best set was a DPS set is the tier 2.5, which is... Um, Let's see, uh, God, what is that? Of the Oracle? Yeah. So, this is a DPS set. This is the tier 2.5 set that you get from, uh, AQ40. And you'll see that this is damage and healing, and it gives you plus hit. And you have damage and healing, damage and healing, damage and healing, damage and healing, damage and healing. This is for Shadow Priests, not for Healing Priests. Well, it turns out... If you're doing Renew Spam, which is the, the standard Horde strategy, on Alliance you actually use your spells because Alliance is actually a, a, good, a good fucking uh, faction in Classic where it isn't awful. So on Horde, you basically have like a lot of your priests doing Renew Spam. Um, so, this is crazy. I lost like 300 healing due to having this set on. Or maybe even like 400 or 500 healing. But this 5 set bonus increases the duration of your Renew spell by 3 seconds. Which is 1 tick. Renew typically lasts for 15 seconds. It ticks every 3 seconds, so it ticks 5 ticks. This makes it ticks for 6 ticks. So this increases your healing efficiency by 1 fifth, 1 sixth, whatever that is. Which is a fuck ton. It also increases your mana efficiency by that. In reality, 
This set is interesting in that it also is kind of good for PvP and that a lot of these pieces of gear are pretty high stamina. And Saffron does damage to the entire raid every couple seconds. So you need a lot of health or you need resistance to frost damage. So... As a priest, I don't want to wear any frost resistance, because if I wear frost resistance, then I'm sacrificing- Frost resist gear basically is like, it makes you take less damage, but you basically lose a fuck ton of stats that would other be, otherwise be on that piece of gear. Um, so, the three set is good? Yeah, unfortunately it doesn't work on, on, uh, on HOTS. And the only fight I wore this on is for Saf. And, uh, thus I don't really get anything out of that. But anyways, this, um, this ended up being like 1 or 2% more healing per second. Honestly, doesn't really matter. Like, 1 or 2% is kind of below the noise floor of the variance of these fights. However, it was like 1,500 more health. Which then meant... That I could then wear less frost resistance, aka no frost resistance, and absolutely pump the shit out of my healing. And sure enough, that's what I did. So I ran simulations for these, and these are real simulations. These are not, um, <coughs> these are not approximations of fights. When you see that these are like zigzag lines, the reason there are zigzags here is that is when I'm casting heals. Right? You'll find that these are spaced, uh, or more specifically, this is when my heal over times are ticking. So you'll see that at the start of the fight, my healing starts off pretty pretty low. Actually, let me go, um, hopefully this stuff still works. Uh, I should be able to, and these stats are literally, I would plug these in. I would plug these stats in and I would run this sim when I literally got into the into the room of Saffron. I would run this simulation right before. Okay. So, somewhere I have a one minute minimum duration and I want to change that. Um, the reason I don't show it is because it's, it's really noisy. Uh, Saffron is typically like a three to an eight minute long fight. So, uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, pop in a dark room. So I'm simulating, like, different things. Simulating popping a room, popping a mana potion. Um, where the fuck is the... If time is greater than that, break. Uh, oh! Uh, it's, I think the data is in there. I literally, uh, yeah, I cap it myself. Okay, so here's what's interesting. You'll see that I start off doing almost no healing, and that makes sense because I am currently throwing out heal over, over times. So the fight starts, I start casting heal over times, and they don't start ticking and ramping up until later. Now you can see this Renew Rank 10 obviously achieves the most healing because it's the strongest heal. But... Is Renewed Rank 10 the best heal for a four minute long fight, which is the length of the fights that I typically had for Saf? No, it's actually one of the worst ones almost. And the reason it's so bad is because you go out of mana. You run out of mana. <laughs> That's it. You just go oom. But this is this is uh literally simulating the fight. So each one of these times you see this like zigzag, these spikes, that's literally a new renew tick going on. And every time that you see a dip or like a new spike, like this spike here, is when I pop the mana potion. Like you can really see this on this blue line here where I go down and then I climb again. This is because at two minutes, my mana potions and dark runes came off cooldown. So I got like 4,000 mana and I was able to start spamming again. And then I went oom um again. And once again at four minutes, two minutes in the future, and again, four minutes in the future. So, Basically, what I can do is I can look and I can say, like, oh, well, turns out uh, for a four-minute fight, I want to use either rank four, rank four, which is, like, cutting it really close, or rank four is really safe, or rank six, which is cutting it close, in that I am probably oom um slightly before the fight ends and it feels really bad, 
in reality, there's a little bit of movement that happens during the fight that will cause me to maybe miss a couple seconds of casting, which means that I gain a couple seconds of mana um, and extra MP5, so there's stuff there as well. But yeah. Would be interesting to simulate spell level progression. Start level one and, and, and max level at eight minutes. I've tried those. They're never correct. It is always better to be consistent. Um, whenever you ramp things up or down dynamically, it is always worse than playing consistently forever, right? It's, it's unfortunate, um, but the smoother, the better. Because things are, like, more... Basically, these, are, these spells are just ranked in order of efficiency, effectively. And you want to cast the most inefficient one forever that you can get away with, that's better than casting uh, an efficient one and then trying to ramp at the end because you have to make up for an average that happens before, right? Like, if I use this rank 5 one and I started casting heavier and heavier heals, I now have to fight against, like, three minutes of healing or two minutes of healing to make up for this initial, like, slow start, and it will just never, it will never get there. Like how you spelt theoretical, I like how you spelt Mr... Noob. <laughs> Got him. Um, yeah. So the tools that I ended up writing, I wrote this uh, Saffron simulator. I had a lot of things for market making and auction house uh, stuff. Um... Character items, that was one that I did. Uh, Miss a Trip VM, that was for my auction house scraping stuff. Um, scheduler. Uh, I don't know. Oh, scheduler. Scheduler was playing around with trying to find like really efficient ways of having uh, simulations. Okay. Can you plot the integral of this to know the total healing with each spell? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I can. I'm not going to because I'd have to write code to do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, to me, that's not like super relevant. But yeah, what did, what did I say for Saf? The other thing is I wasn't getting like innervates or other buffs, so I, I couldn't rely on those. But if I had innervates and buffs, that's a whole, whole new can of worms. So yeah, you'll probably find that in later Saf's, I was probably wearing my tier 2.5 set. Um, so let's go to Saffron. I was probably wearing, this is the last Saff I did. Uh, no, it was, this is the best Saff I did. Um, and let's see. I am casting Renew, rank six. Interesting. The fight time was three minutes and 58 seconds. So the fight time was three minutes and 58 seconds. So about here, which is approximately 1290 healing per second. And what did I get? I had 1250 healing per second. Of course, I'm wearing my tier 2.5 set. I'm wearing exactly whatever my simulator told me was the best set to do. And you'll see that I have 8% overhealing. So if we assume we didn't have overhealing here and we said 1251, 1251 times, uh, I guess, how do I want to do that? Divide it by point, uh, Oh, uh, 1 minus 0 0.08. Uh, 1359. And 1359 is, like, a little bit better than here, and that makes sense because I probably got an innervate. I probably literally got an innervate, and I dynamically played around my innervate. Um, casts, uh, casts, innervate. Innervate gives you a fuck ton of mana. Yep, I had one used on me, Right? And since I had an Innervate, that gave me, like, an additional 4,000 mana. So I had to adjust, and I probably weaved in. At that point, I probably dynamically weaved in some max rank heals to burn off some mana such that I got back to schedule. Um, and you'll probably see that around two minutes, my healing will probably, like, start climbing again. Um, you'll probably see... Yeah. Um, yeah. My max rank renew. This is max rank renew, I think. Um, what's going on here? Why is this? Uh, what's going on? This is. 
Oh, oh, wait, what's going on? I'm very confused. Oh, that was cast on myself. Okay. Um, so if we look at rank 10 renew, we'll see that at 215 is where that starts to spike. And this is where I start to realize that I have a mana surplus and I need to get myself back onto the correct schedule. And you can see that I really start putting out some more of those heavy heals. Um, early on, you'll see that I'm using the max rank renew mainly on myself to keep myself alive because I'm not wearing any frost resistance. And that means that I'm taking a lot of damage. If we look at damage taken, I'm probably up there. Yeah. Uh, most of the healers were also wearing no, uh, frost resist, but basically this frost resist meant that I was taking a fuck ton more damage than, like, DPSers who often had some frost resist, so I had to keep kind of heavier heals on myself to keep myself sustained. But yeah. Yeah. Um, is it a bot playing the num number one priest, or is it me? It's just me playing it. There's, there's... I, I couldn't write a bot that would play this this well. Like, there's just no way. There's too many variables. There's too much movement. There's too much uh, lack of information. There's too much feeling. There's too much, like, I could probably in six months write a bot that plays better than I do, but that's like a fuck ton, a fuck ton of investment. Um, like, it's, it's a really, really hard dynamic problem because you can't heal, you can't heal health that isn't missing. So... But yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's how I basically got like some really good parses on some of the ball. Basically, Saf will probably find that I probably healed like shit on Saf, right? Um, let's go back to here. Um, yeah, this is exactly what it is. Um, my my parses on Saf. Sucked ass. They were really bad. Right? They were just they're just not very good parses. So what I probably did is I'm like, why am I so fucking dumb? And I probably went into here and the timestamp on this like saf.py, which is my, probably my first try, is January 22nd. Let's see. That's after this. Oh, uh, actually that's one day before uh I think these dates might be off. This is probably after this day. I did like 643 healing a second, and I probably was like, what the fuck did I do wrong? So I wrote this simulator uh, for the Saffron stuff. Uh, yeah, and then after January 23rd, here's a February 25th, where I probably switched strategies on February 19th. Um, a February 12th, so I just started to get better, and then I, I was probably dying in these two because I didn't know the fight mechanics. Um, and then I started to get slowly better as I slowly started to learn the fight. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's, uh, that's, that's how I got number one world for sustained healing. And, yeah, you'll see that, like, in these raids, maybe not towards the end. Because I think I started to get a little lazy. And I stopped bringing so much gear. Or my gear started to be so good that I only had one, one set. So this was the last raid that we did. Um, this is the best, yeah, the, the best healing that I did. This is the one that put me number one in the world. Um, and what is, let's see. Um, what did I want to look at? There's something I wanted to look at. This is actually a relatively clean run for us. Um... I probably, like, didn't die. If I did die, it might have been intentional because I had a soul stone. Hard to say. I can't can't remember if I died or not. Um, Sometimes it's hard to see deaths on here. It can be, like, pretty... Yeah, it says I have no deaths, but I don't, I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, But, yeah, a lot of it's just playing playing a lot better, being really, uh, be, being really responsible. Not being an idiot like I was on Saf for uh, most of Classic, because I didn't understand how the fight worked. It's all fun in games until Gamos decides to be number one in the world <laughs> for the number of O-Days. Yikes, I would never find an O-Day. That's illegal. That's bad. Anyways. Um. So. 
the sap stuff was some of the latest uh, theory crafting that I did. And you'll see that the sap stuff is quantized. So the way that the other, uh, the like super fast brute force all the item sets worked is I would basically, since I computed my effective mana and um, let's say my, um, let's say I have a mana potion every two minutes, which is the cooldown of mana potions. Well, there is a different, unfortunately, in reality, those things are quantized events. So you can't necessarily, um, you, you can't, <sighs> it's a really tough, basically, I am uncomfortable with the fact that I said that I got EV 2k mana, every, or EV yeah, like 2k mana, which is the mana pot, average mana, every two minutes. Because you're not actually getting sustained MP5 from mana potions. You're getting bursts. So if you have a one minute, 59 second fight, you don't get any extra mana during that duration. Um, Most fights are one spell spam. Yeah, I mean, most... Most fights, you want to spam your least efficient heal that you possibly can spam and overheal the shit out of people. Like, on t unless you have mana pressures, and then if you have mana pressures, you have to dynamically adjust all those things, and if you're speedrunning, you want to end fights with mana so you can go into trash. Um, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. A lot of it is, like, consuming uh, drinking water. Let's see if I have... I had that pulled up on GIS, didn't I? Uh, let me go find that. Um, let's see. So, I think this will show me how many times I consumed water. Um, maybe not. Nope, it doesn't. Basically, I probably used 200 more waters than most people do. I would bring, like, 300 waters to raid, and I would run out of all of them. And I would bring mana biscuits because they're an extra, like, 200 mana. And if I could sit down and drink for two seconds, I would do it. Where a lot of people won't do that because they feel bad throwing their money away or the couple silver or their, their last couple water. Like, do you drink walk? Typically, no. Drink walking is typically not very good. Um, it... Drink walking is, is is typically worse than literally just getting to a better spot and just getting a, a better drink off. Um, the problem with drink walking is you often will end up delaying yourself getting into position sooner. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a full duration water starting immediately when combat starts, right? And ultimately, it's pretty fucking hard to do that if you're trying to tick drink because you're probably falling slightly behind. Like, yes, if you're playing really well, you should be able to not stop moving. Um, But you also start to run out of inventory space. Like, I literally don't have enough inventory space to tick drink, right? Now, if I had mages who didn't fight over making water... Like, yeah, maybe I would tick drink, but then they would have to make water, which then slows down the raid even more. So, like, ultimately, tick drinking kind of doesn't work in raid. It works in battlegrounds where you're wearing one set of gear and you have all your backpack full or free. But when you only have, like, three or five inventory slots after you factor in the waters that you would normally bring, you just, you can't really tick drink. How did you keep up with farming? In the end, that was uh, what had me quit Classic. I just had all my mats from way earlier. Like, I, I bought a bunch of shit when it was cheap. I bought a bunch of fish. I hoarded a bunch of shit from early on that I knew. Like, stone scale eels I bought when they were, like, one or two silver. And because they're always one gold on every private server I've ever played on. Um, honestly, a lot of things from the original days. Um, I moved my character from... I had uh, my first character I did fishing on, and I got her to, like, level 46, and then I made Honorine, 
and then I eventually transferred the other character who had like a fuck ton of week one and two priced items in my bank. And I was able to just like sell all that shit for 10, 20 X what I had. Um, it's just how it goes. So I, I do fishing for my like initial seed gold. Um, and I fish basically for crates and then I vendor the greens. So like I'll normally fish in Tanneris at level 20 for the first like two weeks of servers before anyone has gotten level 40 and is even in those zones. And you're just sitting there level 20. No one's there. No one's going to gank you. No one's going to kill you. And you're fishing up like plate level 45 greens and you're vendoring them for two gold a piece. And you're making like 20 gold per hour of raw gold, which is not a lot of gold, but it is when the richest person on the server has 10 gold. And you end up in this situation where in your first like week of playing WoW, you have 300 to 500 gold and you buy everything on the auction house when people are literally trying to get pennies for anything. Like people are desperate to get one gold for their skill ups. Um, and you can just buy, I mean, there were just so many meme things. Like, you could buy, um, uh, the fucking gloves, the, the plus skill gloves, um, edge masters. You could buy edge masters for, like, five, ten gold. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen in this classic, because I think the last cl classic happened recent enough that people remember the values of some of these items so people just won't bother selling them they're just going to store them in their bank but who knows you might find the right the right deal the right price um but yeah <laughs> yeah i usually just micro a, a fishing character while while playing my main it's like you you click every 20 seconds um does classic like refresh and everything wipes so they're going to have the Season of Mastery that I think wipes every year. So it's a one-year kind of race. So one-year staged content, but basically instead of original classic that was like two and a half years, it's like a, a one-year thing. So the pacing, uh, the difficulty has increased. They gave more health to bosses. They made bosses have more mechanics. Um, they, uh, by nature... You're going to have less gear because it's 2.5x the pacing of original classic. So you'll be progressing into next content before you have full bis from the previous content. Um, I think it will be significantly more difficult, mainly for that gearing reason alone. Oh, also there's no world buffs. So it's probably like a 50% nerf. Like everything's probably like 50% harder and slower. Copied seasonal private servers? I mean... I wouldn't necessarily say it's like that bombshell of a fucking um wouldn't wouldn't say it's really a bombshell of a of a fucking uh idea. It's it's just it's just what people like. <laughs> people have always liked that. I mean, you, you could argue that WoW had arena seasons in 2007. <laughs> like like uh I don't know. I don't think seasons are a new concept in gaming. All right. Anyways, what I would really like to do um, is I would like for this next gen of theory crafting to be... Um, I really would like for it to be uh, quantized. And when I say quantized, I mean that it factors in each individual tick of mana regen and each individual cast and each individual, um, everything, like every tiny little thing. Um, they changed gear progression as well, right? Uh, they made some slight changes to gear availability, but it's not major. Um, I think for someone like me, it will affect me quite a bit because I will make do with whatever is available and accessible. Um, I do really well in Prebus, or like... Before, like, once you get to Nax gear, the gear starts to become so fucking good that there's just no alternative. But when you're in Prebus and you're scrapping together, like, random greens and blues to go into Molten Core, my advantage is significantly higher. Because at that point, it's more about how much time you can put into the game to get the gear. And second of all, the, like, 
you can do crazy shit with um with greens. Greens are really good. Like especially when everyone is leveling and there's a a surplus of like random enchanted greens that are like plus healing greens. You can make some really exotic sets that you can't make later and these sorts of tools really 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 are better. Um so if I go into wow theory, I probably have um Backup, pleb, wow, theory, wow, AVX512. There's a chance that I have, uh, that's the raw data. I also ran these simulations for like twinks and stuff, uh, but I don't seem to have any of that data sitting around. But I would like run this to basically figure out the best gear at level th 37, right? And that's something you're not really going to be able to find info on. Um... So, I really want to have, like, I, I really want to be blasting some really good tooling. Unfortunately, I don't really have enough time to develop all of this before uh, before Classic launches, but it's going to take probably a couple weeks to get 60 anyways, and thus I've got a little bit of time to, to figure that out. Um, but yeah, basically the next generation, I want to, like, kind of improve some of the optimizations that I did. Um, because I'm pretty sure I can make this probably 10x faster programmatically by keeping things in cache and reusing things and, uh, using standard SIMD and there's vectorizing different parts of the code instead of just one part. Um, that's my plan. I would love to be able to simulate fights for all sets of gear. I don't think that's going to be feasible. Because I think that's going to be like a thousand X slower than it will take to uh, approximate a fight. Which would, assuming I can find like 10X perf gains, is maybe a hundred X slower. And I, I can't do that because that's going to take like months to run the computation. So... I need some really creative ways to reduce this problem set uh, significantly such that I can find like a factor of 100 speed up. That's that's literally the goal. I want to find like a factor of 100 speed up such that I can um, such that I can like just simulate the fights. So We'll kind of see. We'll kind of see. How, how does that sound, chat? That's going to be our optimization project, and it's going to involve uh, a lot of optimization development from threading, scaling multiprocessor things. Um, it'll include s somewhat strange things like uh, uh, vectorizing, maybe some inline assembly. Probably not because we'll use standard SIMD. Uh, getting things local into L1 cache. There's a bunch of different, like, Pretty fundamental optimization concepts that I think we'll cover along the way um, that I think will be really fun for people to kind of learn how fast computers actually are because uh, computers are really fast. Did your code directly interact with the game or make suggestions about character? It makes suggestions. It runs simulations so I play better. So I like look at different strategies and different ways to play. Okay. So. That is the goal. How does that sound? I'm gonna get uh, I'm gonna do a quick bio break and then uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be back in a minute.
Okay, so now we can get to the educational optimization part, and I'm gonna change the stream title to educational optimization uh, to stop scaring away the people who don't care about games. Okay, uh, we're gonna call this educational optimization. Um... Done. All right. Hello. Welcome to Educational Optimization Day. Thank you for listening to my three-hour intro. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's why we're doing this. Uh, okay. Um, cool. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? <laughs> Is everyone behaving? Is everyone being good? Is everyone being nice and friendly and cool? Let me see what kind of things I've been ignoring on my phone. Um... Hmm... Oh my god, you edit stream title on your computer and it changed on my computer? <laughs> Hell yeah. Not the longest intro we've had, to be fair. We've definitely had intros that just don't lead to any content. We've definitely done that, haven't we? Um, I'll go to sleep in a few minutes, but I'll watch the VOD tomorrow. Rip. Big perf manifesto. Perf is just the way to go. Perf is just correct. Like, it's just, I don't know why programmers hate perf so much. It's just like, everything's written in fucking Electron. <sighs> it's, it's sad. Project idea, how to min-max season of mastery when you only have two hours a day to spare? <coughs> I can find more time than that. Um, fuck Electron. Perf is just the best. I love me some perf. <laughs> Fuck Electron. Who here writes Electron apps? How many how many people here are Electron app devs? Yeah, yeah, yikes. Yikes, yikes. All of these people are literally the problem. <sighs> All the problem. Okay, so, um, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna write something that can optimize... <laughs> hmm, trying to think of a fun, a project, a fun educational project that demonstrates a couple important concepts of optimization. Hmm. 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 I think... Um, mature, oh, mature audience, yeah, 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 it's a mature audience. I mean, let's be, let's, let's, let's be honest. Is any of Twitch chat mature enough to handle a mature stream? Um, are you planning an introductory stream? Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do now. Uh, poo poo pee pee. Wilbo 007. Uh. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so here's what I'm thinking. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking that we write something that allows us to experiment with. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, we got some. All right. What do people want? Do people want us to write a. I don't know, a fake trading simulation platform that simulates trades to figure out the best trading algorithm. Some bullshit. Or, which is like applied with a little bit of dev that's kind of unrelated, or a direct, um, a direct, uh, and like low level analysis and benchmark of like, L1 cash versus L2 cash versus L3 cash versus latency versus bandwidth versus all those things. Um, so we can either write something that literally is more of like a measurement of processors to show you how processors work, or we can do like a project and show that at a higher level, the implications of it. Number two, what's up, Barber Shopper? How you doing today? Low level bench sounds like more. F oh my god, you fucking nerds! Ah, oh, I want to do the nerdy low level thing. Number one, probably more engaging. Yeah, uh, yep. Um, no, nope, they're up. Oh. <sighs> ah. <sighs> Number two, number one. Good for sure, new house coming down the pipe. When, when's your moving date? Number one, although I will pass that after five minutes. Both at the same, we're gonna do number two. It's what chat wants. We're gonna, we're gonna learn how CPUs work. We're gonna learn how CPUs work. Um. Uh, can't be asked to get to the PC to make a cult pull. Yeah, the, the PC's like two feet away. Number three, did I break it? <laughs> Fucking hacker. You can't do that. You're going to overflow my integers. XGM dude, thank you so much for the eight months. Hell yeah. Negative one. Oh no. Whenever it's done is all I know. Shit's all kind of backs up with shipping. Oh, no. Are you building a house or remodeling? Oh, one, two. Right now we're doing a little bit of workout. Uh, Gamosa will make us about 100 y years of CPU's R&D into a couple of hours. Yeah, uh, CPU go brr, uh, cash good. Um... JavaScript interpreted language bad. Uh, Electron really bad. Python bad. Uh, Rust good. Every other language unsafe bad. Um, fresh build for sure. Might have to revisit your 100 gigs of James on ends a ton. Jesus. Hell yeah. I'm all for that. Swift bad. Swift bad. Um, all right, getting a good stretch in right now, zig bad, it's not rust, so it's bad, um, all right, train lift, Kotlin garbage. Crayon lift. Hmm. (sighs) 
We don't know yet on the crane lift. We we can't say yet. You like the fiber cassette? Isn't it wonderful? All the all the fiber. I only have six of them hooked up right now. Uh, I've been too lazy to run the four extra lines that I need to run. Um, but I got my hundred gig. That's all that matters. Hundred gigabito. Uh, VB six. That's okay. 100 gig is perfect. It's honestly, it's pretty good, chat. Pretty good. I I will say that 100 gigabit has been an upgrade for sure. Definitely pretty fucking noticeable on the LAN. Tryzen 40 gig, yeah, that's unusable. That's trash. Basically 20, 20 2005 tech. ASP. I mean. If you're gonna talk ASP, P, might as well just talk like CGI bin with C. <laughs> Who's written some CGI where you take arbitrary arbitrary stuff from a from a user in the form of strings and then you pass them into a uh, system libc system <laughs> uh those things are bad i don't think i've ever seen a cgi application that isn't riddled with some of the most trivial 1995 perf or per perf bugs um nothing uh Nothing world with CGI bin and pearl new earbuds. They're not here yet. Um All right chat did you get customs I did I did Yeah, I ordered them like a month and a half ago and I still haven't done ear impressions yet so that's uh that's the bottleneck right now. That's a little bit of the bottleneck. Uh I got ultimate ears lives. UE lives. I just I just wanna see what 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 the hype is about. Um Okay. Alright, chat, you ready? Uh, you ready to do some counting? Shit, I didn't sleep enough last night. <laughs> oh, it's gonna feel good to sit on the couch and uh, uh, do nothing today. <laughs> uh, got any Ganazo wisdom to share? Uh, you mean Ganuzo? Um. Uh. Let's talk about Rust's lifetimes annotations and how they're fantastic. How they how they solve all of the problems that we have. Oh, I've got I've got a piece of uh, tube here that I that I uh, face milled. That was that was kind of fun. I've I've been I've been practicing with things. Oh, I also my my favorite toy right now is uh. Are these two things? I have a I have a, a washer. I have a washer and a piece of flat bar uh steel. Um and they're both they're both very flat. Uh and you're not gonna be able to see how flat they are, but I can I can, you know. Well now it's not gonna work, is it? Come on. I can stick them together. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it won't it, it won't it won't see? See? Okay. Then it then it fell cuz I bumped it. Let's see if I can get it in there a little bit better. There there we go. There there we go. No strings. Hashtag no strings. God, focus, you fuck. Anyways, this is uh this is pretty cool. 
Um, I'm I'm proud of this. That I I I'm gonna just start making things flat a lot. But yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. I don't know how many people have like felt that. Focus, you fuck. But yeah, some sometimes it's hard to get them to stick. How can this happen? We don't we don't understand how this happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not magnets cuz if I if I put it upside down, it'll never it'll never stick. It'll never do anything. It's uh it's not it's not magnetic. It's it's called ringing. Um gauge blocks, and this and, and this and uh uh ringing and and this. Here you go. There you go. Sliding the two uh, blocks together so that their faces uh, bond because they're ultra flat surfaces. When wrong, gauge blocks adhere uh, to each other tightly. Uh, they may withstand a, a strong force. Um, while the exact mechanism that causes ringing is unknown, magic, uh, it is believed to be a combination of air pressure between the blocks because the air is squeezed out of the joint, so a vacuum. Uh, surface tension from oil and water vapor that is present between the blocks and molecular attraction. Uh, it is believed that the last two sources are the most significant. So, like, surface tension and molecular attraction. Basically, getting things so fucking close together that they start not knowing that they're different objects. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's kind of the mechanic here. Because, like, in theory... I mean, how does metal know that it's, that it's different? It, like, an oxide layer, obviously... But like, if you get two things close enough together, you theoretically could uh, could cold weld them. So yeah, so that's that with a uh, literally a random piece of fucking flat bar steel and a random washer that I lapped uh, flat enough to do that. Um, and according to Wikipedia, that says these are probably flat. Uh, within these are. Um, let's see. Minimum conditions for ringing are surface finish of, uh, 0.025 micrometers and a flatness of about, uh, 0.13 micrometers. So these basically are flat, um, probably within about 100 nanometers. So, like, across the entire surface, um, there's no deviation. There's no, like, mountain that's larger than 100 nanometers. <laughs> So yeah, is that is that not fucking cool? Cuz I think that's pretty fucking cool. Brazzers, thank you so much for the tier 1 sub. Hell yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh that's things I've been practicing with. Um just kind of getting into like uh precision machining and stuff. Uh because the goal is to use precision machining to do physics experiments. Um, yeah. So right now we're just practicing and learning. Um, how much scrubbing will, will the world need to be flat? Oh, it's already flat. Yeah, just already is flat. Brother man. Brother man. Okay, so we're going to do a cargo new bin, and we're going to do cash perf. Okay, and I'm going to show you a lot of things. I'm gonna show you a lot of things, chat. You're gonna learn so much today that you're gonna be like, damn, I learned so much today. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, sweet, so we wrote Hello World. Uh, so this is Hello World. This is basically uh, where all developers start off. Now, where this Hello World is different from most Hello Worlds, this Hello World is performant because it's written in a language called Rust. And Rust is a language that is worth writing code in, because if this was Python, this would suck. Um, okay. So, basically, um, there's really no reason to care about performance, um, because if you write things in Rust, they're just fast. I learned that flat things don't know that they're not the same object. Whew! That's that's what uh, that's what I heard about 
Fednodinal's booty. Ha! Ha! Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, won't Rust sometimes be slow because you have to copy data because of safety? It kind of depends how you have to copy data. Like, not really. Like, you. Like, it depends on your level of abstractions. But at the end of the day, you always have to copy data, right? Right, like... Like, you, you always have to read memory into a register. So ultimately, you, you still gotta, like, do that. So when you, when you read memory, it, it's, it's, just, it's just copying it. LVM optimizes all that, I think. Mm. Yeah, LVM uh, often emits pretty bad code, Jen. LVM doesn't do shit. Yeah, LVM's not great, to be honest. Um. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to... We're going to do a quiz. Okay? Okay, chat? We're going to do a quiz. Um, and the quiz is going to be, uh, hmm. Mm hmm. 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 Okay. Um, buff is equal to vec OU 64. One twenty eight. Uh, uh it, we'll just make we'll just make a mm, uh, we need to make a bigger buffer than that. Let's just let's just make a gig times 16 a 16 gig buffer. So I'll allocate a 16 gig buffer. Honestly, that might take a Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, chat. Um IT is we're going to start a timer. Use standard time uh instant instant now for blah in zero uh for blah in buff the uh zero dot buff len uh we'll do we'll do bytes this will be uh we'll allocate four gigs four gigabytes and then we'll do um buff dot as pointer dot offsets off uh, core pointer read volatile. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to read that memory uh, in some unsafe code. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to read every byte in four gigs of memory. How long is this going to take? How long is this going to take, chat? Let it is, uh, let elapsed is it elapsed as seconds f64, uh, prints elapsed, uh, 10.6, uh, seconds. How long will this take? How long will this take? Reading four gigs of memory. 100 milliseconds, one second, an hour, 10 seconds, half a second. Yeah, this is this is pretty good. This is pretty good. Okay, um, what sort of information here would improve your ability to make this prediction? What sorts of things would you like to know to be able to better predict this? To better understand this? Um, where the buffer is in memory. Eh. That wouldn't matter first. RAM throughput, your gigahertz. Cache latency doesn't matter. RAM bandwidth. RAM memory bandwidth. Yes. What we're doing right now is we're benchmarking our bandwidth. We're basically benchmarking for a sequential read with no random jumps around what we get. 
So I, I can say that we have a, a processor that is uh, clocked at 2.10 gigahertz, and we can see what this uh, we can see what this is going to scale to. Um. So this is uh, it turbos to 3.3 gigahertz, and it runs DDR4 2667. All right. Runs DDR4 2667. Okay. Okay. So, how fast is this going to run then? Uh, do we do we have a better do we have a better idea here? Do we know what DDR4 2667 is for bandwidth? Do we want to look this up on uh, Wikipedia? DDR4 SD RAM? Uh, let's see. Let's see what we got here. Uh, clock speed, data rate, mega transfers per second, peak transfer rate. Here we go. We've got, what, 2667? Yeah, it's this. So, 21... 21,333 megabytes per second? So, is that what we expect? Do we expect to get that many megs a second? Uh, let's print this in megabytes per second then. This is gonna be megabytes, uh, nibby bytes per second. Um, uh, that yeah, that's megabytes per second. Um, okay, so we'll do buff dot len divided by ten twenty four divided by ten twenty four divided by seconds, right? Um, so now. It doesn't... Uh, now we're factoring in kind of like uh, the data that we're reading. Okay. All right. So now, what is what is the speed of this? DDR4 2666. These are, these are the specs. Probably something less than that. Doubt a single core can use all your memory bandwidth. Keep in mind, we're, what, what type of reads are we doing here? How are we reading this memory as well? Um, sequentially, okay, how many, how many different reads do we have to issue in this program? Um, um, mm, byte by byte, yeah, exactly, right. Right, and byte by byte is slow. Let's go see where it is. It probably unrolled it a bit, maybe. Um, okay, well, we're gonna see. You ready, chat? You gonna see? Reads are 64 bytes wide uh, on the back end. Uh, seconds elapsed. X. Got fucked, uh, as I size. There we go. 2.1 gigs a second. 2100 gigs a second. And in terms of all clock time, that was pretty slow. Uh, two seconds. Okay. Alright, chat. So how fast would we do that if we skipped... Step by 4096. We're going to skip every 4096 bytes. So we're doing 4096 times less data, le less copy, or, or less operations. How fast is this going to read? Keep in mind, we're saying megabytes per second is still the total size of the buffer. This is the time to, like, touch one page. Same time. Same time. There we go. There we go. We got about a, a 2.5x. About a 2.5x. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. It was 1.44 seconds. Russ is initializing to zero first. That's probably fair. Yeah, that sounds about right. 
Um, technic. Uh, yeah. Rust isn't actually initializing that. That's the that's the thing. That's the Sperla, the Sperla trick. The Sperla trick, dude. Shh. Don't. That's that's part of the fucking trick. Okay. So. Um. All right. Yeah, and we can we can prove that by doing this, right? How long will this take? This will theoretically be slower. It's not. It's the same time. Because Rust actually isn't initializing that, that array. Okay. So. We're getting 5 gigabitos a second. Alright, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do it again. All we're going to do is we're just going to do it again. How fast will this be? How fast will the first one be? And how fast will the second one be? It's the exact same code. We're just going to run it twice. Thoughts? Will the second one be slower, faster, same, anything? Second way faster. Both exact the same. There we go. About, about the same. About the same. <laughs> okay. What if we changed it to a step by... Eight. Oh, redeclared. Oh my god. Shit. Okay, you're totally right. You're totally, you're totally right. You're right. It's kind of normal. Fuck. Okay. Shh. Okay. Okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. Whoa. Whoa. What happened there? Whoa. Whoa, that's really strange. That's a bigger number. Huh. That's really weird. Why is it? Why is it that we're able to read that almost... What is that? A hundred times faster? A hundred times faster. Hmm. What's causing that? It's not cash. It is not cash. <laughs> I can tell you that right now that this is literally not cash. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yep. Cash is not one gig. Yep. Four gigs, technically, here. Pages were loaded already? Arguably, that's a way to put it. So what we are seeing is we're seeing Linux being a slow poo-poo pants. Here's the thing. What's actually happening here is this memory doesn't exist when I go to read it. It just, it just doesn't exist. So here's what's happening. So Linux is being a, a poo-poo head. And the reason Linux is being a poo-poo head is because Linux sucks and it's slow. Put it on GIS, I want to see it on Windows. Oh, you do not want to see that one on Windows. It's page guard stuff? Nope, not page guard. Nope. Okay, so here's what we got. We got we got a boofer. Uh, we got a boofer which contains four gigabitos of data. Okay. Then this boofer, we allocate this and we say, Rust, we wanna get we wanna get a buffer of VEC uh, four gigs of zeros, right? And when we do this, Rust, Rust is very smart, and Rust knows that, that on Linux, when you mmap memory, which it's going to do. So uh, if we go down like a weird tangent here, um, you'll discover that uh, allocators like malloc, right? When you call malloc, and when you call calic and all, all these different friendly functions, right? Basically, uh, ugh, fuck. Okay, whatever. Um, basically, there are functions that exist, and and these will typically have different buckets for allocations. They'll usually have them as powers of two, where you'll have a like 16 byte bucket, a 32, a 64, so on and so forth, up to I don't know, like 32 kilobytes maybe. Um. You'll maybe have like a 32 kilobyte thing. 
So, basically, Malik is going to return allocations that were previously made out of these different chunks. But once you exceed a certain threshold, let's say 32 kilobytes, it varies by allocator. There's no, there's no rule here. Once you exceed this threshold, Malik is actually just going to call mmap directly. It's going to be like, yo, uh, exotic, right? Basically, the Malik implementation is going to be like, this is such a fucking big, weird sized allocation that we're not going to manage and track this. There's no reason for us to have a four gigabyte bin because it would just leave things being used in memory for a long time. So what what instead is when you do these alloc and freeze, they get reused, right? You alloc and free things and they get reused from their bucket size. So if you have a if you have a 33 byte allocation, it'll probably get allocated in the 64 byte bin and then you go to free that and then someone goes to do a 64-byte allocation, and it will get literally the memory that you just used, right? However, when you have these large allocations, you'll often go and call uh, mmap directly with the kernel. You'll basically directly ask the kernel for a virtual memory mapping. And when you do that, when you do that, um, that kernel is going to create new virtual uh, new virtual memory for you. And virtual memory is basically how things are actually lined up in, in memory. Uh, processors have this, this concept called a page table. Um, and a page table allows you to have your sticks of RAM. So you have like, your, literally you have your fucking sticks of RAM in your computer. Um, and these sticks of RAM, let's say this is like, you got, you got one meg here, you got one meg here, and you got one meg here. Now, in a system, the way this will typically work is you have all the physical memory, and on x86, they do a really bad physical memory model, and you'll typically have something like this. You'll have your first stick of RAM is up here, so this is the first one meg, and then the next meg, you have this stick of RAM in here, and here's another meg, and then you have device MMIO space shoved in here because this is your network card. Um, and this is where your, your hentai comes in. So your hentai comes into here, goes into the NIC, and then it goes into your MMAP, uh, this memory mapped uh, space. And then this third stick of RAM is allocated here at, at three meg. So you got your, your one meg stick, your two meg stick, and your three meg stick of RAM. Um, so, what's unfortunate about this is that you got you got this shit in the middle of fucking nowhere. Right? Right? And that, that's kind of annoying because what happens when someone wants to allocate, I want three megs of RAM. I bought a very expensive three megabyte of RAM machine. And I want to use all three megabytes of RAM for the hentai that I'm receiving. I, I want to, like, I'm going to have the face... I'm gonna have the body and I'm gonna have the legs. And I, I can't I can't fit my hentai when there's a gap in here. I need to have this be be linear memory. So you have this thing called a page table. And this page table basically is something that you tell the processor how to interpret virtual memory. So you have two different forms of memory. You have virtual memory and you have physical memory. So let's, once again, let's take a look at our, our hentai. So we have our, uh, this is our device space, like reserved, one, two, and three megs of RAM. Now in virtual memory, we don't want a gap. We want one, two, and three to be all next to each other. And the way that this works is you have on x86, you have, um, you have something called a CR3. And a CR3 is the page table pointer. And basically, the CR3 points to a page of memory, so 4,096 bytes of memory, that contains, on a 64-bit system, it contains 4,096 divided by 8, which is 64 bits. So divided by 8 is equal to 512. So this will have 512 entries in here. And the way this works is uh, 64 bits, um, or 512 entries, 512 requires nine bits to express, right? So what this does is you have your virtual address. 
And your virtual address is a 64-bit address because you have a 64-bit processor. But it's actually not a 64-bit address. It's actually a 12 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9 uh, plus 9-bit address. <laughs> uh, do the math. Do the math. Uh, 9 times 4 is uh, 36 plus 12 is 48. So you actually have a 48-bit address. And you might be wondering, well, that's a scam. I have 64 bits. I have Nintendo 64. I have Nips 64. This is unfair. R scam. Well, you would be right. You actually got scammed. Um, so the way this works, if you've ever worked with uh, systems where you've printed out addresses, you, you might notice that there's something really weird that happens when you have addresses. You'll notice that you'll see addresses that look like ZZZZ followed by shit and FFFF followed by shit. And that's that's really weird. Let's 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 try it. Let's try it. Let's let's print the address of Maine. Right? Let's just print the address of Maine. Okay? What's that going to be? Uh, okay, uh, don't be mean. Uh, let's see if I can ref it. That might be the address of the address of Maine, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, and then we'll do, uh, uh, 018, uh, X, right? So here's, a here's an, uh, pound, o pound 018 hex. Come on, dude, you're, you're punishing me. Uh, as cons blah, as you size. There we go. All right. So, there we have an address, and that's, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. Why are there four bytes at the top? Well, what is 64 minus the size of a nibble, which is 4, times 4, which is the number of nibbles that are 0? Well, what is that? Well, that's 16, and then if we take 64 and we subtract 16, we get... What is this? What? What is this? Wh what? Coincidence? What? No way! <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> Magic. Magic. So here's... How... Is all 48? I don't know. Maybe it's 52. I maybe did the math wrong. It is It is 52. I think I did the math wrong on the 40. Wh whatever. It's 52. It's 52. It's 52. It's wh whatever. 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 Uh, okay. So, let's take a look at it. Let's grab an address. Let's grab a big address. Um. Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, text entry, unfortunately, really sucks in, uh, in Krita, but, but that's okay. Well, uh, it, it's not great. Save. Mm, we can even do bigger. 169. Okay. All right, so we have an address here, and let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it. So we have 16 bits up here. Oh, you asshole. Um, we've got 16 bits up here. Right? Then we have uh, 12 bits down here. And 12 bits, interestingly, 2 to the power of 12 is equal to 4096. Coincidence? No. No, it's not. It's not, a, it's not a coincidence. Okay. So then if we look into here and we take everything else we have, we have 64, we subtract 12, that gets us, uh, uh, what's 64 minus 12? That's uh, 52. Then we're going to subtract an additional 16. And that gives us, uh, what's that? Uh, f a 30, uh, chat, tell me, please, please, 37. Okay, 37. Okay, and then what happens if we divide 37 by 9? What's 37 by 9? 36? 36. Yeah, fuck you, Nick Carrot. Fuck you. 
They're all even numbers! Oh my god, fuck you. You can get them. <sighs> um, okay. And, and what's 36 divided by 9? What? It's 4. How is it 4? That's crazy. All right. Well, let's let's figure out why that's 4. So this chunk of this part of the address is divided up into four equal parts, each with 9 bits. 9 9 9 and 9. Ah? Uh ah? -huh. Uh -huh. Thinking. Thinking, thinking. Okay. Okay, so we got we're thinking. Anyways, <laughs> your math exams might have been off. Fuck you. Okay, so here's the way that it works. Your processor has a page table. And you tell it about that page table by giving it a page, and you have CR3 pointing to a vector of U64s that are five, there's 512 of them. Do the math, that also happens to be 4,096. Really crazy bytes. Okay, so CR3 is the physical address, because you can't use a virtual address when you're trying to describe virtual addresses. So you have a, you have a physical address that then goes to this table. So then your processor is going to slice these off, I mean, these aren't 9-bit boundaries, but it's going to slice off these 9 bits, and let's say it is 55, and it's going to look that up in this table. It's going to deref this vector. So it's going to go to CR3, deref at 55. And then that's going to give it a U64. And that U64 contains the next level table. And that next level table, you'll take the next nine bits and you'll look those up. And the next, you'll take the next nine bits and you'll look those up. And the next, you'll take the next nine bits. Okay, four levels of page tables. You've consumed all of these parts of the address. And then at the very end, it has a pointer. Instead of to a page table, it has a physical address of the page. And that page is a 4,096 byte page. And then you take the bottom 12 bits and you add those to that page offset, and that is your physical address for the virtual address that you have. And that is how your processor converts virtual memory into physical memory. Now, what's interesting about that is that means that you can have your, uh, you can have your stuff here where you have your MMIO space and one, two, and three megs of RAM, and you can have your processor say, well, what I actually want is I want one to be here, I want two to be here, and then I want three to skip over that and be here. Is all virtual to uh, physical memory happen in hardware? Yes, yes. This is a, an MMU, a memory. Uh, I, I really want a color palette somewhere. Hmm. I want a color palette because I think that would be cool to change my colors a lot. Cause it, cause it'd be fun. Um. Uh. When. Mm, workspace. Uh. No. Mm, tool. Mm. 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 Okay, we're just not gonna do that. We've got a memory management. Oh, I think this right here. Yeah, there we go. Memory management unit. All right. It's a it's a memory management unit. Okay. And there we go. And we can put little hearts by it. Because we love the MMU. The MMU is what allows us to do all these mappings. And this MMU uh, sits inside of your processor. So you got your processor here and your memory management sitting here. And it's like it's got it's got all these lines to to your sticks of RAM. Uh, actually, technically, your, this is not your memory management unit. That is, this is your, um, this is gonna be your, uh, 
memory controller, your MC. And you're going to have multiple memory controllers. My processor has eight, and they're going to stick to different sticks of RAM. And then that's another thing that we're going to talk about as well. Um... <sighs> He's red and green exclusively. Okay. How does how does that sound, chat? How how does that sound? Do you feel smart now? Okay, so my processor is very interesting in that I have eight memory channels. And this gets into some other advanced shit that we probably shouldn't be going down right now, but we're gonna just introduce it. So there's also your processor. This is this is my processor. Obviously, if I were to draw Twitch Chat's processor, it's like this, right? So my processor has eight sticks of RAM. Now my processor also happens to have eight memory channels. So it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight memory channels, and these will go to actually each physical DIMM on my system. This is literally how my system is physically set up. I've got, a, I've got a dim going to every memory controller. That means that each memory controller here handles a DDR4 uh, at 2667. So I actually have eight of those. So I can actually handle eight times the bandwidth of DDR4. So you'll find that this is one of the reasons why I use server processors, because if we take this, my theoretical bandwidth on this processor is actually this number times 8, right? So if I take this number and I multiply it by 8, that's the, this is the theoretical bandwidth, about 170, uh, 100, 166 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. But if we go look at some, some of your, your gamer machines, let's look at like an i9 I don't know, some I some stupid fucking i9 processor. Here we go. It's exactly what we want. This has four memory channels of 2933. So that means we have 2933, which is this. And then we can multiply that by four, and we get we get that. We get uh we get 91 gigs a second. And you'll see that this this will agree with that. It'll well, they say 94 because they're doing it in bytes per second. Um, and then they round up. But yeah, basically. Your little Weenie Hut Jr. gaming desktop processor has probably fewer number of memory channels. Um, yeah. Now, you often will have eight DIMM slots on your on your motherboard. You won't have uh, you won't have four. I mean, or you might have two memory channels and you have four DIMM slots. Now that means that you don't have a controller dedicated to each DIMM. And that means that when you have multiple DIMMs per memory controller, your perf gets fucked. F-U-K-T, right? So this is why when you get RAM, you should get the number of sticks that correspond to your number of memory controllers. If you don't follow this, you're probably getting fucked. Uh, anyone who's ever gotten into making a gaming computer and you get your, like, your 3200 overclocked big RAM and you fill every fucking dim slot with it and you're like, wait a minute, why am I only getting 2666? I got, I got scammed. Well, you didn't actually get scammed. Uh, you're just dumb and you did it wrong. Um, so that was your fault for being a stupid doo-doo head. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but if if you got if you got the RAM that had the fancy RGB lights though, then then you didn't get scammed because you have plus one GP gamer point, and that is what matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, when I typically buy, uh, processors, and, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot more to goes into RAM than that, the, the way that you line up the chips and stuff matters as well, so I recently got a new computer, and the computer that I decided to get for my workstation, uh, um, uh, where the fuck did I put these? 
What the fuck did I buy? Uh, let me let me figure out what pro uh, what what motherboard I bought. Uh, that's what I got. Okay, okay, I got these. Okay, this is the motherboard that I got. Um, X12 DAI N6. It's a it's a dual socket uh, motherboard that that has uh it has uh five PCIe four times sixteen slots, uh, which was literally the entire goal. <laughs> I just I just wanted uh a lot of PCIe sixteen slots because uh. Um, that's another thing. Your 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 motherboard. Okay, okay, chat. You know how you you know how you spent like a lot of money on your graphics card and you got like a super super nice graphics card. Yeah, you probably you probably have that graphics card running in a times a times eight slot. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a tragedy, but uh, yeah, it turns out your times eight, your times sixteen slot is actually probably a times eight slot, and that's uh, yeah, you probably got scammed. Okay, um, so, anyways, what I do when I am getting a computer is I look at my manual, <laughs> and um, and when I go to this manual, I will get to look at basically uh, how the process, uh, how this uh, system is designed. So that's the motherboard. I don't really care about how it physically looks. Um, who puts the GPU in the bottom slot? <laughs> it doesn't matter, buddy. I'm sorry. Hate to break it to you. Uh, a lot of them are just going to be times eight slots. Ah. <laughs> uh... The classic 16 lane size slot, yeah, usually it goes into a mux. Um, got scammed again. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we can, uh, we can look at, uh, let's look at, let's look at, uh, um, let's just go to Newegg. Let me, let me, Newegg.com. Okay. Um, let me, uh, make sure I'm logged out here. Okay. Actually, we'll just do this here. All right, we'll go to Newegg. We're gonna go find. Uh, we're gonna go find. Uh, um, we're gonna go find a motherboard. Uh, let's go find a motherboard. Let's go find the most popular motherboard, and let's go whack it in here. And int. We got. We got an Intel motherboard, and we just want like, whatever's advertised to best selling. Um best selling and then let's pick one that's in like a reasonable budget range so that's probably not the best selling one i could see like this being a, a good selling one uh this one probably actually has a, a time 16 slot because as ever since pci4 they're a little bit better about it um let's take a look at this uh the fuck find me a mainstream mobo with max 8x uh it's a lot of them dude <laughs> it's a lot of them uh, let's see. These probably won't even have fucking specs. <laughs> let's see. Um. Okay, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Specification. Specification. Okay. Um. Expansion slots. One times 16. Running at 16. Okay. That's pretty good. Let's see. Um, what happens, though? This, the second slot, shares with the first slot. So if you put a times 8 card in the second times 8 PCIe slot, e.g. if you have a NIC or a sound card or a capture card or literally anything, congratulations, your times 16 slot in slot 1 is now an 8x. Huh. Interesting. So what if I have like a storage controller or a NIC or something that I want? Well, now my GPU and my storage controller are both running times eight. Well, I could run something in the times 16, but now I only have a times four left. Yep. 
Yep. Yep, so there you go. First one. First one already. Yes, it can be time 16 if you, uh, if you are not using these slots. Well, if you're not using the second slot. Well, that fucking sucks. Okay. Cool, let's go look at, like, a, a cheaper budget one. Let's look at, like, something that, uh... Let's look at this Aces Prime. Let's look at that. So, all, all, already, you're fucked. That's not what you said? Oh, just wait. Just wait. <laughs> just you wait. To be honest, the 4.0 gens are typically better. Um... Let's see. That's got a 3.0? That's kind of weird. Okay. This one... Oh, God. Dude, fuck this. Give me the specs. Uh, specs. There's a maximum number of lanes of the CPU that's well known. Yup, and it's really fucking low. Yup. Um... Oh, look at this. If you have an 11th gen processor, you have one 16 slot, or you have two 8 slots, or an 8 and a 4 and 4 slot. So literally, literally, if you have anything other than a GPU and a PCIe slot, you're on times 8 on this system. Anything. Anything other than that. Okay. Okay, what else? What about, what about older gen? Let's go one gen back, because this legitimately has gotten a little bit better with PCIe 4, mainly because there have been a couple more lanes added. Um, let's go look at one generation behind. Let's look at the, uh, I think, actually 400 series. If streamers use a capture card and use a single PC, are they fucked? They probably are. I mean, are you actually going to notice that, that bandwidth difference? Probably not. Um, okay, let's look at this one. Let's see if we can find specs on it. Specs. Um, okay. Uh, oh, one dedicated from the P CPU. Not bad. And then one from the PCH. Not bad. Okay. Um, I need two 16 lanes for GPU pass-through. It's very fucking hard to find a system with, with two, uh... Two sixteen lanes if you want to do pass through, and it's very hard to find any system that even allows you to have one sixteen lane if you have another card in there. What happens with SLI? You're on times eights. <laughs> you're definitely on times eights. Hundred percent, you're on times eights if you're doing SLI. You're just kind of getting fucked. So that is why this is what I run. Um, because most use cases don't care about full bandwidth. Yeah, absolutely. So, this, this is the motherboard that I have. I have a times 8, a times 16, 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 a times 4, a times 4. And that is how it should fucking be. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and if we look at the layout, these are truly dedicated lines. These are not going to the PCH. You'll see in that like last motherboard we looked at, it talked about one of them is on the PCH. These are not on the PCH. Here's a 16 directly to the CPU, a 16 to the CPU, a 16 to the CPU, a 16 to the CPU, 16 to the CPU, 16, to the, uh, a couple eights to the CPU. This is for my SAS, for my hard drive controller, a times eight slot. We've got DMI for the PCH. That makes sense. Uh, another SAS controller, M2s go directly going to the CPU. Like your your um your M2 drives are probably going to the PCH, and then they're going over DMI X4, which is a PCIe times uh, four lane. Um, so basically, you're like if you have like two fucking SATA drives on a conventional computer, or two NVMe drives, they're probably bottlenecking on this lane. <laughs> <laughs> But instead, I've got all of these dedicated. Every fucking thing is dedicated to the CPU. Like, yeah, my gigabit LAN is running on this shit, but who fucking cares? Uh, my AS Media USB controller is running on this. Who fucking cares? But yeah. Yep. 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 This is, this is why server boards are so fucking amazing. You can also see that all of these dims are on different... Um, 
on different channels, but that's mainly the processor that can do that, right? But yeah, this is this is a this is a good setup that allows everything to scale linearly, unlike scale catastrophically like conventional things. Does X8 versus X16 really have a huge impact on the GPU? Kind of depends what you're doing. It is a halving of bandwidth. It literally halves your bandwidth. So um, it really only matters when you're like loading textures onto the GPU. But if you're doing like actual compute, it absolutely matters. Um, 100 gigabit would be a bandwidth of PCIe at times eight. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, LSPCI, uh, VVV, uh, pseudo uh, Vim dash, right? So my, um, my network card, right? My network card is PCI uh, V3 and it requires, uh, it's capable of a 16 and it is currently active at 16. This is why I got these new computers, because I couldn't have my fucking network card and my GPU. Uh, if I had a GPU, then my network card would get half bandwidth. And if I had a network card, then my GPU would get half bandwidth, and I got fucked. And further, I can even bring it up. Um, file colon slash slash home pleb computers. Uh, if we look at gamey, this is the... This is the the Alienware that I, like, fucking transplanted. Let's take a look at this one. Let's look at this $2,000 computer. Up to two PCI Express single with double width full length things. The graphics configuration depends on the that, blah, blah, blah. Let's go find where they talk about it. Um, boo, boo, boo. They talk about it somewhere. PCI uh, X16. Graphic slot. Oh, look at this. Note, the primary graphic slot one works at 8x speed only, regardless of other cards. Interesting. Interesting. You can have a motherboard where the, the first one literally has no 16 regardless? Oh, and PCI X16, the other one, also is only 8x. Huh. Only. Only 8x. Weird. Why even call it 16? Interesting. What about what about this one that I had on my other workstation? Um, I think this one probably can actually do x16. Oh, interesting. So I've got two x16s off there and then one off the chipset that runs an x4. That makes sense. Um, uh, when SATA ports 5 and 6 are enabled, then you'll run at X2 on one of your X16 slots. Okay, that's a little weird. That's a little strange. Uh, you got these PCIe slots. Hmm, very strange. One running in an X4 mode. If you want to use two or more high-end ones, you can use a, a crazy PSU. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, the PCIe X16 slash X8, when an M2 is installed, when you have an NVMe drive installed, huh, your primary graph, your primary slot one graphics card runs in X8 mode. Really? Really? Huh. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it turns out, depending on, like, the way that you have NVMe drives or SATA drives, you might literally have access to no X16 PCIe lanes anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> this is a nice motherboard. This is a high-end motherboard. This is, like, a $2,500, like, CPU build. Or, like, system build. Yep. Yep, you put an NVMe drive in it because you even remotely care about your disk performance. Congratulations, you no longer have a single X16 slot on your system. <sighs> yep. 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 Welcome to how it goes. <laughs> Welcome to how it goes. It's so common, it's horrible. Yes. Yeah, like this computer literally doesn't even run an X16 in any mode, regardless of, 
of if you have NVMe or SATA or anything. And then on a high-end motherboard of a computer I built myself, same thing, if you have an NVMe drive, which you fucking should, you don't have, you don't have 16x, yep. Yep, uh, yeah, it's pretty tilting. The Alienware is just a shame, yeah. <laughs> How many times 16 slots do you use in your current build? Uh, three, uh, right now. TLDR by Supermicro, I mean... Super, it's that they're, um, it's really that they're server processors, and server processors just have a shit ton more PCIe lanes. Do you know Anger? Yeah, I'm familiar with Anger. Uh, what processor were you showing that supports 4x16 directly to it? Um, let's go find, uh, where, where was that? Uh, uh, let's go find it in my history. Uh, Supermicro. Um, this, this, here we go. Yeah, yeah, so this has, uh, let's see how many, let's see how many dedicated lanes that I have directly from the CPU. Um, I have, uh, 16, 32, uh, 64 plus 48 is, uh, or uh, plus 16 is, uh, six, that's, uh, a, a, a 80, uh, plus 8 is 88, plus, uh, what else do we have, plus, uh, 16 there, I mean, it's just all of these that matter, 16, 16, 16, 16, that's 64, uh, plus, uh, 32 is 96, uh, plus that, that's 128 lanes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep, <laughs> but most server boards cause quadruple of the gaming board. Yeah, exactly. But also, this has nothing to do with really the motherboard. This is more the processors. This is more the difference of of a of a, a server processor versus a conventional uh, desktop processor. Because you'll find if I go look at the specs of the Xeon Silvers, uh, I have sixty four PCIe lanes per processor, and I have two processors, so I have hundred and twenty eight PCIe lanes on the system. Um. Yeah. At work, we got uh, 16x NVMe U2 discs um, and 400 gigabit uh, ports with full PCIe bandwidth. Yeah, fuck yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah, that's the way to go. Um, Threadripper is a little more affordable than server chips and you still get a lot of the benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, is a lane just a, a pipe? It's basically, yeah, it's like a channel. Right, lanes are perfectly parallel. So a 16x has 16x the bandwidth of a 1x. Uh, a 16x has 4x the bandwidth of a 4x. Right, like literally direct. Like that is realized. You will see that in software. Those will those will matter. Um, but yeah, yep. That's uh, that's that's the that's uh, that's my rant on how fucking annoying it is to build desktops. Which sucks because I like desktops because desktops have nice, um, desktops have much better performance, uh, for single thread. And it kind of sucks to not have good single thread performance. Um, but that's, uh, that's a trade off that I'm willing to make. Um, $800 motherboard. Why is perf so expensive? Yeah, it's a cost of doing business. <laughs> Pretty sure the newer Epic chips uh, have even more lanes. Uh, yeah, they have like 128, I think, in those chips. But those are arguably like two processors on one die. Or on, on like one chip. Like two dies on one chip. Um, the M1. The M1's ass. Come on. M1's ass. People are too hyped about the M1. The M1 is impressive for performance per watt, but it's not, it's not impressive for performance. It's cool. It's impressive at its market. But it's not very impressive for a a, a performance CPU. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, has no C or three. Yeah, it's got the titty, the titty bro, the titty bro. It's a mobile CPU. Yeah, exactly. Like it's very impressive as a mobile CPU, and in the mobile segment, it's extremely impressive. 
but it's not very impressive as a performance CPU. Just, just isn't. It's an amazing for a laptop chip. Yeah, exactly. I <laughs> would never debate that. It's very impressive, super low wattage, uh, super good performance single core, eh, mediocre multi-core performance. It's impressive for an ARM. I mean, there's nothing architecturally preventing ARM from being super high performance. It's just that there hasn't really been the investment in it. Like, uh, you had the first generation uh, Cavium Thunder X, uh, which was an absolute heap of shit. It was almost basically in order. It was so fucking bad. Um, and then you had the Thunder X2, which was Onyx. Honestly, it was okay. The Thunder X2 was okay. And the, basically the current gen of ARM64 compute servers are respectable, but the price point is disgusting. The price point for ARM64 shit, it's like twice the fucking cost of x86. Yeah, Thunder X2 is almost usable. Yeah, Thunder X2 is competitive with like five-year-old uh, Intel. Yeah, that's pretty good. Risk doesn't exist. Everything is Cisc. Yeah, that's kind of kind of my view. Um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty easy to call things Cisc if you're going to define them as Cisc based on whether or not their load store architectures and whether or not their instructions are fixed with. I Yeah, I don't think that's stopping ARM from being an absolute clusterfuck of an architecture. <laughs> like... Cool. You could also make x86 the same fucking architecture with fixed width instructions. You would just have to, like, do weird... You would have to have, like, multi-instructions to load immediates, and you would change to a load store architecture, but you would still have all of AVX 512. <laughs> like, it's just fucking dumb. <laughs> it's gotten pointless at this point. Yeah. Yeah. No one's going to make a competitive processor that doesn't have vector instructions, and the second you introduce vector instructions, you're no longer a really load story. What's the ARM architecture market? Uh, mobile, uh, it's not low voltage, it's low power stuff. So it's, it's uh, ARM stuff is typically, yeah, just lower power stuff. Um, I mean, let, let's be honest. The reason ARM got popular is because it was cheaper. Like, it was literally just cheaper. And now Risk Five is taking over ARM stuff because it's even cheaper, right? Like people didn't want to pay for the licensing or buy physical Intel processors, so they licensed ARM cores for a really cheap fee, and then they were able to use a standardized environment for their cheap-ass, shitty, defective core that, like, probably didn't even implement the spec correctly, but but they did, and then. Then ARM became expensive because the licensing fees are even prohibitively expensive at this point. So now people want Risk Five, which is free, and then you and then you don't have to pay licensing. Well, you do, I think, if you want like the logo or some shit. I can't remember what they do. Um, but yeah. <sighs> um, I mean, uh, with chips like Thunder X Two, can we really call it low power? Well, ARM inherently is not low power. It just is more suitable for low power. There's, there's nothing stopping you from making a fucking massive wafer that pumps out a thousand watts. Uh, there's, there's really nothing stopping you from doing that with ARM. Um, but yeah. Yeah, ARM, ARM has gotten a little, a little meh, to be honest. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan, to be honest. I don't know. Arm Arm V8 is not terrible, but goddamn, Arm V Arm V everything else was so fucking bad. All the 32-bit Arm thumb mode, thumb two mode, Giselle mode. Like there are so many different modes of operations. The fucking encodings were disgusting. Like people get fucking mad at X86 for having like encodings where everything is next to each other and then you look at fucking arm and you like extract two bits from random spots and then you xor them with each other and that becomes the sign extended top bit of a relative offset for your brand like fuck off <laughs> bring back alphas alphas were phenomenal power pc i'm not a huge fan of um itanium was <sighs> itanium is really tough man I think Itanium was too early. I think... 
I think Itanium could be good today. Like, uh, I think a lot of the problems with Itanium and arguably Alpha were that they required really good compilers to, to leverage. I mean, like, I mean, basically, like, the Itanium route was we're not going to have a... a a private register file in the processor we're just gonna give software access to all of the registers and it's gonna go and, and software will make the decisions instead of the processor doing smart transforms from 16 registers to internal hundreds of registers right um and basically it was designed to kind of move a lot of the hardware abstractions into software and kind of give software a lot more control. And I think in this day and age where we have better compilers and we're no longer in the VC 98 days that we were when we wrote those, honestly, I think an Itanium style processor is probably going to be the future. Like, yeah, like I, I think it, I think it legitimately could like, I don't know. I mean, look at modern, uh, look at like Skylake York, right? If you look at the Skylake York diagram, um, you'll see that there are a fuck ton of registers. It's just like Itanium. The difference is the registers are scheduled and aliased by the processor, right? You have uh, you have 180 registers in your modern x86 processor. 180 registers for integers and 168 for vectors. So you have like 10x the number of registers in the processor than you can access. So as a developer, you cannot do anything. You can't algorithmically load things into those registers or keep them cached in those registers. You have to use the 16 registers that you have and hope that the processor kind of schedules them in the way that you would hope, right? Um, it's really tough. Like, ultimately, ultimately, as the... As compiler tech gets better, I think we'll see more and more. Like, I mean, imagine if Intel just exposed their microcode directly directly to users. And they're like, you can just write microcode. Now you can make, like, you can literally construct arbitrary, like, operations. Maybe throw them in, like, the microcode, like, caches. Like, imagine you could just create your own, like, complex multiply add and then and instruction and you could just fucking have that baked in as an instruction, right? Like, I don't know. Um, is register scheduling uh, related to register renaming? Yes. So I, I guess it should be called uh, register renaming when you're at the processor level. The hardware to software shift is 100% real. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and honestly, that's kind of what Itanium was shooting for. And they just, the, I think Itanium actually is a better architecture now than it was before just due to the software ecosystem getting better. Register renaming has done pretty well on hardware. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's still, it still is not optimal if you really want that level of control. Now, that being said, would you be able to get that level of control in an optimal way? Who knows? Like, would you be able to access these 180 registers as fast as it can access them for you through its own like internal lookup tables when it has to go through maybe a dynamic lookup table yeah probably not it'd probably be probably be slower to do that so there's there it's not trivial you can't just expose all these things to a user because exposing these things to a user then requires that they have the basically the really long lines and some way of latching things in and maybe some extra storage and all sorts of things. Basically, anytime you make something dynamic, anything, anytime you make something microcode instead of being baked into ROM or baked into like an actual ALU, you're gonna lose performance. So it's kind of like an FPGA. An FPGA can do whatever the fuck you want, but good luck getting even remotely within a factor of ten of a an ASIC, right? So wasn't Itanium also in order? I thought Itanium. I can't remember if it was out of order. Um. Exposing the out of order and super scalar execution stuff to the user level code seems like a move in the wrong direction. Um, that's tough to say. All I hear is QQ. Thank you so much for the five gifted submarinos. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, we're definitely on a little bit of a tangent right now. <laughs> Hell yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome to welcome to the rant day. Anyways, um, let's get back to this. Um, okay. <laughs> so the reason why. 
this uh, this second memory access that is doing the exact same thing is 100 times faster is indeed due to the page tables. And we talked about these page tables before our long tangent. And basically, the page tables are what is telling the processor where things are mapped. Now, instead of... Uh, we already talked about um, this allocation of uh, 4 gigs. When it goes to malloc, it's actually going to go to mmap, which is going to go to the kernel. Because it, this is too specialized... Um, this is too specialized of an uh, of a size for malloc to want to handle that itself. So it's going to offload that to the kernel. And the kernel is then going to, uh, let's go into the kernel. And that kernel is then going to give a virtual address uh, back to user space. Now, what's interesting about this is this is going to be zero um, filled. So this is just something that's designed by the kernel that the kernel is going to return this memory zero filled. But what's really interesting is that the kernel is going to do something called lazy, lazy allocation. And this lazy allocation is going to cause, literally this is how the mmap call is going to occur. You're going to mmap, you're going to say, I don't care about what address you give me, and I want four gigs. I want four gigs of this shit. That's going to go to the kernel. And the kernel is then going to basically say, okay, um, we're going to go through your list of, of virtual memory, all the virtual memory that you've used, and we're going to find a gap that's big enough to hold four gigs. And look at that. We found a gap that can hold four gigs. This starts at address uh, lead, and it's four gigs long, right? So we found this memory. And then the kernel is going to say, uh, this is your memory. It's going to register this and say, this is going to say that lead is now mapped for four gigs, and it's going to return this back to user space, and it, it's going to give user space this elite address. Okay. Well, it didn't actually allocate anything. It didn't actually, it didn't actually do anything to allocate these pages. These pages don't exist in the page table. No physical memory, no RAM was used to do that, other than the, like, 16 bytes of metadata. So what happens now is you have this array. You have this 4 gig array, right? And we're striding this one 4K at a time. So let's say these are 4K uh, things, and we're in our test program. We're striding it 4K at a time. We're touching each page. Now what happens is we go to access this page. Well, this page actually isn't backed by physical memory. So you got like your actual sticks of RAM over here with your chips on it. Well, this doesn't exist in RAM. So what happens is the processor issues a page fault. And a page fault is an exception. And this page fault is not free. It's actually pretty expensive because there's going to be a context switch. Uh, let's, let's benchmark that. Let's, let's add that to the BM list. We'll do a benchmark of page faults. Um, so we have an exception. That then goes into the kernel. The kernel is then going to look up. Uh, it's then going to save state. So it's going to save your register state. It's going to do a bunch of memory writes. It's then going to look up your mode. It's going to figure out where you are. It's going to look up that uh, your virtual memory map. Right? It's going to see what that is. It's going to be like, oh, oh, shit. Yeah, I told user space about this. I told it it's just fine. It's great memory to use. And it's going to be like, oh, shit. I guess they're actually using that memory now. So it will then go and allocate four kilobytes from actual physical memory. And then it will map that into the page tables. And then it's going to have to do uh, an invul pig to basically, well, it doesn't have to do an invul pig if it's, if it's, if it's mapping it for the first time. Uh, but anyways, it's going to then back that. This will then go back up this whole stack, restore all the state, return back into user space, and then continue what it was running. And that is happening, happening every single memory access, right? Every single memory access, it is breaking into the kernel, saving all the state, looking up the memory map, looking up the region, looking if it should be zero initialized, filling it in. It also, along that entire path, it has to determine, is this a memory mapped file? Do we need to actually load this from disk to fill this in from disk? Is this paged out? Is this paged in? Is this, what are the permissions on this memory? All these fucking things affect this. TLDR, this is very expensive. So this is why the first access is very slow. And the second access is 100 times faster. Because there's basically 100x overhead in allocating those pages. 
right? Uh, but then why was uh, the step by 4096 faster since it has to load all the pages anyways? Because it's using the old buffer. Because that cost has happened. All of that memory has actually been commit to physical memory such that this one doesn't hit any page faults. This one doesn't page fault at all. Right? So if we did like a, a perf... Uh, hmm... There's a good tool that just tells you like the number of page faults. I, for, I forget. I forget the one that it is. Let's go. Let's go to one byte accesses, and let's see how we do on performance with one byte accesses. So same thing. And you'll find weird. The gap is closed. Now, what's interesting is the reason that gap is closed is because this one needs to access four thousand bytes, and then this one needs to access the same, uh, four gigabytes, the same four gigabytes, but this one doesn't have the page faults. It's interesting that it's still 2x faster because here's what's happening. <laughs> In this setup, this is the benchmark we just wrote. We wrote something where you have your, your virtual memory here and you have your 4K here. You have your 4K page. Now what happens is it will read one byte. It'll read one byte. This will cause a page fault. That will go into the kernel. That's going to do all that shit and come back out and map that page in. Then it is going to read 4,095, the remaining bytes of the page, just fine. No page faults. And then first byte, fault, bad. Then it's going to read everything. So what's interesting here is you have this performance where it's like really spiky, where it's like you're going really fast and, then, and, and slowing down. Time V shows you page faults. Fuck yeah. Uh, user bin time. Yeah. Okay. Page faults. Um, minor page faults. This many. Okay, let's go see. Let's multiply this by 4096. Divide this by 1024. Is this close to 4 gigs? It should be. Yeah, it's a little bit over 4 gigs. That basically lines up with what we would expect. <laughs> There's a... Basically, we faulted in 4 gigs of memory... 4K at a time. Um, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> so what we can now do is we can do the same size, but we're going to divide this by 8. And we're going to change the memory access size to 64 bits. And the step by will stay the same. So now this is the exact same thing that we did before, the same amount of memory, except now we're reading 64 bits at a time instead of uh, 8 bits at a time. Okay, so if we do this, you'll find that our perf has even more kind of spread out. That's actually really interesting. That's 520. Um, oh, I need to multiply this by, uh, this needs to be size of. Um, uh, core mem size of val uh, buff as slice. Okay, so that's now the size in bytes. I wasn't looking at the size in bytes. That's why those numbers are lower, right? Uh, core mem size of val this. Mm, uh, uh, as f64. Okay, so now we can see that we're now getting 30 gigabytes a second <laughs> of bandwidth on that second one. And this read volatile, basically read volatile is making sure that we're truly reading that uh, 64 bits at a time. It, like, if, if we didn't have read volatile, it could potentially omit these reads. It wouldn't actually do... Well, in this case, it just wouldn't do these reads. So if I said core pointer read, this number is just going to be max in because it's not actually going to do anything in this loop, and it's going to get optimized out. Okay, maybe not. Uh, maybe not fully. Anyways, so there you can see that there is a relatively large performance difference. Um, and once again, that difference is entirely coming from the... Um, it's entirely coming from the fact that that memory in the first one is getting paged in. And that page in cost is expensive as fuck. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Need to fix the above print. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're totally right. Cheers. Thanks for that. But yeah, it, it, it's still, yeah, still big difference. That doesn't, 
Doesn't change it. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try and get a little bit more introspection into what is actually happening here. And the very first thing that I'm going to do to do that is I'm going to stop talking about seconds and we're going to start talking about cycles. And that's because cycles are actually the speed that your processor runs at. So we're going to do uh, FN RDTSC and we're going to make something that can get the number of processor cycles uh, in a nice safe manner. Um, core arc uh, x86-64 RDTSC. So the the frequency that your um, cycle counter counts at technically varies. It technically varies. However, um, however, in pretty much all modern processors, it's just going to be 2.10 gigahertz. Or not 2.10 gigahertz. It's going to be the clock rate of your processor. So uh, what we'll find is let's let's do that. Let's do um, uh, use standard instant uh standard time instant so we're gonna do standard time instant we're gonna get it is instant now so we're gonna start a timer we're then gonna do standard thread sleep uh ms a thousand we're gonna sleep for a second uh it cycles is gonna be rt rdtsc and then we're gonna do let's EEC elapsed cycles is RDTSC minus IT, and then let IT uh, elapsed time is equal to IT elapsed as seconds as 64. Okay, so now what we have is the cycles, and what we can do is we can divide them. We can say number of cycles that occurred over the number of seconds. So this is cycles per second, right? Basically, the processor frequency. Um, uh, et it dot elapsed as seconds f64 itc. Okay. Um, and then as f64, and here we go. And there we go. It is 2.0999 blah 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 TLDR. Uh, this is an extremely high precision 2.1 gigahertz timer. Now, what's really important about this is that this will run at different rates on different machines. So if I copy um, target release cache perf to polar, and I go to polar, and I run this on polar, uh, you'll see that this is now a 2.29. Huh, well, what's 2.29 closest to? Well, probably 2.3, let's see. Is is this a 2.3 gigahertz processor? It is. What's really interesting is that that now has anchored me to performance that is uh, related to the processor. So that has factored out the difference between the clock rate. If I'm doing all of my measurements in cycles, I no longer care about this benchmark being on a three gigahertz processor or a two gigahertz processor because on a two gigahertz processor an l1 cache lookup is going to be four cycles and on a three gigahertz processor it's also going to be four cycles but it will be different in the amount of seconds that elapse for that time one will be slightly longer than the other in order of nanoseconds right and that is why you'll basically see me and most people who are doing pretty serious optimization working entirely with cycles. Further, here's another thing that we can do. Let's take a look at uh, instant now and then EC. We're going to print EC. So what we're going to do is we're going to print the... Um, uh, so here we're printing the number of cycles that it took to do instant now, right? And now we're going to print the number of cycles as well that it took to do an RDTSC, right? So we're measuring the cost of our measurement, right? And the cost of getting the time from the OS is 22,000 cycles. And the cost of doing an RDTSC is 54 cycles, right? So 22208 divided by 54, it is 400 times more expensive to get the wall clock time than it is to get this timestamp counter. So that means if we really want, if we want to measure something that takes a thousand cycles, then our margin of error with IT, uh, with instant now, is going to be 20x greater than that of what we're literally measuring. But if we use RDTSC, we're gonna have about a 5% a margin of error, right? 
And that 5% margin of error is really not too terrible. Um, yeah, so basically, um, the timestamp counter is, is a monotonically increasing thing that increases at, typically, it varies, you have to check your processor, but modern processors is typically a monotonically increasing counter that runs at the highest non-turboed clock rate of your system. It's very important to say that it runs at the highest non-turbo clock rate of your system. So when you're doing benchmarks and you're doing things that are hitting turbo mode, you are now technically, you would observe that the number of cycles for an L1 lookup is actually going to be less than that of four. When four is theoretically the fastest way that you can do an L1 lookup, you'll find that you're getting like 3.2, 3.5, whatever. And that's because your processor is actually running faster than your counter. But once again, when you are doing low level benchmarking and optimization like this, you pretty much always are talking in relatives. You're not talking about absolutes, right? You're talking about relatives. You want to do benchmarks comparing apples to apples, and you can derive information from the relative difference of those things. You do not want to do benchmarks in absolute terms. You can, but it, it's same with like physics or any low level like metrology stuff. If you're trying to get really low level and understand the nitty gritty details of what is happening, you pretty much have to deal with relatives. Because if I was to do a benchmark on this system running on one core and I do a relative comparison of multiple things, it doesn't matter if I have turbo enabled or not because I'm still benchmarking the same things against each other. Now there's noise that affects CPU traffic and other threads in the system and processor interrupts and affinities and, and all those sorts of things that, that do affect things. And those are things that you have to reduce as part of, uh, as part of the noise of the system. But we're kind of starting at a higher level. We'll, we'll touch on those things later. These, these things right now are just a little bit too hard for us to, to go into those details. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you one of the, one of the first techniques of, uh, of optimization and like CPU performance metrology. And that is average shit. For blah in zero to one thousand. Okay, so now we're gonna do this a thousand times. Okay, well now we have maybe an average, maybe not. It might not be invoking that actually. Um, so it's really hard to say. We don't really know if that's actually getting invoked. So we're gonna make a really thin wrapper. So the the compiler might be optimizing this out because it sees that this result is not used. So there's a couple ways that we can get around this. We can do let mute moose is equal to zero, and then moose plus equals it dot elapsed dot as seconds f6 uh, uh, as uh, uh, seconds I, I don't know I forget what it, it is um um in 82 thank you so much for uh gift or not gifting the sub for subbing yourself hell yeah hope that is a, a reference to uh, a software a software interrupt. Okay, so this is now going to do two, unfortunately. So we're actually going to move this up to the top. And then we're going to do moose plus equals this. And we'll do seconds uh, uh, rust. I forget what it is because I never deal with a non-float variant. Uh, this is a duration. Looking at duration and then as seconds. Okay, sick. That's what I was going to guess. Okay, so now we'll see that this perf is about the same. But if we print it, the perf might wildly change. It also might not. Um, ITC, or moose. So now we're going to print, we're going to print that value moose. Um, okay. Interesting. Um, as nanos. So let's try as nanos just for funsies. There we go. Um, okay. So that's interesting that it's actually much more expensive on the first operation. So the first operation, oh, well, well now that's cheap. Um, and I bet it's because instant probably calibrates and it eventually starts using the timestamp counter. That kind of makes sense to me. Um, that's, that's literally probably what's happening here. Like subsequent ones are probably relatively cheap because it probably contacts the processor to get like uh, frequency scaling. And then it uses that to turn RDTSC into a wall clock time. Um, so it can get cheaper. 
But the first time you use it, it might be expensive. Anyways, we're going to use RDTSC because it's much better. So, what we want to do is also... Um, someone brought up that you can have an unlucky context switch. And there's, there's a couple ways around that. Um, there's averages. Uh, so, let's do a sum. So, what we're going to do is we're going to benchmark um, in zero this. Or we're gonna we're gonna do this benchmark. We're gonna benchmark RDTSC ten thousand times, right? So we're literally gonna benchmark that ten thousand times. We're gonna do sum plus equals uh, EC, the amount of elapsed time, and then we're gonna print out the uh, sum as F64 divided by one thousand or ten thousand. So this is now giving me basically the average amount of time that RD RDTSC. Uh, takes to execute. Um, and there we go. It's 67, 54, 50, 54, 54, 55, 54, 54, 54, 54, 54, 57, 54.1, right? And the more you average, the closer you get to the average, right? And since this is running pretty fast, we can do this a million times, no problem. Now we have... 56, 54.16, blah, blah, blah. We have all of these numbers. Well, what if I actually want to determine the, um, uh, if I want to determine the cost of, let's say, nothing. We, we don't want anything in here. We want to determine basically the baseline cost of our optimization. Well, we don't want to subtract off 26 because that's going to give us negative numbers, right? If we subtract off 27 or whatever, so let's, let's do this. Let's say, um, let RDTSC, uh, cost is equal to zero. Let's just say this, uh, or this at the end. So we'll say RDTSC cost is going to be equal to sum as F64 divided by this, right? So we're basically determining the cost of RDTSC, and we'll say RDTSC cost is blah. And basically by averaging, we're kind of averaging out startup costs, we're averaging out cache stuff, we're averaging out context switches, we're averaging out a bunch of different noise on the system because we did this benchmark a million times. So now let's do this again. So let's benchmark this, let's compute our, our temporary cost, and uh, let's keep doing this. Uh, loop, okay? Let's loop over this and let's assert that the temp cost minus RDTSE cost is always greater than or equal to zero, right? We want to make sure that what we benchmark was the original cost of RDTSC, which we're going to use to subtract off to find the absolute cost of things in between. You'll find that, depending on what we get, um, let's see, temp cost minus RDTSC cost kind of depends on the variance here and where we get scheduled. Um, blah, blah, blah. For that... Sum. Oh, yep, that's going to fail because we don't reset sum. Okay. <laughs> we'll reset sum. There we go. Okay, there we go. We got a panic, right? We got a panic because sometimes this is, is the initial benchmark is cheaper. So there's one really good way that we can do this, right? There's one really interesting way that we can do this. Instead of tracking the sum, we can track the min. And this way... We'll say the min is all Fs, and we'll say min is equal to um, core, uh, or we can just say min.min .min EC, right? So now, um, what does loop do? It loops forever. It's just an infinite loop. Uh, okay, so now the RDTSC cost is now min. And now we can say this as F64. And now we can see if we ever hit that, um, uh, RD, uh, we'll just say min. So we'll say min down here. And now we can see if we ever have a situation where we benchmark it to be faster. RDTSC cost is 20. Okay, so that happened. Uh, let's see what we got. Um, and this is possible, right? It's always possible. Temp cost. Okay, here we go. Sum. Blah, blah, blah. RDTSC cost is 24, it's 20, that's still a little bit noisy, right? Still a little bit noisy. Um, we can see that sometimes it's under that. And that's actually kind of interesting because I, that's starting to get to the, get to the realm, well this one, 
is no surprise at all. 24 is definitely not the cost of our DTSC. So let's see. What if we up this? Well, we know it's we know it's 20 cycles. We know this is a we know it's approximately 20 cycles. We know that approximately this is a uh well it's 40 cycles for the two pairs. This is approximately a two gigahertz processor. So we can do this a hundred million times. We should be able to do this about a hundred million times in about a second. And now we're really looking for like the, the fastest. And there's 24 again. What's interesting here is that I don't think this issue is going to go away. Oh, there's a 14. There's a 14. Interesting. Um, if you're subtracting uh, min, then it's like five added cycles on average added. Uh, not necessarily. So here's what we're going to do. We want this to be more stable right now. We're very unhappy because this isn't stable. We're going to go to a million. We're going to try and get this to be more stable. We're going to call this moose. Uh, and then we're just going to run this. And uh, we'll just uh, fn main loop moose this. Okay. So we're going to call that a bunch of times. So we're going to see how stable this is. And we can see it wiggles around a bit. Oh, there it dipped. And that is very interesting. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're actually going to go to 10,000. And then we're going to make a buffer. And we're going to go uh, let mute uh, foop is equal to vec new. Uh, for blah and zero to, uh, I don't know. We can run this, uh, yep, uh, probably about that many times. Is that 100 mil? Yeah, I think that's 100 mil. So we'll then pass this mute foop. And then at the end, this is just going to do foop dot push push min okay so here we go now we're now we're making data uh oops uh foop is a mutable vector of u64s okay so now you have data we're generating that list we can get rid of this print and now we're logging data the prints can also interfere with it quite a bit um all right and then we'll do a uh, standard fs write data dot uh, bin um, and then we'll write out foop. Oh, shit. I have to do on safe. Um, core, uh, slice from raw parts. Foop as pointer as, uh, usi, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, const u8. Uh, then we'll do foop.len times, uh, eight. We don't need to do sizes here. It's just, we're just hacking this out. And uh, we can unwrap that as well to make sure that the write was actually successful. And now we have a data file. We have generated kind of a list of these costs, right? Um, so uh, let's go make a plot.plot .plot and we'll set terminal... WXT size 1440 by 900 persist uh, plots uh, data dot bin using one to two uh, we don't need with lines and then we can do um uh, data file binary uh, I forget how to fucking do this and that's actually uh, using one um data up oh. Plot binary format is percents. Um, <sighs> percent format. Probably I can probably do L, maybe U L even. But I, I think there are fixed with ones. Carry run release. Oh, genie plot plot to plot. Okay, and we'll go into cache perf. Genie plot plot to plot. Okay, unrecognized binary format. Okay, let's try L. Um, hmm, might just be long. Okay, we have a long, nice. Okay, and then what about a U long? Nice, okay, so there we go. So now we have data, and now we're gonna run this for a little bit longer, because uh, uh, that looks good. We wanna run this for like, I don't know, 10 seconds. So we'll see how long this takes. Um, and then we'll keep tuning the time, and we'll just basically add an order of magnitude until we until we find it's running about the time that we want it to. Um.
Okay. All right, so here we go. Hey, there we go. So we have some expensive ones. We have some that are really cheap. We see that we hit some, we hit 14s. Every once in a while we hit a 14, right? Um, what's interesting is that when we're hitting these lower counts, um, you can kind of see that there's a trend here. So um, when we're hitting low counts here, we're taking away from the top, right? The top is actually shifted down to here. And that's telling us some interesting interesting behavior that it looks like the processor is temporarily behaving a, a little bit better for us. So maybe that's we switched into a different turbo state. Maybe that's we scheduled to a different processor. And then it gets expensive again. And then once again, when we're hitting these faster rates, we're seeing this dip down. Um, that's actually really interesting to see. So now what, uh, one of the things I like to do when I'm benchmarking is double the sampling and and or not double but 10x the sampling and then uh reduce the um the count so now we have fewer data points but they're they're more stable data points so let's take a look at what we got here can verify my memory that i saw unsynchronized tsc um uh are we talking about tsc's don't uh RDTSC is not a serializing instruction, so you can have things actually move around it, which is really interesting. Um, so you have to be very careful with measurements. Once again, we see the same thing. We lose, we lose, when we see 24s, we see some 26s, we mainly see 24s, and everything moves up. Here you also see that the most solid line is the 20. So it's pretty safe to say that 20 is probably actually the the like lowest. And then these are probably some interesting turbo mode states, right? Um, so one of the things that we can do is proc CPU info, or uh, we can actually take a look at like HTOP while we're running that benchmark. Uh, let's take a look at HTOP and we'll see if we're jumping cores, right? So we're gonna run this and we'll see if we jump cores. Here we go, ready? So one of these cores should be pegged. And we don't really see which one it is. And that's not a good sign. That means, okay, it's this one. We're on 12 right now, probably. Um, okay, we're not on 12. Maybe we're on 36. Or maybe we're switching between hyper threads on 12 and 36. Um, yeah, so that immediately is a problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this data up in. And I'm going to call this data un... Uh, un... <sighs> unpinned dot bin okay so we're going to save that off and that's going to be a comparison now what we're going to do is we're going to um we're going to pin ourselves to one core so uh let's do i think we'll do unsafe libc uh man sketch set affinity sketch set affinity uh, I think we can do, uh, libc get pid. So we're setting our current affinity and our CPU set size. We'll just say is 32 bytes. Let mute, uh, let foo, uh, is o u eight, uh, 32 bytes. And this can be foo dot len. And then here we'll just say foo dot, oops. Uh, we'll set foo zero is equal to one. And then that should be it. That should we'll just assert that this succeeded. Uh, probably is equal to zero. I'm guessing is success. Um, never understood the core jumping. Is it efficient? No, it's very inefficient. Uh, libc is star. Okay. Okay, that's probably it's probably like ballpark what we want. Okay, and. Yeah, that looks about right. Um, foo.len followed by a uh, foo.as pointer. It might need to be a mute pointer. Okay. Um, yeah, as, uh, as this. Okay. Can't assign because that needs to be mute. Yep. That makes sense. So hopefully we're now pinned to, uh, zero. Yep. We are. You can tell we're pinned to zero because we're hitting that hundred percent and we're stuck there. We are not moving from that core. All right. And we're just going to be sitting there this whole time.
Okay, and there we're done. All right, uh, okay, so now we can look at plot.plot, .plot, and let's plot, uh, let's additionally plot, um, let's plot data underscore unpinned, and we'll say t unpinned. Okay, and we should be able to hopefully plot this. Okay, uh, I didn't put uh, something in there. Um, bad data. Okay, is it is it the title? I maybe I have to say binary first. Yeah, it is. Okay, so now what we can do is we can take a look at the difference between these. So here's unpinned. Okay, 24 to 20 backup. And then we have this one, which stays down. Okay, so there's really not a big difference between these, to be honest. Not really a huge difference. So these are, are looking to be roughly the same, and that's fine. Uh, I still trust unpinned uh, a little bit more. Right, this one should be just slightly more stable. Can you pin to an actual core without hyperthreading? Nope. Um, so yeah, I'm also getting fucked by uh, hyperthreads. So that also could be what you're seeing there is when uh, another hyperthread is running on the system. Um, okay, so let's see here. So those are kind of like the, the main tools in the toolkit of like measuring and benchmarking things. Now, obviously we don't, this is, this is mainly if you're trying to do absolute benchmarking and absolute benchmarking is pretty fucking hard. Right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hard code this and we're gonna we're gonna say that um actually once again uh we can do relative benchmarking. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do uh uh actually just one time. Let mute buff is vec o uh ox four one u eight and then this is four gigs again. Okay, so now we have four gigs, and since I gave it 41, it should actually get initialized before we get here, so you'll see a delay in foo. So foo won't print right away, right? That's exactly what we want. We want to intentionally delay that, and then min, we don't need this shit anymore. Okay, bam. So now we're back to our original, our original thing. Okay, yep, foo took a while to print. Fantastic, that's a good sign. So now what we can do is unsafe uh, for I, uh, uh, I, I, and actually we can just do four bytes in buff.iter, right? And then we can core pointer read volatile uh, byte, right? So we're going to, we're going to now read those bytes and then we're going to try and time it. So this is tough because we're not doing any averaging. We're trying to measure a very, 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 very cheap event. Uh, also, this uh, should be with capacity, um... Okay, this is also gonna be really expensive. So we're just gonna do, we're gonna do one meg. Um, and this is gonna be uh, buff.len. This is gonna make sure that we pre-allocate that and then we'll do foop dot four blah in zero to uh, in foop dot intermute dot four each. Um, actually we'll do this. Yeah, this is fine. Vec. Oh, use uh one u sixty four, buff dot len, okay, and then we'll do foop dot clear. All right, and then here we'll do foop, uh foop dot push, ec. Okay, so now we're timing the cost to read this meg. <laughs> that was that was weird. I bumped my table and it it, it the mouse did weird things. Oh, um, I think the I think the pen rolled across. The, yeah, the pen rolled across that when I bumped the table, okay. All right, anyways, uh, so we've run this benchmark and then we can data unpinned, we can get rid of that genie plot, uh, we'll run this plot. Okay, so this is a million data points. Once again, using GNU plot for a million data points is pretty hard. Um, we're gonna cut this down even, oh, I don't wanna initialize that. I actually want that to be zero. <laughs> Ah, uh, me being a dum dum. Okay. Um, we're also gonna do sixty four. We're gonna divide this by eight, right? So this is gonna go through uh sixty four bits at a time. So there's five hundred twelve reads per page. Now this time, uh, yeah, this is gonna this is gonna be better. Okay, ready? Bam. Okay. So here 
we can very clearly see that some axes are taking significantly longer than others. And now we can go and look and we can see if there happens to be a pattern. And I uh, plot twist, there fucking is. So uh, when things aren't close enough on the x-axis and it seems uncomfortable, um, we're just gonna squeeze those down by doing log scale y. And now we don't have a problem. Okay, here we go. So now we can take a look at this. And we can see, once we zoom in enough, do we see a pattern? And indeed we do. Even down here we see a pattern. Look at look at that. Look at that. Actually, let's um honestly, we're gonna do this. And we're gonna do uh we're gonna do uh eight pages. Eight times four thousand ninety-six divided by eight, because that's sixty-four bytes. Run this again, get our benchmark. Here we go. Okay, and uh, let's take a look here. Oh, interesting. Oh, yes, that one didn't get allocated by the kernel. Totally makes sense. So we're actually gonna make this massive, and then we're just gonna we're gonna uh, truncate it this way. So we'll do five twelve times the number of pages that we want. This way, it doesn't get a malloc bin. Because if it had a malloc bin, then it's probably already initialized from other things. Bam, there we go. Spike, 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 spike. And of course, what is this? Uh, what's the distance between these spikes? And it should be 512. So I'm gonna highlight over this one. Uh, actually, don't have a great way of doing that. Um, okay, we got these two spikes. Down in the lower left, you can see that we have a, a 1022. So we have a 1022. And then this one over here, we have a 1534. And those are exactly 512 apart which happens to be page size. Very interesting. What are the odds? What are the odds that that would happen? Hmm. Hmm, thinking colon. Wow, okay. It's almost as if that's a thing. <laughs> right? 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 Is mm, Big brain. Big brain. There you go. So there you go. Now you're seeing, basically, uh, you are observing the kernel faulting in those pages. And even more interestingly... What you can do here is we actually can see the cost of the kernel paging that in. And we can see that down here the cost is approximately 26 cycles. So 26 cycles is our, our basically our floor. And additional on top of that is a 1684. So basically the cost of the kernel to page in 4K of memory was 16, or 1600 cycles. Right? Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? What are the small bumps? It's hard to... S well... Well, these are regular, so the first thing we can do is we can just take a look at them. Do we see any form of normalcy between these? Okay, we got a 1287. Uh, a 1287 on that peak, and then on this one we have a 1301. Let's subtract those. That's 14. Multiply by 8. That doesn't really mean anything to me. Um, I, Yeah, I'm not really seeing anything. That makes sense there in, in my mind. Um, once again, there probably is a reason for that. And let's run it again. Let's see Let's see if we get the same spikes in the same spots. Nope, this one's just noisy. Um, so it kind of varies, right? So this is somewhere where averaging could be important and relevant. Um, eventually, I would probably observe like a context switch or something really expensive. Actually, maybe not on this many cores because the schedule are probably scheduled to different cores. Another thing that I'd like to do is not actually use... Uh, core number one because core number one also happens to just be biased to most traffic So we're gonna pick a different core and that might actually clean up these gra graphs a bit And you can see that these seem to be a little bit cleaner. Yeah, we're not really seeing the like completely noisy graphs anymore um, We're just seeing these kind of uh, repetitively uh, Consistent graphs and this is just like a, a, a very 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 we're looking at very very small time scales here And these measurements are really sensitive, right? Um, so we have to be careful that, yeah, and once again, we can go back and we can see if that was the reason why we're seeing that change. And once again, we're seeing noise. We're seeing choppiness, right? There you go. Um, that one wasn't choppy. That one is choppy, right? And we go back to a uh, deeper core, and we just get a little bit less activity on this core. Just a little bit less. And we're just not seeing that. Eventually, I would expect that we would see choppiness. We're not immune to that, uh, but we're not really seeing it, right? Okay. Isn't that pretty neat? 
Isn't that pretty neat? <laughs> okay, so let's go and see if we can find more patterns. So what we're gonna do is we're going to intentionally, uh, we're gonna intentionally fill in that uh, array. So we're gonna initialize the array so we no longer have the 4K spikes. And now we're gonna look at kind of what data we get here. Um, interesting that we're getting a spike there. Um, let's go, oh, is that cash? Mm, maybe. That's really interesting. Uh, I want to go out a lot deeper now. Let's go out like 64, eh, let's go out like 1,024 pages. Okay. Now I'm going to see if we see anything here. And we do. And I think this pattern might be real. This might be a real pattern. Um, ignore the noise, ignore the spikes. This pattern that we're observing here might be real. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I think we're going to see this pattern every time. Um... Yeah, I don't think this is a coincidence. So another thing is I want to plot these as points. Um, feels like candle patterns. There you go. So now we're looking at it with dots. Interestingly, it's actually a lot harder to see that pattern. Um, and this is why like changing your visualizations frequently is pretty important. Um, this is really interesting. Hmm. And these, I'm guessing, these blocks, let's go measure one of these blocks. So here's like a really clean block. Um, let's actually measure two and divide it. Or we're going to measure three and divide it. That way we can be a little bit fuzzier on our measurements. Two, five, five, four, seven, seven. And then we're going to go to this one, this edge, which is two, six, seven, eight, one, four. Subtract them, divide by three. That's four, one, one, two. Four, one, one, two. And these are eight byte axes. That's 32, 898. That is not a coincidence. I think what we are observing right here, I think that we are observing Numa locality. I think that these represent the, I think, Linux probably, when it gives us this allocation, it's probably giving us a mix of pages from different uh, memory controllers like we were talking about before. And I'm guessing that we are seeing the different uh, costs of those different uh, memory controllers. Because um, if we're accessing memory through another CPU, we actually have to request that from the other CPU. And that could be adding this extra cost. And we could literally be seeing basically that this might be telling us the distance we are between other processors, right? So that's really interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think this is basically, this is basically telling me the state of the free list for, uh, for physical pages in the kernel, right? <laughs> which is, which is kind of interesting. Um... Now it's hard to say if it's gonna give me a mixed allocation or not. Uh, let's see. Let's see if we can. Let's see if we can find that. So we're gonna do um, man numa alloc. Mm, what is it? Uh, numa alloc. What the fuck? The fuck is it called? Sigfold, thank you so much for the tier one. Hell yeah, numa alloc. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. numa alloc on node. No, I might just not have docs installed. Um, I think there's a, a crate for this. I'm just a little concerned that I don't know if I, I trust these crates. Uh, man 3. There's no reason to have a man 3. If it doesn't find it uh, globally, it, it wouldn't find it if you specify. Um, Numa. <laughs> Numa, Numa, yay. <laughs> Sick. Um, local affinity first. Numa aware allocator with... Okay, that's interesting. 
Um, I kind of just want raw Numa support, to be honest. Um, cash if you Numa wear Executor, I don't care about that. Uh, don't care about that. Lib Numa Sis, Binding is to Lib Numa, which is Numa Control, and this should have ways for me to directly allocate things. Um, where's the fucking docs? Uh, that's Numanji. Uh, I want Lib Numa. Okay, here we go. Lib Numa. Let's take a look. Source. Wait, create. Docs.rs. Lib Numa. Gimme. Okay, um. Ba -ba 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 locally allocate memory. Okay, what the fuck is this? What are these. These bindings suck ass. Jesus. Um. Yeah, hardware lock. Um. Okay. Um. Membine policy. I just want to fucking allocate from another core. How hard is that to do? <sighs> Numa. Do I have man Numa? Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, let's try Numa control. Let's see what we got. Oh, rip. Um, set min policy. Uh, sets the Numa memory policy for the calling thread, which consists of policy mode zero. Blah blah blah. Okay. Um. Yeah, I kind of want libnuma, because libnuma just has, like, alloc node, I'm pretty sure. Um, like, literally, yeah, numa alloc on node. Okay, let's see. I might just not have libnuma, but let's just, uh, uh, extern, um, and then this is a f function. That takes in a U size and it takes in a node and it yields a U size, a pointer. Uh, link is equal to libnuma. I think I might just say numa, not libnuma there. Let's just see. It's probably going to fail to build. Yep, probably going to fail to build. Um, oh, link uh, name equals this. Okay, sick. Um, okay, that's not terrible. That's not, uh, that's not terrible. Okay, um, once these named, okay. Uh, size and node. Uh, okay, lnuma pseudo emerge ask lib numa. Hmm. Libnuma sis. Yeah, what's the what's libnuma though? How do I fucking get libnuma? Uh maybe just numa. Really? Really? Um hmm. Is it Numa control? It's probably already installed. No. Okay. Okay. Let's give this a shot. Let's see if this gets us anything. I don't I don't know if it does. I don't know if this is the actual library or not. Hard to say. Um Do to do. Okay. Uh, hey! Hey, everything's in the up and up. Okay. Okay, let's see if we can get an address out of this. You getting hungry, dude? Okay. I, I, I can probably eat in like an hour. 
We can go somewhere or some shit. Um, okay. Uh, Numa, Alec, on node ten twenty four. Let's say node zero. Let's see what let's see what we get. Uh, probably unsafe. Um, okay. Here we go. I'm hungry too. Yeah. What up? Okay, that looks good, and that gave us a page align thing. Now let's try let's try Numa node four because I shouldn't have a Numa node four. Okay, and bind invalid argument, so it fails and then it succeeds. Okay, cool. Um, okay, uh, once again, two. Oh yeah, I should only have two nodes on this system. I should have zero and one. Okay, so let's try this. Um, uh, let uh buff. Is equal to core pointer, uh, core slice from raw parts. Mute this as mute u64. And then we're going to do uh, 1024, uh, this divided by 8. Uh, no, that. So we're going to allocate a gig. We're going to then treat this as a uh, u64. Then we'll do 1024 times 1024 times 1024 divided by 8. And then we'll do buff dot iter mute dot for each. Uh, X is equal to 41. Just make sure that that actually gets pulled in. <sighs> okay, here we go. Here we go. Um... Okay. Fuck. Uh. Oh. There we go. There we go. I think that's better. All right. Ah, uh, semi. All right. So now we initialize those, and we do the same test, but now we're using this. Do we see that pattern? Yes, we do. Okay. Interesting. Intriguing. Okay. I'd be very curious what that uh what that is then. Um, yeah, I, hmm, I wonder if that's this push, maybe it's really hard to record data like this because we are, um, it's very difficult to record data. Let's, let's try this. I'm going to try, um, we're going to do foop, uh, is equal to OU64. We'll do one u64 just to initialize it. Then we're gonna do a foop at off is plus equal ec. We're gonna have offset here byte dot iter dot enumerate. Uh, and then we're gonna do for blah and zero to one hundred. Okay, this is gonna run for too long, uh, so we'll cut this down. So basically, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get more samples of the same points. Okay. And I'm trying to see if that pattern continues. Uh, GNU plot, hello. Oh, um, mm, uh, foop dot len, uh, mm, um, um, Uh, 16 times 1024, U8 times 8. Okay, okay, this time for sure. Okay, those are probably context switches. That's really interesting, because, yeah, we're, we're now observing context switches. Um, okay, so what we could do is foop off is equal to foop off dot min so once again we're applying this kind of minimum strategy we're finding the best case to see how much of it is like cpu noise versus other things we're gonna start that with not zero u64 so it's a massive fucking number um and now we're gonna run this it's good data that is good data that is what i call good fucking data chat Fuck yeah. Uh, let's get rid of log scale. Yeah. Yep. Yep, it's just always 24. Okay. Um. Finally some good fucking data. Yeah. Yeah, no noise. 
No noise. Never seen not zero instead of U64 Max. Yeah, I do that all the time. Um. Wow. That's fucking cool. Okay. Okay, so what we're gonna... Hmm. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's just, that's just good data. Um, how deep is this? Let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, this might run for too long. Mm, let's just print. Let's just print. Uh, uh, just, yeah. Yeah, definitely don't need to print like that, but we, we do. Yeah, this will happen, I think. Uh, let's just print. Uh, I was going to do this, and then, then I was lazy, and then now I'm not lazy. This will just count to 1,000. So now we're really getting some good data here. Okay, we're just waiting for this to hit 1,000. Watch your stream from for your Emacs mastery. Oh, God. Yikes. No Emacs here. Can you test without Numa Alec? We can. Let's uh, we'll do some do some stuff here. Ooh. Uh, woo. Okay. 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 Let's see if we. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's try a hundo. Let's try a hundo. Let's just see how that looks. Uh, should be a little bit noisier with a hundo. Why is this taking so long to plot? What? What? That? What? Okay. Why is that? Why? But mom. Oh, because it's a shit ton more data. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. Uh, yep. How's it going? What are you up to? Uh, we're just learning some of the basics of optimization and measuring. Too noisy? Yeah, I think this is too noisy. I do think that's what's happening here. Uh, I think that's what's happening here. Technically, we shouldn't be able to see the difference really between NUMA nodes because everything that we're accessing is going to be in cache. Right? So, like, all these things should be in cache. Um... Yeah, that plot's just not going to happen. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, measure... Oh, cool. Uh, we're going to measure cache latency. Is everyone, everyone familiar with how to measure cache latency? Because um, it's pretty fun. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do um, 0 to uh, this... Uh, uh, yup. Dot... Data dot col uh, can I just collect this directly into a vec of U64s? Yes, yes we can. Um okay, let's data is equal to this. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to go pull in the rand crate. Uh use uh rand random uh, okay and then we'll bring in uh so what we need to do is we need to shuffle this um and we need to do a specific type of shuffle because we need to we basically need to have i forget the fucking shuffle we have to use let i, I bet Rand just has it for us so we don't even have to think about it um uh docs.rs rand uh, shuffle, shuffle, what type of shuffle is this? Well, let's just do a shuffle. So now what we can do is, uh, let's say U size actually, uh, data dot sh uh, random, uh, slice random implementations on foreign types. Oh, can I do data dot shuffle? Might need to give it an RNG, but that's okay. We can... Oh, that's... Yep, that's nice. Use rand prelude. Okay. Sure. Uh, shuffle. We need an RNG, which we can do like thread RNG, I think. 
okay. Um. Mute TRNG. Okay, uh, yep, that's, um, okay, fine. All right, there we go. Uh, shuffle, 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 shuffle. Okay, so we want to, this is the number of bytes divided by eight. That's the, that's the number of entries that we have in here. So let's start off with trying to benchmark. Let's benchmark, uh, okay, GNU plot just opened. Sick, okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna remove this uh, data just so that doesn't happen again. Okay, so we're gonna shuffle. This is 16K, and now what we do is we follow this list. But I don't know if this is necessarily going to benchmark cache. So we're gonna do four blot in zero to, uh, I don't know. Uh, we can do this probably, um, uh, probably 100 million times. 100 million is probably reasonable. Yeah, honestly, we can probably do a billion times. A billion times, this will take like two seconds to run. Uh, let me use. Um, let mute index is equal to zero, and then we'll do index is equal to data index. One, two, yep, yep, about two seconds. Looks pretty good to me. Uh, let it is RDTSC. Uh, let elapsed, elapsed is equal to RDTSC. Uh, minus it, print L1 latency is this. Uh, we'll do like uh, 10.4 and then we'll do um, uh, This will be cycles per iteration as f64 divided by this dot. Okay, there we go So this will give us the l1 latency because l1 fits in 16 kilobytes And there it is 4.8. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right um, so we might have to change the shuffle. I don't know what kind of shuffle this does. So, um, hmm, hmm. There's a specific type. Uh, I think it's a Tolo shuffle that we want to use. Um, uh. Yeah, so we want to specifically use, um, yeah, Satolo's. So Satolo is interesting in that it um, generates uniformly distributed cycles of maximal length n. Um, so uh, basically, this is just what we need to implement, right? Um, I'm just going to throw this on our monitor. Uh, so this will give us slightly different... Basically, we want these to be um, uniformly distributed, right? We want these to be like as, as far apart as possible. And the way that we do this and naively is uh, let me, I, I'm just gonna implement the pseudocode because I really don't want to use my brain right now. Uh, while II is greater than one, um, uh, we're gonna do II is equal to II minus one. Uh, wait, II is equal to len items, uh, data.len. Okay, so that's the number of thing. While i is greater than one, i am minus equals one. Uh, let j j is equal to rand range, uh, and this is uh, random uh, u size, and this is inclusive to zero and inclusive to i minus one. So we want to do i i um, because that's inclusive to i minus one. And then we'll swap uh, data dot swap i i and j j. Okay, so that's the that's the shuffle. Um, okay, yeah, that's about the same. All right, it's hard to it's hard to say what kind of shuffle they're using, but yeah, we're seeing about five. Um, and honestly, that might just be about correct. Uh, there's a four. Hmm, I don't like how much noise there is, but that literally could just be system noise um it also could be the shape of the random to be honest so basically what we're doing is we're like following ourselves right we're, we're we're chasing our tail uh and basically it's impossible to go to the next index before we have the current index so then what i can do is i can look at 64k and we can see what this perf is 
And we can see that it's taking a lot longer, and that makes sense. So we're going to just trim this down a bit. We're going to go to 10 million. That's probably a decent averaging. We'll change this, 10 million. And now we can see that we're getting about 9. So now what we can do is we can sweep this across. Um, so we'll go uh, 4 bytes in 0 to, I don't know, a meg. Uh, and then we'll step by... Uh, step by, I don't know, 512. Let's see. Let's see if we can get this to work. And then we're going to generate that. We're going to shuffle it. We're going to print out that latency. And we're going to do, uh, 10 and, uh, 10.4. That looks pretty good. And then we have the bytes. And the bytes will start at 512. And then this will be, uh, 0 to bytes divided by 8. And collect that into that. Okay, so now what we're seeing is the latency of memory based on the size, and then we're just gonna uh, t uh, we're just gonna output this to log.txt. Yeah, and then we'll just eprint uh, eprint ln just so we can see our progress. But we're gonna edge ourselves on the results, so we're not gonna actually display the results because that's never fun. Like it's it's always fun to edge yourself. And then we're just gonna speed this up. We're gonna go to a million. We're gonna drop this to a million. And then we're going to change this stepping. Actually, yeah, we can change the stepping now to like 128 and it's 4x or like 2x faster than we were doing before. Okay, so this is going to run up to a million, um, which is honestly not far enough. Uh, how big is my L3 cache on this processor? Uh, oh my god, is it 18 megs? <laughs> Fuck my ass. Um, okay, uh, yeah, it might just be 18 megs. Um... Wow, caches are getting big. Jesus Christ. And we're going to want to go past that, so we'll go to 32 megs. So now we will step by 512. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. All right, so how's everyone, everyone's day going? Everyone having a good day? Everyone ready for this data? Everyone ready for some cool data? Because I am... I'm so ready. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're uh we're about uh two thirty seconds of the way through. Taking some notes. We're edging. Oh, I fucking love edging, dude. Never felt so dumb and inspired simultaneously. Aw. There you go. There's your lip vibration. I thought I did one. Maybe not. Mm, maybe got fucked, kid. Uh <laughs> um. <laughs> let's see. Let's let's see what the memes are like right now. Um. Hmm. Karenikov, have you been behaving recently? You've been behaving. Okay, these benchmarks are getting slower and slower. We're about ten percent of the way through. Um. Yeah, I'm just gonna shave an order of magnitude off of it. I know you can't see it. Get fucked. Um, we'll just run it again. Okay. Now it might complete sometime. Uh, okay. This is... Okay. Uh, oh. <sighs> what a day. Love this stuff, but it's far behind. Uh, <laughs> I'm... Love this stuff, but it's so far behind, beyond me. No, it, it's, it's really not too crazy. It's not too crazy shit. You, you can, you'll be able to find it. You'll, you'll, you'll be able to find your way. So here's, here's ownering for this, uh, this, uh, this version. Oops. This is going to be our ownering. This is the new ownering. Who's fucking hyped? Thick. Damn right. Damn right thick. This is this is gonna be the number one healer in the world. Right here. Right fucking here. Number one. Number one healer in the world. Right here. You see you're seeing it before it even can log in. <laughs> oh, I can't fucking wait. Oh, it's gonna be so good. Oh my god, we're only at six minutes. Yeah, fuck. Okay. Um. Uh, 
This is really tough because this is... We'll just do 2048 and then this is going to be a... Okay, so here's a... We're going to do something that I like to call... Um, we're going to amortize the cost of the checking a timer and then we're going to check a timer. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if RDTSC or while RDTSC minus IT is less than, uh, I don't know. We want to spend like, uh, how many cycles do we want to spend on this? Um, so that, that's probably good. And then we can say like, one, uh, 10 million cycles. We'll do 10 million cycles per test. Now it should be a consistent timing, regardless of how slow the operation is. We basically just made everything nice and consistent. Probably getting enough data here, which is good. Which is good. Thought at some point in my life I'd start to understand the streams, but not really keep going. Eventually. Eventually. Are you bottlenecking on prints? Definitely not. Definitely not. Nope. 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 This isn't Windows. This isn't this isn't uh a conhost.exe. God, conhost.exe is shit. How expensive are prints? Uh, it really depends on your terminal. On like unlike x86 or on uh Windows, it can be really fucking bad. Like, Windows is really slow. This I can probably print, like, I don't know, probably 10 to 100,000 things a second. Right now we're probably printing about 100 things a second, so we're, like, not even close to hitting that as a bottleneck. Um, This is only flushing when it needs to. It, it's it's just, this is printing so rarely, it just doesn't matter. I mean, this is printing once every 10 million cycles. Like, <laughs> yeah, I guess what's 2300 divided by uh, 10? Uh, yeah, 230 times a second. Yeah. Yeah, this is literally 230 times a second. There you go. Change the divide. Yep, all of this data is completely useless. Sick. Okay, so we're gonna go back to this and, uh, yep. Okay, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and this and, uh, run this. Uh, I might need to pointer chase more than that. Mm, not necessarily. Not necessarily. We might be fine. We might be fine. We might be fine. Okay, let's uh, start getting this prepared. Uh, probably pro yeah, probably doing log.txt because that's what I always do. And then we'll do log.txt using 1 to 2 with line set x label uh, uh, size of allocation uh, set y label uh, latency, yeah, bam, genie plot, plot. Okay, so we can take a look. All right, that's looking, that's looking like caches. It's looking like caches. Yup, we're almost into memory land. Memory is very expensive. Memory is very expensive. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna then go and close this, and then we're gonna go up here, and then we're gonna change this to a better algorithm. And what we're gonna do is one dot uh, uh, while let mute bytes is equal to one while bytes is less than, uh, or we'll say like eight to start because we're dividing it by eight, and then we're gonna do while bytes is less than. Uh, 128 times 1,024 times 1,024. Then we're going to do our benchmark here. And we're going to go... Brrr, and then once we've gone... Brrr, uh, we're pretty happy. And then we'll divide this down. And then it's looking pretty good. And then we'll do bytes times... E uh, is equal to bytes as F64 times 1.1. 1. 1. As he says. And that might get stuck. Uh, T log.txt. Oh, fuck yeah, fuck yeah, fuck yeah. We can do like a 1.01. .01. Well, we probably can't because that's going to get stuck. Uh, if this is big enough, if we start big enough, uh, I guess if we start at 128, this will be fine. Yeah! 
There we go. Now we're generating logarithmic data. Um, so we'll actually get to C, and we'll be able to run these out longer and longer and longer. Okay. Okay. This is looking good. This is looking like... This is looking like the latencies of memory. Memory is very slow. Memory is really fucking slow, because memory is slow. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, look at that. 300 cycle latency. 300. You can add, in the time it takes to read from memory, you can read... Or you can do, what is that? Uh, with normal integer scalar operations, 4 times 300. So you can do 1,200 additions by the time that you can even read memory. Right? So when people say memory is fast, they're fucking wrong. They're wrong. And they're dumb. <laughs> Doo doo heads, yeah, definite doo doo heads, definite doo doo heads. There you go, there you go. Um, okay, so then what we want to do is uh, plot calling you dumb. No, I'm not calling you dumb, you're really dumb. Uh, sit log scale x. <laughs> Uh, okay, there you go. Um, sweet. Honestly, this might be a log scale XY kind of graph. Yes! Yes! Okay, so here you see the five cycle latency for L1 cache. And then you see here, when it peaks up to the top, you see the 12 cycle latency of L2 cache. And the reason why you see this curve here is because you're averaging... Because you don't immediately run out of L1 cache. It's not like every access, the second you go one byte over L1, is out of bounds of L1 cache. What you're getting is the amortized ratio of what percentage is hitting L1 and what percentage is hitting L2. And then here again, uh, you got some weird shit going on here, to be honest. I can't really tell you what's going on here. That looks like L3, um, maybe? No, that, I think that's L2. This is L1 to 12 cycles and then 18 cycles. I don't think L3 is 18, is it? And then a drop to 14 and then a climb? That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, let's go find the let's find the information about our processor. Let's learn about the Xeon Silver 4310. And let's find this on CPU World. Uh nope. Uh nope. Mm, yeah, let's just look at 4310. And, uh, okay, are they, wow, they're not on here right now? Okay, okay, let's look at uh, CPUs, uh, Intel, uh, Xeons, and, oh, shit. Right. What? What? Uh. Um. Fuck. I need an ice lake. Um, cause that's what I have, right? I have an ice lake. I'm pretty sure this is an ice lake. Okay, we can go the other way. We can, we can just look at Ice Lake. Uh, and this is uh, uh, Wiki Chip. Okay, uh, this is indeed Ice Lake. And then we want Ice Lake Server. Okay, this will just tell us. All right, let's learn about it. Let's learn about a higher bandwidth. Yep, definitely some big ass bandwidth in here. And uh, a couple new instructions. Yep, okay. What kind of instructions do we get? Total memory encryption? Okay, that sounds dumb. Um, core counts. 
pipeline stages process wow 10 nanometer okay um ba -ba 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 -ba, successor to cascade lake we might have to look at this second generation 10 mm plus okay let's look at this ice lake client uh okay um wow they're on a ring interesting um, okay, Thunderbolt, blah, 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 Titan Ridge. Uh, there's our clocks. Um, nice, some die shots. It's pretty sick. Core groups, nice. There you can see the cores and the ring agents, basically linking all these together. That's how they're doing their IPC. Um... Wow, do they not have fucking latency.com.org.co.uk? Um, 32 kilobytes per core of L1i, 48 kilobytes of L1d. Oh, so 48. Yeah, these are the ones that switched. Yeah, that's 48. That inflection point right there. That is, if you look in the bottom right, bottom left, that's 48. Yeah, that is totally right that's l1 cash um that makes sense okay and then let's see what else we got uh then we have 512k of l2 so that should be up to that's 256 uh that's interesting this would indicate that they have like two stages of l2 maybe um because this is that's really strange okay that's interesting and then we and then we climb up to memory. So let's um let's do let's go get the um uh get status, get add source, get status, get commits, get commits am scared of undos. Okay, and then we'll undo here. Okay, and then we'll go Okay. Um, and now what we're going to do is, uh, you know, that's my, that's my rap game right there. Um, 128 times 1024 times 1024 divided by eight. Nope. We want to allocate bytes. And we want to make an array that is bytes divided by eight. Okay. Um. Yep. That's gonna allocate that shit on that new node. Woo. Okay. And then we're gonna go down here, and then we probably we probably should call free. Uh. It's probably Numa free. I don't, I don't fucking know. We're just gonna say buff that as pointer. Yay! Now we're writing, now we're writing C code. Woo! 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 Uh, uh, hmm. I gotta have this installed, Docs. Uh, new, Numa, 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 Numa free. Hell yeah! Uh, Numa free, FN Numa free. Uh, it's just gonna have a pointer and const uh, U sixty four. There we go. Okay, and number data buff. Okay, and we can just call this data, and then it just works. All right. Okay, it doesn't work. Fuck. Uh, okay. Mm, U size. Okay, there we go. And now, mm, mm, okay, and now this is data. Uh, and then we'll just say as mute. Okay, there we go. And uh, that looks great. Okay, so now we're measuring the performance on a different NUMA node. Oh, it's just gonna it's just gonna be four everywhere, and that's because we don't initialize it with anything. For I I in zero two, uh, uh, b -b 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 data dot iter uh dot enumerate 
dot for each uh, intermute dot enumerate dot for each I I and M and we'll say M is equal to I I okay there we go now we're going to initialize data okay there we go oh son of a bitch 32 okay takes a tuple so we got to pass in a tuple okay so now that we did all that, uh, cargo check. What's our warnings? Sometimes warnings tell you that you're being dumb and really stupid. Okay, TRNG, that, mm, well, that's, okay, yeah, we, we, we don't use that. Okay, um, sick. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, four node in zero to, uh, don't get that confused with node.js. We're not writing node.js. Not writing node.js. Okay, and then we'll go down here, and then we'll update bytes at the end, and then we'll do some freeing, and then we'll bap, and then boop, jap, doop, jap, boo. Okay, and then that, and then okay, and then this is node. Okay, so that's our numa node, so we're trying all the different numa nodes, and then we'll go and then okay, and then we'll go here, and then we'll if node is equal to zero then we're gonna print this and then we're gonna format this in a better way otherwise we're gonna print uh that's gonna be a print and then otherwise uh we're gonna print ln and then we're gonna do uh, 10 and then uh, this and uh, uh elapsed as f64 divided by 1 million uh i could just type 1e6 because that's a float uh, okay, and then uh, we'll do 10.4 and then there we go and now we're now we're doing two benchmarks at the same time Yeah, we're doing one on node and we're doing one off node. Okay. We're gonna edge this one chat. Okay, ready? Bam, okay uh, Vim plot dot plot actually I'm gonna I'm gonna look at it So you won't be able to see but I can see it. Uh, we'll do title and this is um on node and then we'll do using 1.2 title off node or we'll just say we'll just say uh node number two because we don't necessarily know which node we're on uh node number one all right oh, oh yeah <sighs> Okay. All right, chat. What do you think? Is there going to be a pattern? Is there going to be a difference? So these are here, here's here's what we're doing. Okay, that's a great graph. Wow, we write some really good graphs here. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. This is what happens. I've got memory sticks that then go into a CPU. And then I have another CPU, and these are connected via magic. And we'll put a little heart there, because it's magic. And then CPU, and then this has memory, okay? And this bus is, is fast, okay? So here's the question. Will it be noticeable about the time it takes to access this memory versus the time it takes to access this memory, where you have to go through the other CPU to access it? How big of a difference will it be? So uh, let's say our memory, uh, let, let's say like L1 is like four cycles, L2 is like, uh, let's say 12 cycles, L3 we'll say it's like 30 cycles, right? And the memory, like, wh where do you think, what do you think will be the fast memory if there is fast memory? And what do you think will be the slow memory? Let's get predictions right now. I need this number and this number in cycles. So we know like 4, 12, and 30 is our L1, L2, L3. What is going to be our memory access latency uh, for the one that might be faster, if it is faster? Uh, Numa locality is a thing, so probably yes. Okay, okay. Well, what's your guess then? What's your guess? And also, are we going to get a good graph? Are we going to get a good graph? Maybe like 50? 
Fast, 369, slow, 420. Okay. 50 for fast, 80 for slow. One, 110,000, not quite, not quite, not quite. Um, okay. We're going to go with, uh, yeah, uh, okay. We're, ooh, 200, 300? 200, 300 sounds reasonable. What is that, 50% 50, 50 slower to access this? 50% slow, basically this communicating CPU to CPU is a 50% slowdown? Uh Fuck. Look at that. Oh, 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 oh. So the same for basically everything. And that's how you know you have good data when these two things are like stacked. And also, uh, let's do uh, with line on both. Okay, so here we can see that the two lines, we have node one and node two, right? Uh, we can see that they're basically stacked. And once they start to differentiate, you know that that's when we're starting to hit memory. So you can see that it's like up in this territory at like three megs. Um, three megs is where we start to see a little bit of memory and then it starts to get really bad. They really start to get this joint at like ah, they have 15 to 18, which is that lines up. So let's take a look. So these are log scale. This is 358 and this is 201. So the winning answer was 201 to 358. That is how much slower it is to access memory from another core. It's almost double the cost. So if you're doing high performance compute stuff and you're sh and you're shoving all of your data set on one on one CPU, right? That's in cycles. Uh, okay, so basically if we have these, and, and, and Bink, and a, another CPU and more RAM, so we have CPU, and memory, and memory, and memory, and memory, and these are connected, right? If you download all of your shit into this memory, right? You're, you're downloading your, your fucking stuff into this memory, and you're running... Or let's say you're downloading it to all this memory. Let's say there's there's a memory bank interleaving, which there probably is. So you download into this CPU's memory. Well, this CPU is literally going to be running at half the speed. <laughs> you you basically have and and you would notice this pretty obviously because if you were to graph like your linear scaling as you add cores, it would be like you'd have like linear, 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 linear. And then once you hit the second processor's cores, you just start getting like very little scaling, right? Where, where this line is like, if you were to expand this, blah, 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 it'd be much better. Um, so what's really important is that contrary to what you would ever fucking expect is you should make copies of your data. <laughs> like literally, if you, if you have like a VM image, let's say you're fuzzing, and you're fuzzing in like a tight loop, you should have a copy in this NUMA node and you should have a copy in this NUMA node. And you'll see that that is what I've always done. And this is something I don't think I'll ever fucking see in, in public fuzzing stuff because public fuzzing tools fucking suck ass. Uh, you know. So if we look at, uh, let's look at um, Fulkervisor beta. I wrote this in 2013 2014 something like that um and let's take a look at how i allocate like vms let's uh i think it's probably like boot a uh program yeah so here i'm going doing my fuzzing i'm doing my fuzzing doing my fuzzing setting up my structures blah 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 uh let's actually page 
Uh, not cow. Okay, this is cow. This is filling that in. Uh, exit page. God, this code's actually really nice. Uh, FHT fetch or lock. Okay. Is that what they mean by new malware? Yes, bingo. Got it. Um, somewhere I should have the VM snapshots where I restore. Uh, it's probably just like a rep moves B. Um, deport. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, uh Okay, um, dirty. Let's find this. Restore page. Here we go. Um, so this is going to, for each dirty page in the page table, it's going to call this function. Um, and restore page is going to, okay, we're doing some Bexters. God damn, we are doing some Bexters. This is a, or, uh, this is an AMD specific instruction. Intel actually doesn't have this. This is specifically AMD on Piledriver had this instruction. This is like, uh, <sighs> Some, I think BMI2 bit manipulation, uh, specifically to have the immediate operand. It's so fucking cool because this is a shift in mask in one instruction. Mm. Mm. Beautiful instruction. What a masterpiece. Okay, so there we're restoring the page. That looks pretty good for each. Uh, that, BAMP get fizz. Um, so what we should see is when we're doing a restore, um, pointer to page entry... Uh, RSI is the snapshot. Okay, so RSI, uh, so RSI is BAMP get fizz, that's getting the snapshot pointer, and BAMP get fizz is probably going to go through our PNM stuff. So if we take a look, let's look, uh, per node snapshot. Yeah, here we go, per node snapshot. So here's what we do. I download a file. So this is the file name. I download the file of that file name, and then I call init node data. And init node data is probably in my memory manager. And imagine, mm. Um, yeah, so what this is going to do is it's going to set the node ID, or it's going to get the current node ID. It's going to set that this is the data that should be used for that node ID. So basically, the core that downloaded it assigns the, um, the core that downloaded it assigns it as the original data saves the length, and also assigns the uh, node data. So then, when I do per node data, this is a thread save function, yep, you can call it before orig data and data line are set. Oh, beautiful. Mm, masterpiece. So what this does is a little spin locky boy, and what this does is it basically, oh, I don't have an initial try, do I? Ooh, that's not, that's not, mm, uh, uh, that's okay, that's okay. Uh, it's okay, this could be improved. Um, yeah, it's actually fine because it's not doing atomics. Anyways, basically what this is going to do is if there is not a copy of the data for your node, it's going to make a copy and it's going to do it with locks and everything and, and all atomics and stuff. And here it makes a copy. It allocates a thing for your core and then it, and then, it, and then it copies it. So then whenever you do per node data, which I probably do all over the place, uh, here, I say like, I want to get access to the VM. So I load up the per node snapshot structure and I say give me the per node data and it's like here you go this is your node's data representation this literally increases performance by like a factor of like fucking two for half of your fuzzers if you're doing this on any machine that actually has more than two sockets holy shit why the fuck don't people do this okay um <laughs> Jack of Mishka thank you so much for the nine months hell yeah it's a lot of assembly yeah that whole OS is written in assembly um, is there anything uh, that will do this transparently for you? Nope, because that's pretty much impossible. You have to be able to manage it yourself. Now, what you can do is you can request mixed data. And what mixed data will do, and let's see if we can go find that. Let's go see if we can find um, that function. Okay, let's go here. Uh, where's my code? Oh, here. Okay. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey! Okay. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Numa Alicon node. So another thing that these, these people will do is there's a way that you can traditionally allocate mixed allocations. So interleaved. Here we go. So Numa Alloc interleaved. Um... 
FN, Numa Alec interleaved, size, uh, U size, U size. Okay, so what we're gonna do is go up to three, and then we're gonna say if node is less than two, then we're gonna do this, else it's uh, gonna be this, Numa Alec interleaved. Okay, bink, bink. Okay, and then this is called node interleaving. Else if node is equal to zero, uh, else uh, bink k. Um, um, print. Uh, print ln. K. K. Mm. Um, node alloc. Numa alloc interleaved. Okay, so now um data blah that 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 okay the prints look fine um okay so now we're doing a benchmark and now we're benchmarking kind of all of these so this is uh, typically a feature that you'll see in your uh inside of your BIOS um so there are typically ways that in your BIOS you can go in and let's see if uh let's see if my BIOS has that um. Because if, if, let's see what we got here. So let's go through here. Uh, Numa, interleave. Okay, well, huh? AD interleave. Okay, um, so SNC is sub, sub Numa clustering. Um, interesting. Is that a thing on this? Two cluster interleave. And one way I'm seeing it leave. Okay. Um, basically, what you can do, that's non-volatile dims. Basically, there's usually an option in your BIOS where you can have the BIOS interleave it for you. So your entire OS gets the benefits of, of NUMA to some extent. Uh, most BIOSes will have that off by default, of course. Um, so, uh, but that's something that you can turn on because that will get you better performance for non-NUMA aware things. If your program is not NUMA aware, you will get better performance by doing that. Um, mixed, uh, we'll say interleaved, right? So it, it's kind of interesting, but uh, it makes sense, right? Obviously, um, if you interleave memory, you make the best case worse and you make the worst case better. So it's kind of a good hybrid approach. How much was needed to be assembly? Uh, none. None. Um, I was just uncomfortable with compilers uh, producing code in a way that I would expect. Um, it, it's just compilers are really hard to coerce, and I wasn't very comfortable using compilers at that time. Like, what's crazy is I probably had the knowledge. It's just, like, I haven't gotten comfortable with compilers, compilers until recently. And, uh... Well now, well, now I love compilers. <laughs> now, now I write my MIPS NT4 shellcode in fucking Rust. I don't give a shit. I'll write anything in Rust now. Rust lang best lang uh, represent. All right. So, is it gonna split the memory you requested into nodes chunks? Yeah, it's basically gonna it's gonna interleave memory on some boundary. I don't necessarily know what boundary it's going to interleave it on. But it's going to basically interleave everything. So you're going to get kind of mixed ratios. You're, you're basically averaging the, the things. Roster bust. Fuck yeah. Uh, uh oh. Did I miss a thing? Did I, did I miss a. Uh, did I miss a donation? Did, was, was I rude to someone? No, I don't think so. I think that's unrelated. Yeah, it's unrelated. Okay. Woo! Woo! Um, okay, load file. <sighs> What's this in Rust? Uh, bench and benchmarking support? I don't give a fuck, dude. I, I'm just always gonna write my own benchmark stuff. So I, I don't, I don't want to be restricted to someone else's environments and someone else's metrics and someone else's loops and... Nope, not interested. Not my cup of tea. The only thing in there that's cool is black box, but even black box doesn't fucking work. Um... 
Let's see. Uh, what about is your book coming out? I haven't even started it or even planned on officially setting down to do it. It's really hard to say. Like, shit's tough, man. I, I basically will want to take time off from work to, to do that. So I kind of need to figure out when I, when I want to do that and what kind of schedules I want and that sort of stuff. Okay, here we go. Oh, mm, we're missing data. Woo. Woo. Uh, Ooh, there we go. Okay, this is exactly what you'd expect. They're all the same at the start. I don't know what's going on here, why it's so slow, and then it gets fast, but whatever uh, things are probably happening in the processor. Um, that's actually really funny. And then up here, you can see uh, if you have Numa Local, it's the best. If you have Interleave, that's second best. And then if you're blindly shooting at the hip, um, that's the worst. So you kind of want to you kind of want to mix and max match these. Turbucket, thank you so much for the 18 months. Anyways, that is all we have <laughs> for the day. I'm sorry, chat, but I'm pretty happy with that. It's starting to get a little bit late. I need to eat some food. Um, a little bit tired, but that's kind of a good introduction to performance, optimization, those sorts of things. Um, and I hope people learn some stuff. So we're gonna go find someone to raid, and uh, and then we're gonna and then I'm gonna go eat because I haven't eaten today. Um, hell yeah. So hopefully that gives uh, people a good idea of how fucking slow memory is and how slow memory can be if you really, if you really are, are, are jumping through hoops. So let's see who is streaming today. Okay. Um, um, man, too many people writing Java. Too many people writing fucking Java. Hmm. Java, JavaScript. Yikes, dude. Yikes. Pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Um, uh, what? Oof. Yikes. Hmm. It's been it's been quiet for streamers recently. Strager, that's what I was thinking. I, I rate them a decent amount of time, but try I I try to spread them around. I know I rated him recently. Um, yep, and that's hmm, that's uh, okay. Uh, I think we're gonna W word. Let's see what he's working on. Okay, okay. Let's see what he's doing uh, or what they're doing. Um, ward. Okay, okay. It is some uh, some rust stuff and some math. Okay, we're gonna send you over there. Have some fun. Be nice. Be respectful. Uh, be good citizens. See you later. <laughs>